computer. Okay, good morning to you all. Very happy to continue with uh, the summit this morning. Especially um, um, in, I think this summit is special in, in every way. The people got us here. Uh, the developments right now in, in, in basic science and clinical science are enormous, I think unparalleled. And um, part of the clinical uh, excitement is produced by our sponsors to my right and left. And I want to thank especially Amgen, Pfizer, Sanofi, and Regeneron for supporting this summit. Actually, they uh, made it possible to come to this beautiful venue in this beautiful place in beautiful California. <laughs> Yesterday evening was exciting as well. We had great talks and uh, we, had, uh, we have honored and awarded Professor Katja Durian. Actually, he is the type of uh, physician scientist that we all hope to become. Thank you very much for being such a good example for us, Professor. We are a bit of schedule already, and actually I'm quite neurotic about schedules. So if you need to catch a flight, don't worry. We will, we will get back to schedule again, I, sh I assure you. Um, so I want to immediately continue to one of our most promising physician scientists at the moment in the Netherlands, and that is Kees Hoving. Kees Hoving, can you come to the stand to start with uh, the summit uh, this morning? Thank you very much, uh, Eric, and I'll make sure that we will catch up some, uh, some time here. Um, it's a pleasure being here. It's a pleasure being here with you amongst the physicians, the patients, and the sponsors who make it possible to, to work in this field. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present some data with you um, about the heterogeneity, it's, a, it's an awful word for me to pronounce, of FH. Um, but please excuse me, I'm Dutch, so it isn't much. Um, so this is my disclaimer. I work as a, as a PI on, a, on quite a number of clinical trials, and my department receives the money for that. Um, and this is what it's all about, FH. And I would consider this, and of course my pointer doesn't work, but you can see this is the, tra the traditional picture of patients that would end up in your outpatient clinic a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, why? Because then the whole clinical picture was driven by these uh, xanthomas, xanthelasmatas, and clinical signs that would hint you into the direction of FH being at stake. However, um, FH is a, is a genetic disease, we've heard it over and over again, and similar genotypes doesn't necessarily mean that that is, is giving rise to a similar phenotype. So for example, these animals share the exact same genotype, and they even transition from one into another, um, and still they don't look alike in terms of phenotypes, while sharing the exact same genetic, genetic upmix. So, post-translational modification, um, uh, expression profiling, and, and things alike uh, give rise to the ultimate phenotype that you and I encounter in our outpatient clinic. The other way around, there might be also something that what we call phenocopies. So patients who look alike, but do not share the same genotype. <laughs> we have so many Elvis Presleys, but there's only one who's the king. And this is exactly the topic that I would like to address with you today. Um, and that's being stated here. And this is the, the very neat paper uh, being published by uh, Professor Nordesgaard, who's going to be the next speaker. 
And I think this is a very elegant view on what FH is. It's both a clinical phenotype as well as a molecular phenotype. And as you can see on the left-hand panel, the clinical diagnosis is the main driver. So on the top, you see patients that have a clinical phenotype but not showing a mutation in any of the three genes, the LDL receptor, ApoB, or PCSK9, but have the same phenotype. And on the other hand, the lower specter, we know that there are patients out there who have the clinical, who, who lack the clinical phenotype, but do have a severe mutation to begin with. And the upper panel is being diagnosed by things like the Dutch Lippert criteria, Simon Broom, LLA, and that's what it's all about. That's shown in this slide, because when it comes to you as a physician and you as a patient, what it's, it's, is driving the phenotype in terms of cardiovascular disease is the LDL. So decision-making on, on how to treat and when to treat and who to treat is based on LDLC levels and not on the genotype. It's a clinical phenotype, and I think I echo what uh, Frederick Rao always says. It's a clinical phenotype. It's the LDL, which is the driver, because it's, we're not as much interested in LDL. It seems like weird, but uh, the clinical endpoint, cardiovascular disease, is driven by the intermediate LDL. So what I did is, together with Joost Besseling, one of the PhDs working in, in our uh, group, we looked at the LDL levels in the large database that we have in the Netherlands. And I would like to emphasize that this is work that has been done in a collaborative way. So this is standing on the shoulders of all those physicians out there, all those patients who were willing to participate in the cascade screening that gives rise to these numbers of individuals to be investigated. And I see that the, the font is kind of, uh, kind of small, but please allow me to tell you that these are thousands and thousands of individuals being enrolled in the cascade screening program. What can be appreciated from this figure is that along the, the age range, which is on the x-axis, we see a difference in LDL cholesterol, and that's what we know. And we separated patients based on having FH and the family controls lacking the mutation. And what can be appreciated from this slide is that the LDL levels in the FH patients overlap the ones um, that, that, uh, of, of, um, uh, of the patients that do not show a mutation, so the unaffected uh, family members. So within this kind of purplish uh, 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 band, uh, there is a huge overlap in terms of LDL cholesterol levels measured in FH patients and their non-affected SIPs. So I think this is a clear-cut example uh, of the overlap in terms of the clinical phenotype in patients being um, uh, assessed for molecular testing. Another way to look at it is, is to go for the most extreme phenotype that we uh, know, which is homozygous FH, patients carrying two mutations in the LDL receptor ApoB. We happen not to have PCSK9 uh, homozygotes in the Netherlands. And it, what can be appreciated from this slide is that on the left-hand side, the LDLs prior to lipid-lowering therapy have a, have a very broad range. And not all the homozygous FH patients show a LDL cholesterol level that you would anticipate to, to, to see in a patient carrying two deleterious mutations because we selected in this, in this population only for those who carry deleterious mutations in the LDL receptor or the defective ApoB. After lipid-lowering therapy, again, you see a wide range of LDL cholesterol levels that are going to be achieved. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to tell you that we generated um, the, this database and we, we collectively uh, worked with, uh, with the South African groups. And so now we have similar figures for over 150 individuals uh, showing actually a similar figure. So a wide range of LDL cholesterol levels over H. And I would like to emphasize that this is very important data because this is going to tell us what kind of disease homozygous FH actually is, and I would greatly um, um, encourage you to participate in our, our international network to really see what the clinical phenotypes of those individuals are, and not only in terms of LDL cholesterol, but more importantly, in cardiovascular disease. 
And again, here it's being dissected for LDL receptor mutation carries an APOB. This is work being uh, published by Barbara Schauke in collaboration also with Eric Seibrand, the, the uh, chair of today. And what can be appreciated is, one, there is a wide range in LDL cholesterol levels, but also in terms of cardiovascular disease. And it goes without saying that the ones who tend to have high LDL levels are the ones who are most prone to suffer from cardiovascular disease. Well, clinical heterogeneity in daily life. Um, I just picked an example of my outpatient clinic um, last August, and I got a referral letter by Bert Wiegman, the physician who treats all those children in our institution, and he, he sees those individuals, those children, and of course, they are being brought to the clinic by their parents. And one of the um, uh, patients was being brought to his outpatient clinic, and Bert Wiegman asked the mother to contact me uh, to also have a consultation for cardiovascular risk management and the treatment of FH. Um, so he said, well, uh, dear colleague, please analyze the CVD risk in the mother of a nine-year-old boy that's seen at my outpatient clinic. Oh yeah, and by the way, I ordered a lip profile for, for this individual, and she's gonna bring it along. Well, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm seeing this patient, and this is what's happening. Um, so the index case is the, is the grandmother. She had an LDL of around nine, suffered from an acute myocardial infarction at the age of 51, and this boy at the lower uh, level uh, panel had an LDLC of 6.5, which is way above the 99th percentile for age and sex. And then this, this, this lady ended up at my outpatient clinic, and she's being marked with this arrow, and she had an LDL of three. And we know that she's carrier of a mutation that's deleterious. It was being found in her mother. It's being found in, in the child. So really the autosomal dominant trait. But this patient had an LDLC of three. And then you can think, well, that's a lab issue. But I retested it. And again, it was like 3.2. Absolutely not in line with what you would expect based on the mutation carriership that she had. So what's going on in this, in this lady? Maybe. She has an ApoB truncation um, um, uh, um, um, mutation that comes with it, lowering her LDL cholesterol. And we published about that a couple of years in the European Heart Journal. And if we would only base our cascade screening based on LDLC levels, we would have stopped in this, in this lady. We do first degree family members. So we start with grandmother. Then we see the mother of this, this boy, and we would have stopped and we would have congratulated her that the LDL, recept, the LDL is normal and she wouldn't suffer from FH to begin with, and we would have greatly ignored the situation of this nine-year-old boy that is being shown in the lower panel. So I think genetics makes sense. Um, then another issue. I'm, I do a lot of... Um, family kind of studies and I'm, I'm most of the time accused in, in all the rebuttals that I get and review processes that there's a huge referral bias in what I'm doing. Well, I took a chance and, and, and figured out whether that was the case. So is this going to be the case? So mother has an LDL C of 9 that's, that's uh, bias because she was being, being seen based on her acute myocardial infarction is it then that the LDL in the next generation, first generation, is six, and in the lower is three? So is there what I would call a dilution of the phenotype in terms of LDL cardiovascular disease based risk on the distance to index, as I would call it? Well, oh, the data wasn't too promising, so I, oh. <laughs> um, this is the question that we had, and, and Joost Besseling took, took this really hard effort to look at all the relationships in the cascade screening that we have. So the FKH screening, you're aware of it. This is the way it works. Patients is being diagnosed with a molecular defect. First degree family members are being contacted and tested for the genetics. That's the reason why this nine-year-old boy came, came in, in, in light. Um, and then, of course, uh, after that, the next generations are being uh, screened as well. So this is um, a simple figure, how to do that. And these are the, the figures. So what is being depicted here is the degree of distance to the index. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and even sixth. But you can see the numbers are very low, of course, for the, for the high uh, numbers of degrees of distance. 
What can be appreciated is that the first degree family members are higher in age compared to the second to the third. And you should keep that in mind because we know that um, uh, age is a huge driver when it comes to LDL cholesterol. If you then look at the LDL levels depicted here, you see that there is a decline in LDL over the distance to the index. However, we see the exact same figure for the patients that are not affected by the mutation. So if you make a correction for age and, and, and uh, gender, what we see is there's no dilution of the phenotype in terms of LDL whatsoever, telling me that the assumption that we do things by referral and that there's a huge referral bias is, is false and that the LDLC that we see in the index patient and the, and the generations thereafter is driven by the monogenetic disorder and nothing but the genetic disorder. And the exact same thing was done for cardiovascular disease. So again, there's no such thing as that the li risk is lower in the second, third, fourth, or fifth generation from the index off, telling me LDLC and cardiovascular disease is the risk is similar over the whole pedigree and is not being attenuated by the fact that, that you're more distantly related to the index patient. Does genetics matter? Well, I think we have some clear-cut answers uh, on that because if you have a deleterious mutation or a non-deleterious mutation, what can be appreciated, and this is work being done by Roland Huig and Iris Kind, who is in the audience, um, that the, the pathogenicity of the mutation is the driver because that's driving the LDL and that's driving the cardiovascular disease being depicted here. So looking at the survival curves on the left-hand side, patients of non-carriers, uh, of non-pathogenic sequence variants and those with uh, uh, deleterious mutations on the right-hand side, and you see that the survival curve only uh, separates in those who carry the pathogenic mutation. So again, it's the, it's the LDL cholesterol that's driving the matter. However, and I'm almost done, but this, this is really where my, my heart is, my personal mission and is, is to, to clone a new gene in, in FH. Um, I think we are, we are doing great in terms of, of treating patients with FH once they are in our outpatient clinic. We know that we have a task to do in to identify patients uh, who, who suffer from FH, and especially those who suffer from FH of an unknown cause, FH4 as I call it, are of, of great interest because the treasure trove in, in terms of understanding the disease itself might be there. And that has, been led, that's a, that has actually led to the identification of PCSK9. So the low-hanging fruit might be gone, but I want to reach high, and I, want, I would like to, to actually grab that last apple. Um, to conclude, I think I, I showed you that FH is a diverse disease. The disease is driven by LDL, not by the genetics, but the genetics, uh, phony, focusing only on genetics isn't, isn't gonna help you, especially for this nine-year-old boy that I just showed you. There is no such thing as a devaluation of the clinical phenotype within this, this cascade screening, which is a lens support for cascade screening to begin with. Genetics do help, especially in cases, rare cases that I just uh, showed you, and we need genetics in order to find additional markers of disease, not only that, but also additional causes for FH. Thank you very much. Oh, nice. Uh, we uh, studied several families where uh, many patients had what exactly like until we found homozygotes in one very large Canadian American family. And we were able to trace this to defects. I think it's, it's good. I, I, can, I can hear it. I hope the audience can hear that. Oh, 
absolutely, and and it's especially those apples that can can shed light on the uh, the metabolism of LDL cholesterol to begin with. We know the stories with with CESD, the the LIPA mutations, and and. Uh, we identified step one that we are currently working on what the pathology is, but um, uh, this is this is very helpful and very great. And I think only by sharing these data uh, makes it uh, makes it possible to zoom in to specific molecular defects and and dissect what the molecular me mechanism actually is. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, case. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, C Case, that was just spectacular, and I think really touched on a lot of the issues that we're going to be hearing about throughout the day, the, the phenotypic heterogeneity, the genotypic heterogeneity, the concept of modifier genes, and other factors that impact on cardiovascular risk. So uh, uh, that was a great, great kickoff. So uh, with that in mind, um, when we were thinking about this session and thinking about the, the phenotypic heterogeneity of the presentation of cardiovascular risk, one of the interesting things to think about is LP little a, um, which uh, certainly is a causal risk factor, certainly is elevated in patients with FH, but very variable. And could that be an important factor? And um, in, in, uh, to speak about that topic, uh, we invited uh, uh, Borge uh, Nordisgaard, familiar to many of you. Borge is a um, professor in, in genetic epidemiology at University of Copenhagen, uh, the chief physician in clinical biochemistry at Copenhagen University Hospital and I think, as many of you know, has really contributed vastly to our understanding of lipid metabolism and atherosclerosis uh, with many contributions, including in the whole triglyceride realm, as well as in LP little a and many other areas. And it's great to have uh, Borge here all the way from uh, Denmark uh, to, to uh, participate in this meeting. Borge. Thanks very much for this very kind introduction, and many thanks for being invited to come and give this talk. So um, this is the, my ti the title of my talk, and also below is my various disclosures for companies I consult with or give talks for. Um, this is how I see the world, and it's a very simple vision of it. It's, uh, it's uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, I don't really call HDL the good anymore. I call it the innocent. I know Dan doesn't like it too much, but I mean, <clears throat> there we are. But it's, I'm not a big HDL believer, so let's call it good just for Dan's sake, I think so. And then the bad is the elder, that's what we talk about today a lot, and then there's the ugly guy, which is remnants of high triglycerides. But then there's the fourth version that I will talk about today, lipoprotein little a, which is the genetic lipoprotein. And so I think in F8, we should focus, of course, on LDL, but it is also very important to focus on LP little a, and I think this is neglected a lot, as Dan just said. <coughs> so here's just a when you do simple lipid tests, you just do the HDL, the LDL cholesterol, and I like to say you should do the remnant cholesterol and not just look at the triglycerides, where high triglycerides is a marker of remnant cholesterol. And then, of course, LP little a, and we traditionally measure that as total mass. <coughs> there has been many papers, and I think a very important one was this first one by Olo Wiegler, published in The Lancet in 1990, where he showed that when he compared controls with FH patients, and here's uh, plasma uh, serum ApoA, then you could see that those with FH, they tended to have higher LP little a levels than the controls. And there's been a lot of other studies uh, after that shown down here, and I think the Kraft paper here from 2000, which is really for the Gral's uh, patients from South Africa, shows very well also that even homozygous FH have very high LP little a levels, also when you look at genetics. So um, just to fill you in with some background, uh, LP little a was actually developed twice in evolution, so that's very strange. Most animal doesn't have it, but, but here's the European hedgehog has it, and it has one version of it, and then there's two other species that also has LP little a. Does anybody know what it is? There's two other species, and they're very, 
they're very, very closely related. I'll show them to you. So here they are. It's a... Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, and... So... But I think what's very interesting is that the LP Little and the Hedgehog and in some monkeys and humans actually do differ, so they developed twice. So they have some function that's important, but we don't really know what it is. Um, I was fortunate enough to be first author on this paper in European Heart Journal. It was a European Atherosclerosis Society consensus paper <coughs> where we looked at LP Little and if anybody's interested, there's a free app that you can download uh, where there's a lot of information about LP Little A. Uh, in that consensus paper, we said that the second most important place to screen for high LP Little A was people with familial hypercholesterolemia. But you should also screen in people with premature cardiovascular disease, a family history of cardiovascular disease or high LP Little A, recurrent cardiovascular disease despite statins, and then people at high risk, and then I will convey to you now that there's new evidence suggesting that maybe if you have an aortic valve calcification of stenosis, it's worthwhile also measuring LP little a. <coughs> LP little a is, uh, as depicted here, it's an LDL particle which has this extra apolipoprotein attached to it, apolipoprotein little a via a disulfide bridge. And it has all these crinkle structures which are named after this Danish pastry, a Danish crinkle. Um, and particularly this one, Kringle 4 type 2, can vary from 2 to more than 40 repeats. And this determines plasma levels of LP little a to a large extent. Um, these Kringles have homology with plasminidin, where by also can envision it being important at fibrinolysis or thrombosis. <coughs> LP little a differ by different ethnicities. And here's just shown some uh, different uh, data. So, Whites, Chinese, and Japanese tend to have similar levels here shown as the median and interquartile range. Hispanics here in the US have higher levels, and blacks have even higher levels. And you can wonder why that happened, but maybe this could have something to do with the function of LP little a. But people have to figure that out. So LP little a is a really, really important genetic factor. And those of you that don't really understand genetics and how important it is, I'll just show this uh, simple picture for you. This is a beautiful woman here just uh, uh, being in a, on a vacation with her two kids, her son and her daughter. This is in North Wales a few years ago, I would say so. Um, and you can see that, I mean, I would say the son, you're quite sure the son, that's the son of this woman, right? But what about the daughter? You could have been a bit, a bit, ah, you're not quite sure, right? But then, uh, but then if you chip in the father, then you're completely sure. Uh, <laughs> That must be the way it is. So, um, uh, but as you can see, um, it's a few years ago, I do agree. Yeah, it's a, you can see that kids, they inherit their genes, but they actually also inherit lifestyle. So that's important to also think about. So here you can see that uh, the son, although he dresses like the mother, he did take a little black that day. And the daughter dresses like the dad, but he also, she also has a little bit of white. But <laughs> I, I think, I think for LP lit, for, it's important for LP little a, it's enormously genetically determined, 80 to 90%. So it's a bit more like the son and the daughter, here, the son and the, the mom, really. So what I illustrate here is the distribution in what we call the Copenhagen General Population Study uh, for men and women. And what we know from other studies is that the levels is 80 to 90% genetically determined. And as I said before, very importantly, high number of Kringle 4 type 2 repeats means that people have low levels and low number of Kringle 4 type 2 that have high levels. And this is really because if you have high number, the molecule gets stuck in the liver and it isn't secreted. So I think it's very fair to say that in LP little a, what's called Mendelian randomization or the understanding of genetics has been very instrumental in us really coming back to believing that LP little a is a real causal factor. And so just very shortly walk you through that type of evidence, namely um, to compare it with a randomized trial. So when you have a randomized trial, you have doctors, nurses uh, recruit patients into a trial, and then you have a randomization method. Some get placebo and some get a drug that maybe reduces LP little or reduces LDL or increases HDL or whatever you do. And then the beauty, of course, of this design is that confounders are completely equally distributed between the two groups. 
So therefore, you can look at what's the effect of cardiovascular disease, what's the cause. When you look at Mendelian randomization, this is nature's own randomized trial. So when we produce children, uh, the alleles are randomly distributed. Uh, and then some have a normal allele, and maybe some have an allele that makes a lipoprotein go up or down. And then you can look what's the effect of having lifelong high or low lipoprotein levels because confounders, again, are equally distributed. And it's very amazing. We do these studies with 100,000 people, and there's an exact same number of people who smoke in the different groups of genetics. So same number of fat people, same number of people who eat donuts or whatever they do. So you can really look at the effect of cardiovascular disease. And then another beauty of both these designs is that you get rid of this reverse causation, which is haunting people in con observational epidemiology. Namely, there's no way cardiovascular disease can change your genes or the randomization into a trial. So based on this genetic evidence, this is just my summary of what I believe is well shown today, that when you have high LP little a, genetically, it leads to atherosclerotic stenosis, it leads to myocardial infarction, and it leads to aortic valve stenosis. Uh, I show you some data from some of our own studies here in a little Denmark, here's Copenhagen, the capital. We have an old study called the Copenhagen City Heart Study with about 15,000 people, followed for 37 years. And then this new study uh, just started a bit more than 10 years ago, Copenhagen General Population Study, which has a bit more than 110,000 individuals by now and 10 years of follow-up. And these studies in Denmark, we have no losses to follow-up because we have this registry, so there's not a single person we miss. So this is certainly not a problem in our studies. And then this study is a quite big one. So because it's big and there's so many people that come to this study, uh, I have actually convinced here's my hospital to people that run the motorway to put up this sign here. So it's a very easy for people to find a way when they come into the study. So we recruit 10,000 people every year. Um, this study is from a paper by Pierre Kamstrup, shown here, published in JAMA in 2009. It illustrates, based on the Copenhagen City Heart Study, that as LP little a levels go up, here shown in percentiles and here in absolute levels, then if you have levels above 117 milligram per deciliter, your risk of myocardial infarction is approximately threefold compared to less than five. Then in this analysis from the same paper, uh, <coughs> we look at risk of myocardial infarction for doubling in lipoprotein little a levels. And here's when we just measure lipo plasma lipoprotein little a, which has, of course, some variability in the measurements. And then you get a risk estimate here. But when you just look at it genetically based on Kringle 4 type 2, the risk estimate is even more, which is a very strong argument for causality. And after Pierre's paper, there was these three other papers, uh, two in uh, Nature Genetics and one in New England Journal of Medicine, that essentially showed the same, namely genetically high LP little a, you have more cardiovascular disease. So mechanistically, how could that be? Well, I think there's certainly at least three different good options. One is that it could lead to atherosclerosis via LDL deposition, just like LDL cholesterol. It could lead to more thrombosis because the homology with plasminity, and so it could uh, through fibrinolysis inhibitions. And then finally, this suggestion by Goldstein and Brown originally that it could simply lead to wound healing, and therefore, in the arterial wall, I would think it would be stenosis. So this would be the third option in my mind. And maybe this could be what is really LP little is about in normal physiology, wound healing. Then there was this very important finding in 2013 by uh, uh, Tanner Sulis, published in New England Journal of Medicine. It was a GWAS shown here in the different uh, genes, and here's the p-value for association with aortic valve calcification. And there was this one SNP that came up, which was also the most important SNP for association with myocardial infarction. So for aortic valve stenosis, it would seem a completely different endpoint. And then Pierre Kamstrup, in our studies from Copenhagen, published in JAC this year, uh, she just looked at plasma levels, which was not in doing the journal medicine levels, uh, comparing low levels, uh, uh, less than 22nd percentile and higher and higher levels, and here the risk of aortic valve stenosis uh, or operation for aortic valve stenosis was threefold. Then here's a new paper that Pierre Kamstrup uh, just uh, published. It's in press in Jack Heart Failure, where she looked at as LP little a goes up, what about the risk of heart failure? And then, as you can see, even heart failure is very well predicted by LP little a. Here's a one point six or seven fold. And then in that study, she did a mediation analysis trying to look at when you have high LP little a and it converts into myocardial infarction or into aortic valve stenosis, 
how much can that explain of the, the association between high LP little a and heart failure? And then myocardial infarction could explain almost half of the heart failure associated with LP little a, uh, whereas 21% could be explained by aortic valve stenosis and in analysis with both, 63%. So that's a lot for mediation analysis. Uh, treatment for high LP little a, uh, if you have it in uh, F8, uh, well, what we advised in this consensus paper was that lifestyle has really minimal changes, so don't bother too much about that, but then use statins to lower LDL cholesterol as much as possible. And then we also advise to use niacin. This has come in this, uh, not be used so much in Europe anymore, but I know in America you still use niacin a lot, so I think this is a good choice. You can use aphoresis, and then of course there's all the novel therapies, and PCSK9 inhibitors, I'm sure we'll hear more about it, uh, can also lower LP little a somewhat. But of course, the most promising is the antisense oleonucleotides that can reduce LP little a by maybe 90%. There's some CETP inhibitors also, future will show us if that's important. Here's some uh, unpublished data by Anne, Anne Langstead. Uh, we're just working on a paper right now to submit where we try to see if we can ask this question big scale in the Copenhagen general population study. So what Anne did was she took everybody in the study uh, that we have LP little a on and separated them into unlikely FH, possible FH, or probable definite by the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network criteria. And here you can see LP little a went up a lot in the ones with the FH classifications. If we use Simon Broom or MedPet, we came to exactly the same conclusion. And then the question, why is that? And then our chairman, Dan Rader, he has a very important paper way back in 1995, that's a few years ago, in JCI, where he could show that um, when you, in the same people do, like we put in kinetics in a person with homozygous FH or with heterozygous FH and in some controls, then you can see that the disappearance rate of radioactivity is much less in homozygous and heterozygous FH than in controls, meaning that the LDL receptor is not working very well. But when you do the, in the same individuals, marked like put a little a with radioactive isotopes, there's no, not this difference, suggesting that it's not the LDL receptor that takes up all the LP little a. So we have to understand in the future better why LP little a is high in uh, FH. So, but high LP little a in FH, does that cause cardiovascular disease? And I think this is a very important paper by Mary Seed, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1990, where she took patients, uh, patients with familiar hypercholesteremia with no coronary heart disease and with coronary heart disease. And then you can see that the LP little a distribution here is much higher in those with coronary heart disease than the ones without. And there's several papers here later. I think this one from the Netherlands in Clin Kim 2005 is a very important paper. Then I asked Anne Langster, we did this also in the Copenhagen general population study unpublished so far, where we simply looked at people with clinical FAs, meaning that they either by the Dutch criteria by Simon Brew or by the mid criteria had possible probable or definite FH, or whether they have high LP little a or, uh, or they should have been high or low LP little a, high or low LP little a. Then you could see that the ones with FH and high LP little a, they had by far the highest uh, risk compared to the other groups. And then, so in summary, uh, genetic evidence suggests that when you have high LP little a, it leads to atherosclerotic stenosis, myocardial infarction, and aortic valve stenosis, and these two leads to heart failure. And finally, in F8, therefore, I think it's very, very important when you have patients with F8 and high LDL, you should also screen for LP little a and modify your treatment based on that. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, we found that um, the thrombi that are formed with the influence of LPA are, are different structurally, and uh, they're more dense and they're more difficult to dissolve, and I think that has to do with the uh, risk that's involved with them as well. Okay, thank you for this interesting comment, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, that... Oh, that's very easy. Why we have no zero loss to follow up? That's because when you're born in Denmark or immigrated into Denmark, you're given a, a so-called central person number. And when you go to the hospital or your dentist, they don't ask your name; they ask you the number. 
So and as soon as it gets into the computer, and it's a, uh, it's uh, everybody that lives in Denmark wants to have this number, because that means uh, all health things, everything schooling is free of charge if you have the number. But again, if you leave Denmark, you want to get rid of that number right away because Denmark is the highly taxed country in the world. So we're completely sure if you live there, you want to have it. If you don't live there, you want to get rid of the number. So we know exactly what day people leave the country or they die. Everybody. <laughs> Please, Tanya Martinez from Brazil. Uh, I'd like to ask you, what is the lab variability that can be accepted? Because some of the patients have temporary increases or decreases, and in the increases, can they be interpreted as acute phase reactions? Number two question, please. Uh, until we have medication with efficacy, should we keep patients with anti-aggregant therapies like aspirin, uh, especially in patients with family history? Maybe short, short answer. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the variability, of course, it depends from lab to lab, but if you have a good LP little lab. assay that is uh, isotope insensitive, then the variability is not very great for LP little a. It's quite stable, actually. But of course, it depends on the assay. And whether you should give, uh, like for aspirin, um, I, it's certainly not evidence-based that you should get aspirin for high alpha The problem is, of course, there's no really good trials to show effect of treating alpha So I think that should be more driven by the rest of the FH story, whether they have cardiovascular disease or not. Question, question right here. <coughs> Comment on the uh, relationship, did you, oh, uh, Bill Neal from uh, West Virginia. Can you comment on the relationship with uh, cerebral vascular disease or stroke in relation to LP little a? Yeah, I think um, there's some evidence, and certainly for very small children, there's good evidence. And I have read that those papers quite clearly, and it seems to be that in children there might be particular high risk of stroke uh, with a very high LP little a. But I think the evidence from adults is not so good. And uh, I think we looked a little bit at the data in some of ours, and, and the signal is not nearly as clear cut as it is for my car infarction for aortic valve stenosis, maybe because we don't have enough events, but it's certainly much less. Borg, I have two, two big picture questions uh, to end this session, um, this, this question and answer session. So first is, um, should every patient with FH have LPA measured? Of course. Okay, I everybody think that's should, a very, very important Everybody uh, should have because it Because I, I venture to say that yeah. um, not all the clinicians, even in this room, yeah are measuring LPA in every FH patient. So I think there's but, a but really... But the thing is you don't need to measure it every time. So it's fine to measure exactly. it once. Measure it once and then you, yeah. uh, you put it in the record. It's almost like a genetic test. Yeah. Yeah. And the second, more controversial, would a high LPA in an FH patient lean you toward greater consideration of a PCSK9 inhibitor if, if in fact, you know, it was indicated for further LDL lowering? Would it be a factor in making that decision? Uh, I think it could be because certainly like that I just showed you and there's several other things in the literature that if you have FH, and high LP little a, you have even higher risk, meaning that it would be more important to lower LDL even more. And of course, then there's the added benefit that it also lowers LP little a somewhat. But how important that is, of course, we don't know yet. Right. So one of the really important issues with the big outcome trials with the PCSK9 inhibitors will be this analysis of whether the yep. lowering of LPA may have contributed to the benefit, which would I be hard to do, but I think will be I fully very important. Agree. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Oh. Where? Where's the this one? Oh, 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 oh. All right, so uh, this is my new mantra. <clears throat> FH should be recognized as a disease where medical treatment of heterozygous forms begins at age 8 to 10 years, and homozygous form begins at diagnosis. So what this really means is that if you got a drug at age, age 11, your treatment's been delayed. And I think until we get to this concept that it's a disease, for everybody, it's not pediatric or adult, that it's just a fallacious concept. It's a genetic disease like cystic fibrosis, Marfan syndrome, and if you haven't started to treat it at age eight to 10, you just miss the boat. And so I think we just have to get to this politically. Uh, I've actually put in a proposal for the reboot of the lipid guidelines that they put the kids and the adults together. And we have to think about FH as a unified uh, entity. So you can go to sleep now. The rest of the talk doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, all right, so I have to thank Catherine for this slide. Uh, family history plus hypercholesterolemia equals FH in kids. And uh, for all the Americans in the audience who don't know what millimoles are, <laughs> just multiply by 40. Uh, and uh, so here is the basically just the clinical diagnostic criteria for kids. Uh, over 5 millimoles or 190. Uh, would be the clinical threshold. If you have the positive family history of early MI or very high cholesterol, then 160. And if you're doing cascade, as, um, as really Case has already eloquently shown, that you, can, you may have lower levels. You need to exclude secondary causes. And then uh, genetic testing is extremely important in terms of confirming the diagnosis. Um, now, this is kind of a busy thing, but this is kind of where we're at today. This is the final algorithm from the European Heart Journal paper, and it basically describes the recommendations from that paper. There's lots of co-authors in the audience uh, from the panel, but basically if you check a kid and his cholesterol is high, or a parent has a high cholesterol, and then the kid is subsequently tested, that gets you into the algorithm and then the parent either is gene positive or gene negative. If the parent is uh, gene positive, you move over to the yes side, and then that takes you down to whether or not you have um, uh, FH, which is based on, and then the treatment then is, we well, have FH if you're gene positive, and then you move on to treatment based on your LDL. And on the other side, if you're gene negative, uh, again, by LDL criteria, if you're over 190 and you have the positive family history, or 190 alone or 160 with a family history, you move down into the uh, highly probable category and then your, your uh, treatment is based exclusively on your LDL level. So that is summarized in the European Heart Journal paper and that's kind of where we're at uh, today. Now, the rationale for this, and again, Borja and other people uh, have made this slide, uh, this type of slide famous where you look at the cholesterol life year calculation based on chronic exposure. And as your cholesterol goes up, you can treat at different ages, and that treatment attenuates uh, your cholesterol life exposure. But the point of this slide is simply that if you don't start treatment, uh, if you look at the bottom, if you don't start treatment at about eight or 10 years of age, you can never fully attenuate your life year exposure to that of someone who does not have FH. And without that, you have re residual uh, likelihood of having uh, heart disease. And I think, again, in the adult world, there's this concept of residual risk so that you pound somebody uh, both financially with very high medication costs and you still have this residual risk, they still can have heart attacks. Well, to me, that's just chronic risk exposure over time. And if you had started treatment early enough, then you wouldn't have any residual risk. And this is what it looks like graphically. If you look at the top, uh, this shows atherosclerosis buildup in the pre-statin area, where by age 30 to 50, you're having events and moving on uh, without any real attention to family matters. But if you look at the bottom panel, what you can see is that with early treatment, you arrest uh, the progress of the atherosclerosis, and you're doing your cascade screening and identifying all the family members so that they get properly picked up and don't get uh, FH or early MI. Uh, and now we have data to show this, uh, Bert Wiegman, 
has, uh, who did the original Pravastatin trial, has now followed uh, these kids up to age 30, and you can see on the top line that 100% of the children that entered that Pravastatin trial 20 years or so ago, have not, none of those children have had an MI, but uh, by the same age, about 7% of their parents had had MIs, which is very consistent with the known um, prevalence of, of MIs and heterozygotes uh, in the pre-statin era. So we know for sure that with early treatment that you can prevent MIs at least up until age 30. Uh, just kind of as a sidebar, when I started back in the 80s, I thought, well, if I can get my kids to age 60, it's somebody else's problem. But now, uh, I think we have to think that we can get every FH patient to 80. I mean, I think if we don't think that way with the proper treatment, it also creates a lot of problems for trial design because we know that once we start somebody on a statin, that you just add 10 or 15 years to the length of a randomized trial because the drugs work. So. You know, we're never going to do these trials, and we have to be, we're going to have to figure out uh, how to convince the non believers. Um, maybe that's why the Pope is here uh, this week. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> all right, sorry. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, so, just to summarize where we're at with, with pharmacologic treatment, homozygous FH, as soon as you know, get started. Uh, 8 to 10, we want to reduce LDL by at least 50%. Over 10, uh, if including things like LP little a, uh, we want to bring the target down a little bit. And then I think we need to know, I think what's really different, uh, there is one difference between kids and adults besides the fact that they're younger, um, is um, that, you know, do you really want to give a kid 40, 80 milligrams of a statin for just incremental LDL lowering? Uh, and maybe the benefit is there at lower doses because you're starting in an early phase of the disease. And then uh, you want to make sure people are taking the meds. I've yet to meet an adolescent patient who takes their medicines every day. So we just always have to factor that in. Uh, so refining evidence for treating familial hypercholesterolemia in kids. So I think these are the key questions that have to be answered in the future. What is the relative benefit of treating to prevent atherosclerosis versus treating to prevent events? So I think a big difference between those of us who believe in earlier treatment rather than later treatment is that atherosclerosis is a disease, and if you knock out the atherosclerosis, you don't have to worry about events, whereas other people uh, believe events is, is basically it. Uh, and I think the problems with this is both the treatments, as we now know with the PCSK9 inhibitors, and our ability to detect atherosclerosis or moving targets, you know, technologies allowing us to assess atherosclerosis better non-invasively. And as I've already discussed, the time gap between case identification and outcomes is large and increasing as we start uh, using uh, effective therapies, and it becomes unethical to not treat people in a randomized trial. Now, I think Borea has addressed the Mendelian randomization question, and I think we have to elevate that in our evidence tables. Uh, I think we've got to bring Mendelian randomization into evidence guidelines as, as a powerful piece of evidence uh, for the benefit of lifelong low LDL cholesterol. And I think I've shown a study which showed uh, the usefulness of using parents or an elder generation as historic controls uh, for uh, pediatric trials, and Bert Wiegman has pioneered that. And then what can we learn from cholesterol-lowering trials in non-FH patients? And I think basically stuff about outcomes and safety uh, and, and uh, maybe getting some more information on um, undertreatment. So uh, how do you design a trial? So this is the US, United States, P I can't even put all the things in, the USP <laughs> Preventive Services Task Force Screening Model. So this model looks at people at risk and then looks at all the things that can happen to them downstream uh, before they have an event. And it, what's important about the USPSTF model is it considers both cost and unintended consequences both of screening and treatment. <clears throat> but what I would argue is that what we need to use in this model is to look at not just the risk factor of LDL, but some assessment of atherosclerosis imaging. And I think we could also put in here LP little a as another factor, what would lead to intensification of treatment and how do we know somebody's at even higher risk? So I would propose this type of a study design um, 
when we start thinking about refining treatment. So we get uh, FH patients and they get a subclinical athro measure, or I'd like to add LP little a to this model. And then people can be test positive or test negative. It looks like your vessels are thicker or you have a higher LP little a or you're negative. And then you randomize each of these groups equally and this gives you four groups for comparison. And this will allow you to tell if you need to treat just on the LDL level or there's added value in incorporating an LP little a measurement or a subclinical athro measurement for intensification of treatment. So it's this kind of thinking to get beyond LDL that I think we need uh, to learn more about uh, being precise in our treatment for our patients. So I'd like to move off treatment and then to screening for FH. <clears throat> so right now in the US, we're trying to test everybody between 9 to 11 years. Of course, this isn't working very well, but it's, it's improving. Uh, the, uh, but there are other ways, um, but there are ways we can refine this. So can we test kids in school? Can we think about uh, physicians having a cholesterol devices, measurement devices in their office versus lab measurement. For example, in our own organization, Nemours, our Florida outpatient practices have now put in a quality measure of doing lipid screening uh, in their offices and they put, there's 13 practices that have put the cholesterol machines in their practices and they're gonna test the feasibility of this. Uh, and then, uh, should we be doing reverse cascade screening? Because we know that, and I'll show some data, that the discrimination based on LDL alone is much better in kids. Uh, we can figure out, we can find the parents, just as Bert referred a patient to Keys. Why can't we do that in the United States? Um, so we have our uh, cascade registry, then there's also uh, cascade screening, which, you know, of course is uh, buried about eight feet under in the U.S. and uh, we need to bring up to the surface and then opportunistic screening uh, you know that you know father comes in the hospital with an MI why aren't we testing the kids uh, lipids and then I think we're gonna learn a lot more about this meeting about EMR and IT based strategies uh, for flagging people with elevated LDL cholesterol all right move all right, so this is an FH screening model published by Morris. Uh, and what this basically shows is that if you just use Cascade, <clears throat> you have to get, uh, you have to go out several generations uh, to it. You can never really identify 100% of the people um, in the population with FH. So that each of the little um, bars looks at how many, like whether you go out first gen generation, second generation, third generation for your screening. So some, if we want to just get everybody in the population with FH right now as a base, then we're going to have to do some combination of universal and uh, cascade to get everybody. Um, and then this shows the age dependence of using LDL cholesterol alone as a screening test. And what you can see <coughs> at the top are the red. Those are one to nine year old children. Um, the likelihood of having FH based on LDL level, and you can see that one to nine years of age is far and away the age at which LDL cholesterol alone provides the best uh, discrimination for FH. So if you wanted to find FH, uh, childhood is really the best age uh, for a positive yield for, um, for genetic testing. I know my genetics counselor is here. She says, how come when you test people, you always get a positive genetic defect? And I say, well, it's just the way the disease is. I'm not lucky. Um, I mean, it, if you test somebody who's likely to have, who has 100% likelihood of having the disease, the gene's going to be positive. It's not, you know. All right. So reverse cascade. What does that mean? We're going to go out and find all those kids with FH, and then we're going to test their parents. And I've discussed how LDL can be used to discriminate, and then you just go back and get the first-degree family members, the siblings, the parents, etc. And then you can either, you know, I think there's country by country whether you test the kids or just test the parents, you can test the identified high parent. But again, case has again elegantly shown that it doesn't work perfectly. So <clears throat> I think we have to be prepared as we learn more about the genetics of FH, uh, what are all the different variations on a theme uh, that can occur in terms of this disease. Um, all right, <clears throat> so this is Bill Neal's group uh, did this study, and Bill, you know, has been a pioneer in uh, getting school-based uh, cholesterol testing done, and he's tested about 60% of the fifth graders 
in the state of uh, West Virginia. But what this slide elegantly shows is that if you screen just based on family history, that um, the yield in those with positive family history and negative family history is almost exactly the same for people whose LDL levels uh, would be in the FH range. So again, this is an argument for two things. A, universal screening, because family history doesn't really help very much, and a lot of the parents are too young to have had events. But B, if you want to get a lot of people, maybe we should be thinking out of the box and finding other locations uh, to screen for FH. I know when I was a kid, I lined up at my recreation center to get my polio vaccine. I didn't go to a doctor. I didn't sign a consent to get it either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to go out to this Trump and immunization thing. All right. I wonder where he got his polio immunization. All right, so what are the barriers to implementing cholesterol screening? Well, awareness. So we're all here and we're all tweeting and whatever, and it's actually working. I can tell you that it's working. Um, at the physician level, us doctors can be barriers as well as anybody, as we're great at being barriers to FH care. Um, so I think we've already, I've already had discussions with many people at this meeting about certain physicians' belief in preventing <coughs> atherosclerosis early on. Um, you know, a lot of physicians are concerned about the time it takes, the skill and reimbursement for the services. Um, but we do know, and Sarah DeFrani is here, she's doing a lot of wonderful research on these barriers. Um, and this is just, she, this is just a kind of a pre of work that she's going, but it seems like older patients, older kids, those of the positive family history, those who are overweight, and those of other high-risk conditions like heart transplant, Kawasaki disease, rheumatic arthritis, diabetes, are more likely right now in the U.S. to get testing, and those testing rates are increasing at the family level. Competing health issues, very important. Uh, are there other things on the family's agenda from a health standpoint uh, other than cholesterol? The acceptability of testing or going to a lab or having your kid poked. Um, general level of education. Um, and then financial resources and privacy concerns around genetic testing. All of these things uh, you need to work through in, in when you see your patients. And then at the societal level, cost role of importance can turn related to other health issues, uh, the general publicity and uh, overall guideline support. Um, one of the things that's striking to me is like if I go to a, a country outside the U.S., how the physicians are directly related to governmental policy people. Here in the U.S., you can, de you can produce a government-sponsored guideline and the government doesn't read it. So <laughs> it's like, what is that about? Um, all right, homozygous FH, just one slide. Where are we at? We need to get our patients to specialized centers who know how to take care of kids with homozygous FH. Um, we need to get the drug trials of newer agents, including safety assessments, off the ground. We need to figure out in the kids who are, who are sicker, when do, should we really be thinking about liver transplant as, as definitive treatment? And then we have to better understand the natural history in terms of atherosclerosis monitoring, aortic valve disease progression, and phenotype and genotype correlations to, um, to, to really be appropriate in terms of the care that we're delivering. So what's the pediatric FH agenda? Screening. We need to complete cost-effectiveness studies that assess value, including years of life gained, uh, and include cost of either universal cat screening or benefits of reverse cascade screening. If I pick up a 30-year-old father and start him on a statin, that could be 20 or 30 years of lifetime productivity gained just by testing the kid. And those usually aren't figured into cost analyses. And then feasibility and acceptability of various competing uh, screening strategy. Treatment. Understand the clinical role of subclinical atherosclerosis imaging or other risk factors like LP little a. We need to keep people who are in trials around so that we can look long term at their outcomes even if they're out of the trials to see if there are um, benefits of having been in the more aggressive intervention arm during the trial. We need to know about long term safety, these remain issues, um, and then we need to study our newer agents particularly with regard to safety. And finally implementation is we really need to have better organized care both within community and specialist settings to make care more efficient and less costly. We need to make FH or early MI or something reportable disease to enhance case identification. 
And then we need to leverage our existing organizations like AHA, ACC, whatever, uh, to increase FH awareness. Thank you very Oh, And the registry is going to do it all. <laughs> the registry is the answer. I'm sure there'll be opportunities for asking you questions during the break and at other times. So uh, we're going to move on to a panel discussion. I think many of us recognize that the literature on FH is dominated by uh, patients of uh, European ancestry. And the issue of F FH in non-European populations is something that we thought would be uh, really important to discuss here. So um, I'd like to ask the individuals who are part of this panel discussion to come up while I very just briefly introduce them. Um, Mac Linton is a professor of medicine and pharmacy at Vanderbilt and director of the atherosclerosis research unit in the Lipid Clinic. Uh, Zuhir Awan is a physician scientist at uh, King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia and an adjunct professor of medicine at McGill University. <coughs> Donna Salahin is an assistant professor of epidemiology at University of Pennsylvania and director of the Center for Non-Communicable Diseases in Karachi, Pakistan. And Shizuya Yamashita is director of the Rinku Medical Center and a professor of medicine at Osaka University in Japan. And I'll turn things over to Eric, who will uh, explain what we're trying to do with this uh, uh, session. Eric? Thank you, Dan. Um, we will have a panel discussion soon, but we thought um, that it would be a good idea if the um, um, presenters just first start off with a four minutes uh, presentation about the situation, the care situation of 4-FH in their own country or region. And they prepared a four minutes uh, talk for that, each of them. So I would like to uh, uh, start with that first. And then we will have the panel discussion. I hope you all will join in on that discussion. Thank you. So, I have some slides if I can find them or figure out how to. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I just can't see them on the thing, but but so anyway, when Josh asked me to do this, my response was just that my impression is that in my clinic. African Americans are, are grossly underrepresented, and um, but that you know I really didn't know a lot about it. And he said that's okay. Nobody knows much about it, <laughs> and and that that is really you know what I've I've found that um, I also can't figure out how to make these advance. But yeah, I know. But you, you know, okay. There we go. There we go. All right. So. Um, you know, I thought I would just try and look up some simple issues like what is the prevalence of FH? You know, you know, is it under-recognized? Is it under-treated? Uh, the one thing, there is some information which comes from the work of Zahid Ahmad, who's here, is there's, there's a, some information on the actual genetics of autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia in African Americans. So I'm, I'm going to skip through this because it's a four-minute talk now. And... Um, Josh gave me a little bit of information about the Cascade database. And so, you know, this is just, are African Americans underrepresented in the Cascade database compared to the U.S. Census? And it looks like it. And interestingly, I tried to look at my own clinic, and I got about this same, you know, I got around 6 or 7% of my FH patients are, are African American, even though in, in Nashville, it, they're over the, you know, probably 15% of the population. Um, so, you know, it's known that they have higher rates of cardiovascular events, more hypertension, type 2 diabetes, obesity. In general, their cholesterol levels are, are really fairly similar, maybe even a little lower than they are in, in whites. And um, HDL levels are higher, LP little a levels are higher, and HS. CRP levels are higher. Um, oh God, I'm going backwards here. Um, 
So just briefly, this is Zahid, Zahid's work, and he looked at a multi-ethnic population and sequenced for the, the main causes of, of FH or autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia. And what he found was that in African Americans, the, a huge proportion of the genetics was unexplained when you looked for the um, common mutations. And, and then if you looked at the characteristics of those patients, the, the unexplained patients had lower LDL levels and slightly higher HDL levels. And this is a, a table or a figure he sent me that um, shows mutations according to race or ethnic background, and, and it shows that he's found that, and, you know, there are distinct mutations in the LDL receptor in African Americans versus other racial and ethnic groups. So, um, overall, they had the lowest mutation rate for the known genes, higher rate of unexplained, um, um, muta you know, causes for the ADH, and um, there's a unique set of mutations in these patients. And, and you know, I think Zahid's main project now is to um, uh, try and identify new genes or um, causes for isomal dominant hypercholesterolemia in African Americans. So with that, I will rest my presentation. Can I borrow it? Okay. So uh, I'm both humble and uh, 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 grateful for this honor to be here among you and represent the Middle East and North Africa uh, FH registry. I don't know if you can upload my slide. Oh, okay. So there we go. So, uh, so while we still uh, uh, people are debating whether the prevalence of uh, FH, yes, uh, is uh, more frequent than one in five hundred. Actually, we bypassed that in the Middle East. And actually, now we have five, 55, more than 55 homozygous in Saudi Arabia, uh, more than five homozygous in, uh, in Oman. And if you do the back calculation, that's already one in 250. So uh, we think it's more, even more frequent. So, of course, Dr. Kershidarian described uh, the mode of inheritance in the Middle East, and then there's uh, all of these reports from coming from the Middle East uh, in small uh, populations. Uh, uh, small underserved populations, and uh, the frequency is already high in Lebanese, as we know. In Tunisia, it's very close followed. Uh, there's also mutations coming off from Iranian, from some populations in Israel, and even in Brazil, where some of the Middle Eastern have uh, decided to emigrate it. So they kept their mutation in small families and had a higher prevalence. Fast forwarding to the, our region in the Gulf, we have uh, reports from Oman, from Saudi Arabia and from Bahrain, uh, giving uh, 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 some indication of the type of mutation we're having. So I'll try to acknowledge some of the t uh, two key players in, the, in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Anouri and Dr. Al, Al Alaf, who actually shared my vision in having a FH registry in the, in, the, in the region. Both to actually, we wanted to educate both the physicians and the, and, and the patients about FH, explore the full spectrum of the disease, uh, understand new biology that we can help together the treatment and the diagnosis. So I'll just go through two cases, uh, actually three, three cases. The first one is a confirmed homozygous uh, product of a, a first consanguinity with a full-blown picture of family hypercholesteremia. Unfortunately, this patient presented to derm dermatology and just, you know, the dermatologists do their, what they usually do, take the biopsy, send it to the histology, and see the patient in six months. Unfortunately, this patient, after a, a f just a few months, developed acute coronary syndrome. Later on, they did all the lipid profile, and of course, she was homozygous. Now she was put on apheresis and statin and azithromide. Uh, the second patient was fortunately seen with another dermatologist, who this time was, has some knowledge in lipid. So the patient 
uh, had a legion remove, came back recurrent, then I did a liver profile, and now the patient was put on maximum therapy, and so far, so, uh, so far, he should not develop any event. The third case was a, was a patient who developed uh, bypass surgery and had replaced her valve, put on apheresis maximum therapy oral medication, and then required another repair of the mitral valve. This patient is similar to other patients who actually been captured in the FH registry in Canada, who migrated from Iraq, from Lebanon, and Algeria. They have the full spectrum of FH now, of homozygous FH, because now we're seeing the full picture because now we're treating with aggressive medication and they're living beyond their life expectancy. So they have this extensive calcification. If you now CT scan those patients, you have calcification from the aortic valve until the bifurcation. So we just did a few animal models to prove that this also present in mice. And the cholesterol by itself does not cause it. You have to have a mutation. Both the high cholesterol and the mutation leads to uh, advanced atherosclerosis. And now what we did is listen to Dr. Kedushidayan when he described that FH actually is also an inflammatory disease. So we put those mice on interleukin one beta blockade and achieved no calcification. So now we have to think, rethink about our treatment for FH individual homozygous that we should also put them on some kind of anti-inflammatory drug. So now we mapped all the mutation in the in the region, most of them are presented in the LDL uh, receptor. However, we have to think out of the box. There's other two mutations in APOB. So far, we have not uh, detected any, PCSK9 and few. But there's also between 15 to 20 undiagnosed patients with any mutation. And this is just uh, to illustrate the, the case where we have a patient with full brown picture of homozygous familial hypochlorostemia, negative mutation for all the Canada gene. Uh, he was from Sardinia just across the shore of Tunisia, and we defined that they had a mutation in the EBUE, and now we routinely test for EBUE as the fourth mutation. Now, just a quick about uh, the registry. So the registry is uh, launched to as a hub for both the physician and the patient. The patient just goes to the location where he is from. If he uh, hover over the, the country, he will have some names of physicians who are trained, both in lipid and cascade screening. We have to hold some conferences to educate our uh, physician, uh, some in Riyadh, in Oman, and we keep a registry of all those mutations, hoping that we can partner with our vendor to develop some kind of a, 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 a array to test for all the common mutations in the region. We publish a few papers on the registry and on the guidelines, and we do as we all do, is the cascade from the index case However, we are venturing now into bioinformatic. I have a background to share with Dr. Kachidarian. I'm both an internist and a biochemist. So the laboratory is my, <laughs> I would say, my room. So FH is a biochemical test. So if you go to LI system, the laboratory information system, and put a, a cutoff, an orbital well decided cutoff of FH, and then do the reflex testing, uh, testing for all the secondary causes, and you end up with a list that ends in my office every week. Now I only have to communicate with the primary physician and ask them if they know about FH and if they would like to refer the patient to our clinic. We also, this is just a, a few uh, small uh, uh, study. So for, for a, every 25 patient presented to the hospital, there is one FH, possible FH. So also we're doing the mass screening. Uh, of course, the Middle East is a, a vast area. We can't go door to door and do the screening. We also have high prevalence of clinical community, and we have also a relative young generation. In order to do the screening in this population, we have to you know, listen to our young generation. So we're doing a small videos they can share on their social media. We have very good success with small targeted uh, videos that at the end have a very simple criteria for FH. If you have them, you just uh, contact us. Uh, also, we are all uh, doing campaigns and doing uh, self-testing in social uh, uh, gathering. Uh, we're also doing atherosclerosis day. Uh, let's talk about FH. And most importantly for this panel, actually we are doing something very unique to our region. We have pre-marital screening. It's mandatory uh, by governments. So we, all we did, we, we went and asked our colleagues if you can just check, tick the lipid profile. 
and talk, ask the patient a few questions about the family history. And so far we have a, a growing list of FH individuals. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge you. Ah, here you go. So many thanks for giving me an opportunity to speak um, uh, at this platform about FH and South Asians. Uh, so South Asians are close to uh, 1.6 billion uh, in the world, comprising a quarter of the third pop uh, of the global population, and there are close to three million that live in the U.S. So um, it has some concerns about the people living in the uh, in, in the U.S. as well. Uh, they're particularly vulnerable to develop cardiometabolic uh, diseases. Uh, the disease presents at least a decade earlier than in the Western population, for instance. The mean age of uh, MI, uh, myocardial infarction, in people from South Asia is around 54 years, which is about a decade earlier than, you know, in the uh, population in the West. And the projected burden of CVDs is much higher in South Asians compared to the rest of the world. Um, so it's been suggested that a, perhaps a fraction of the CVD in that part of the world could, uh, could be explained by FH, you know. Um, so uh, there haven't been any large systematic studies on FH in South Asians. Uh, a, a large number of studies, you know, have been conducted in South Asians living in immigrant settings, and only less than 30 mutations have been described in the literature um, that uh, are associated with FH in South Asians. And as you can see from that list, you know, a large majority of these studies have been conducted in uh, England, uh, in South Africa, uh, and in other uh, other studies apart from you know studies done in South Asia. Um, so um, um, there are a few immigrant populations that have a very high frequency and a high burden of FH, specifically you know the South Asians living in the uh, in South Africa, where you know a small um, um, uh, section of the uh, of a Gujarati community initially immigrated, and it's been suggested that um, one common genetic aberration in the LDLR uh, gene, you know, uh, contributes 50 percent of the FH mutations in in South Asians residing in South Africa. So, in order to understand, you know, um, cardiovascular diseases just in in South Asians, you know, uh, my colleagues and I started. Um, a large uh, study in Pakistan, which has now 60,000 participants, and there are 18,000 patients with a myocardial infarction, uh, 8,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, 6,000 patients with stroke, 1,000 patients with heart failure, and 25,000 participants uh, that are free of these disorders. And we've uh, conducted a lot of uh, information on these, including lifestyle factors, generated biomarker data. We have uh, conducted um, um, sequencing studies and generated GWAS data, and we obviously have the ability to, you know, uh, recall back participants and collect cells and tissues. Um, so I'm just going to um, specifically focus on, you know, some of the whole exome sequencing studies in South Asians that we've done. Um, so these are the different centers in Pakistan where the enrollment has been based, and this, uh, and you know, on on the other side, you could also see the amount of genetic information that has been generated. Uh, one distinguishing feature about um, uh, uh, populations living in Pakistan is that 33 percent of uh, the participants, you know, they marry their first cousins, um, and um, it's been persistent, uh, persistent, you know, throughout generations. So it's not a, something which is uh, recent. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's just a, uh, it's a, it's a custom there, and that has some consequences. Um, so, in the absence of you know um, any uh, prevalent data of FH in South Asians, you know, we use our whole exome sequencing data in 7,000 participants from Pakistan, and we uh, tried to answer two questions, you know. First of all, what is the frequency of genetic mutations in known FH genes in, in, in the populations that we have collected? And second, you know, what are the phenotypic consequences of those mutations? So we took these six genes, um, and we uh, principally, uh, you know, 
uh, try to understand of the uh, you know how many of those you know are predicted to be del deleterious using the six you know uh, prediction algorithms and how many of these also are uh, protein truncating mutations um, uh, or loss of function mutations. So these are just uh, characteristics of the participants who underwent sequencing. And as you can see that, you know, close to half of those were, um, uh, had myocardial infarction. Uh, close to, you know, 2,200 2, participants had a premature MI before the age of 50 years. And uh, close to 350 had an LDL of greater than 4.9 millimoles. Um, so when we did the exome sequencing, we found 153 uh, mutations in total, which were either deleterious missense or loss of function, and you could see the distribution of those mutations across those genes. And there were 16 that have not been described in the literature before, so they, they could be potentially novel and associated, uh, they could be novel. And these are the potentially new variants that we have identified in these genes, um, um, and a breakdown of those, a large majority of those are in apple B, and some of them are in ABCG5 and ABCG8. Uh, this is just showing the um, uh, pattern and occurrence of those mutations across uh, these genes uh, according to their effect estimate uh, on LDL. So as you could see, nine of these, you know, are associated with high LDL and one of them is associated with low LDL. Uh, similarly, in ApoB, you know, we found 29 uh, variants uh, that were associated with a consistent effect of a, uh, a high LDL and 37 with a, an effect estimate with, with a low LDL. And similarly in PCSK9, uh, ABCG5, and ABCG8 um, um, in STAP1. So um, then, you know, so of the 301 individuals, so in, our, in this particular population, there were 301 individuals that have had a premature MI and high LDL. So we uh, try to answer what percentage of these individuals carry a mutation, you know, uh, the 153 mutations that we identified. And the answer is 13 percent. Uh, so that's, that's quite a lot, you know. I mean, um, I didn't expect that. Uh, that's more than one in 10. Um, so it just, uh, it just gives us a moment uh, to think that, you know, I mean, uh, there's a particular case to be made in people who come uh, uh, and have high LDL and have a premature MI to screen for, you know, these mutations. Um, so, in conclusion, you know, we've identified 153 potentially deleterious mutations, and of which 16 are potentially novel. Close to 13 percent of the people with a premature MI and high LDL carry a mutation in the FH-associated gene. Obviously, we don't know whether these are causal mutations. I mean, we have to do further analysis on those. So, systematic studies in South Asians are needed, who, as I said, you know, comprise a quarter of the global population, but yet, you know, there aren't much data on these uh, people, um, specifically in those who have high LDL and a premature MI to estimate the burden of FH in, 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 in this population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, invitation. Uh, I would like to uh, summarize the uh, current status of FH in Japan. So uh, country, currently, uh, we have uh, uh, heterozygote uh, one to uh, from uh, 300 uh, or uh, 500. Uh, we have homozygote in Japan, uh, about 1 to 0.636 uh, to 1 million. So if we include uh, LDL receptor and PCSK9 mutations, uh, homozygous FH and heterozygous FH in the Hokuriku districts were 1 to uh, 170,000 uh, uh, and uh, uh, 1 to 200, uh, respectively. This is the data of Dr. Mabuchi. And this is, I borrowed this slide from Dr. Shiba uh, in this room. And uh, she analyzed the genetic uh, mutations in Osaka area. And about 50% was caused by the LDL receptor mutation. And 7% uh, is uh, caused by uh, PCSK9 mutation. And uh, both LDL receptor and PCSK9 mutation was only 4%. Very interestingly, uh, 
uh, we did, didn't have any uh, mutations in ApoB100 gene. And still, we have uh, about 39% of uh, unknown FH. So we established the uh, uh, Japanese uh, diagnostic criteria for heterozygous FH and, of course, ho homozygous FH in Japan. The uh, first criteria is uh, LDL cholesterol levels uh, before treatment uh, uh, more than uh, 880 mg per year. And the secondary uh, presence of tendon or cutaneous nodular xanthomas. And thirdly, uh, family history of FH or premature CAD in the first or second degree relatives. So if we have at least more than two of these uh, criteria, uh, FH is diagnosed. And this is published uh, by the uh, Primary Hyperlipidemia Committee. So uh, the, uh, regarding the treatment of FH in Japan, the heterozygous uh, are treated with starting azetimib resin. Uh, there was no, no significant difference. O although uh, the patient treated with Procol had uh, more than 30 mg per year higher LDL cholesterol. So that may have uh, caused some uh, uh, no difference in the two treatment. But uh, uh, I'm sure uh, Procol treatment for the secondary prevention of CAD in FH patient is very effective, although uh, HDL cholesterol is reduced. And this is uh, our data uh, showing that uh, we have established a new method to use uh, adipose-derived multi-lineage uh, uh, progenitor cells. So we take the uh, ADMPCs from adipose tissues, and, and we uh, differentiate into the hepatocyte. So uh, we checked the isolation or, or catabolism of LDL uptake uh, by using this method. So adipose tissue uh, derived stem cells uh, can take up uh, LDL cholesterol uh, by the uh, LDL receptor. So we are now, oh, sorry, we are now uh, in the phase one clinical trials to use the uh, donor uh, ADMPCs to inject it into the portal vein through ultrasound. So we are just uh, screening the patient and uh, we are, uh, the patient is a FH homozygote or a severe FH heterozygote. And the donor is a uh, uh, is a donor is a healthy volunteers in the families. So I hope we can get a good result and uh, present uh, next time for you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for these exciting uh, presentations. Actually, we planned uh, mini presentations and a, a panel discussion, but it, these presentations were too exciting to uh, shorten. So now we have real presentations and a mini panel discussion. Um, I, I hope you're happy with it. Um, uh, I have kind of a related question to all, these, to all the uh, panel members, starting off with uh, um, Dr. Awan. If um, the uh, estimated prevalence is one in 50 in Saudi Arabia, then um, a population screening uh, is uh, probably warranted, isn't that? Isn't that the case? So one. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. So one in 250. One in 250. Yeah. But we think it's more frequent. Okay. But uh, using, I think, uh, the best, the best way is to uh, do the prenatal screening. Okay. It's going to be uh, more uh, okay. the way to go. Okay, as, as it's close, if, if you go under, but there are experts in the room, I think if you go under 200 per population, 
then you should consider to screen your whole population. So I think by next year I will have that figure and I think we can <laughs> start talking about population screening. What we noticed is that um, uh, not all physicians in your country recognize the disorder. Uh, do you see a role for a strong uh, uh, patient organization like the one who is uh, organizing Catherine? this presentation? <laughs> Where's Catherine? <laughs> Do, do, do you have an, a uh, patient organization in your region? So uh, we don't have a, a so we don't distinguish between the two organizations. But we have, not, let's say, a startup organization which is the FH uh, Mina, uh, that is actually a hub for both the p physicians and the patients. But I think it's going to be slowly toward more the patient, and the smaller organization under it like the Libet and other schools, uh, local organizations are going to take care of, of the patient education. But we hope that we could uh, uh, increase the awareness of uh, physicians about the disease. Because when I was a medical student, I used to see, I was um, on call in the cath lab, and now we, we see the 35-year-old coming to the cath lab and leaving with the statin, and no one even talk about FH. So that's very unfortunate in those days. So I think it's about time we should uh, bring awareness and... Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Salim. I think there's a question at the back. Yes? There's Catherine. So I just want to say I think the distinction between a patient organization and a physician, physician organization is, is probably a, a very traditional way of thinking of it. And if you do the same things, you'll get the same results. And we all know that we need to change the, the status quo, as I was encouraging. So I really, and I think all of you being here today is evidence that um, perhaps a new model will actually accelerate the progress that we're all hoping for, and, and you alluded to that, that a disease awareness organization that incorporates all stakeholders, I think is, um, is going to be more impactful and language is, is very powerful. So I would encourage everyone to consider um, a different language around that. Yeah, I think we should talk about, uh, but, but actually what you did is exceptional. You created the co-creation of uh, f future care. and. Uh, um, but I think that's uh, probably not everywhere possible the way you did it because you need specific persons for that, as we all noticed. I would, I would, I would like to agree with Catherine. Actually, not only uh, a patient and doctors should be in, 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 under one roof because actually they, they serve the, for the same purpose, but actually, all, uh, at the same time, actually, we have to address the new generation because they understand these things more. I guess <laughs> I'm sorry, but but all of the actually uh, uh, who are running the FH registry in in my country is uh, the young phys physicians, the young daughters of the disease of the uh, of the uh, the parents who had the disease. So it's only it's running actually with the new generation who are, do know how to talk to each other more than uh, unfortunately we do. Dr. Salim, how do you uh, you have a very much research-driven uh, project? Uh, how do you see to get the FH patient from Pakistan in? Um, so how, how, how do yeah, we plan to get the yeah. FH patients from Pakistan? Yeah. Um, so I think it's a it's an exciting time uh, to be um, um, uh, to, you know to first of all you know characterize FH patients in that part of the world which has not been investigated systematically. And um, the vast um, network that, we, that my colleagues and I have put place in Pakistan, you know, uh, I mean, we enroll close to like a thousand participants uh, every year, and you know, we could build in a mechanism through which you know um, people with, who have very high levels of cholesterol uh, and present with premature MI, okay. you know, are appropriately so screened. Through hospitals and uh, laboratories. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then to my left. Dr. Linton, do we need a specific uh, screening program or attention for uh, ethnic minorities? Um, you know, I, I would say we definitely need to do something to raise awareness. I mean, I, everyone you talk to about their clinic, at least th that I've talked to, has the same perception that minorities and African Americans are way underrepresented. I, I mean, I think it's a, more of an issue of our 
you know, socioeconomic problems and, and than that they have a lower rate of FH personally. And so I, I think we need to make an effort because, I mean, I, I really think that, that it's a very high risk, I mean, specifically African Americans, but, but any of the minorities with FH um, are very high risk and they're just not getting recognized and treated. And that, that's something, you know, at a very basic level that we need to figure out how to, to deal with. And I think this organization really could probably play a very important role in that. I mean, this isn't something that takes more basic science understanding or discoveries. This is something that really takes communication and awareness. And I, I think it's a, a really important goal. And Dr. Yamashita, Yamashita, the last question is for you. Uh, you are screening uh, uh, from Osaka, mm -hmm. and uh, um, is Japan organized in small regions? Are all regions screening? I think uh, we have not done the all region screening, but uh, in Osaka and also Kanazawa area, they have screened uh, lots of mutations. But uh, uh, some centers uh, accept uh, uh, the patient, but for the genetic analysis. So I think the most of the uh, areas are covered uh, from uh, all over by Japan. So, okay. And yeah. fa when family members move, you have uh, a registry to, to Yeah, we to have a, a registry for FH, and we have on, uh, more than uh, nearly 900 uh, FH are registered already. So if they move to another place, we introduce okay. another doctor to, uh, for FH. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Probably you. you have a thousand questions. Will we have a break? And you can uh, ask them to the uh, panel members uh, yourself. Josh, five minutes? I, sh I think we need 10 minutes break. Don't you agree? <laughs> 10 minutes break, okay. <laughs> Great, great. There's a lot of discussion, but I think we're gonna we're gonna move on here. <coughs> okay. Well, I'm sure people will be coming back in and making their way to their seats, but we're going to move on with the next session, session two, optimization of FH care through patient registries, and it really gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce our first speaker in this session, Dr. Paul Hopkins. Uh, again, uh, Paul is known to many of you. He's a professor of medicine at University of Utah School of Medicine. He's a director of the Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Clinic and a co-director of cardiovascular genetics uh, within cardiology there. And Paul has really been one of the, the titans in the field of FH, um, uh, involved from the very early days in uh, the MedPed uh, program, uh, became the, the chair of that program for several years, and has really... Um, utilized uh, that program and his uh, uh, position uh, w within uh, Utah to really help us understand uh, much better issues related to FH and other lipid disorders in relationship to atherosclerosis. And uh, it's a real pleasure to announce that um, the FH Foundation and Paul, uh, um, on behalf of MedPed, have agreed that they're really going to join forces, that MedPed and the Cascade FH Registry are really going to come together and build this uh, even, even better uh, by, by working together. We're also delighted that Paul's agreed to join the Scientific Advisory Board of the FH Foundation. He'll be a tremendous addition to that board. So Paul, we're, we're delighted you could be here for the summit. Uh, we're thrilled to work with you, and uh, we look forward to what you have to say. So thank you very much. <coughs> It is a delight to be here, and uh, yeah, it occurred to me uh, that we really don't need two uh, FH registries in the U.S., and uh, I knew from the very beginning uh, when I met uh, Catherine Willimon that she would be the ideal person to be a spokesman for FH uh, in the U.S., and, and uh, so I am delighted to join the group. I'm going to skip over this. Um, so this is Roger Williams. I'm just looking. Yes, OK. It's not distorted on the screens. It is down here. But uh, uh, he had an interesting story. Uh, he, he was the founder of our cardiovascular genetics group. And he lived next door to uh, 
a nice sized family uh, who he was shocked to find uh, that this, this neighbor uh, died of an MI at uh, 42 on the golf course. But what shocked him even more was that the family expected it. And it turned out that in this particular family, uh, and it turned out they were FH, uh, several generations of males, it just happened to have uh, transmitted as a male, uh, one male after another, had died before they ever met their grandchildren. And uh, a very sad thing, and it motivated him to do something about FH that he saw. We started a large study called uh, characterization of coronary prone pedigrees. Uh, can you imagine something with that title getting funding in the current NIH? Uh, you know, that was it, to, to study the genetic and environmental uh, contributions of coronary disease. That was about as specific as the hypotheses were, but we had that grant and we found very quickly that FH was a common contributor to the incidence of coronary disease. Uh, when you compare our data with uh, 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 Dr. Goldstein's in Seattle and others in, in Boston, a very similar prevalence estimate in Utah of familial hypercholesterolemia among early coronary cases. Most of them were uh, defined as under 60 for men under 70 or uh, so for females. And uh, we, we had a little uh, bigger handle on some of the other things, type 3 hyperlipidemia, we estimated hypertension, diabetes, smoking was interesting. 30, this, this is an estimate of not just smoking, but of two or more early coronary cases who both smoked in a family. So first degree relatives. Now the prevalence of smoking in Utah is like 14%. So you can figure what the likelihood of two randomly chosen individuals who both smoke. Uh, smoking was a very familial risk factor here. So we started this idea of uh, making early diagnoses to prevent early deaths. We called MedPed. This was Roger's uh, brainchild. He, he, he loved to come up with acronyms that were uh, catchy and fun, and so that was his uh, idea. It can also stand for in medical pedigrees. So making early diagnoses to prevent early events. It started as a CDC project, so funded by the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, in about 1989, it could have been 88 when he first started, it was a five-year project. Um, out of that effort came a paper uh, called Documented Need for More Effective Diagnosis and Treatment of uh, FH. So 502 heterozygotes were found. Uh, it was 502 came from 101 probands. And uh, while 50% of these folks, this is in 93 we published this, 50% had been told they had high cholesterol, only a third had had any inkling that it was familial or what they might do about it uh, in their families. Uh, not even half were taking lipid-lowering medication and uh, only a quarter even had LDL below the 90th percentile. So this is 93. I don't know that there's objective data since this publication saying where we are currently with FH. I think there are some that are coming around, but uh, it's remarkably sparse uh, data in the U.S. So in, also in that, we, we actually had worked with the health department in Utah, and they had done some mass screening. We had uh, screened uh, laboratory databases and made comparisons on how much it would cost per individual identified, and it turned out that cascade screening, family screening, was by far the most cost-effective way to find new probands. Then we developed uh, a means of diagnosis, this so-called MedPed uh, approach. Uh, others have done the same sort of thing since. And this was kind of an arbitrary, rather simplistic way when you think about it, of simply saying, okay, what's the mean LDL cholesterol in FH patients and the standard deviation, and what's the mean 
LDL cholesterol in the general population and the standard deviation, and let's create these very uh, oversimplistic, uh, perfect um, normal distribution curves and see how they overlap, and we just arbitrarily said we're going to pick a level where we're at least 80% certain that uh, a person we say has FH really does have FH by this little model. So it was no effort to look at sensitivity or specificity or maximize these. People have justly uh, criticized this approach as being relatively insensitive. We knew it was from the beginning. And uh, there's other issues. These are old uh, estimates of the LDL level in FH patients and in the general population. So these were published back here in 93 also. It was really one of the first sets of criteria that were compared with a DNA-based uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, and I would suggest that we probably stop using these. And uh, I, I can go into some detail as to why, but uh, uh, this is some of the reasons. First off, most people don't realize that there were a whole bunch of other criteria we used in MedPed that were published elsewhere to diagnose probands. And they are a, kind of an arbitrary set of rules, and they're complicated, and uh, again, based on cut points that are relatively artificial. So these other criteria uh, make it rather complicated, but we tediously went through every pedigree, every proband, uh, and, and applied these rules. Uh, but it did have a virtue in that we did, in a more or less quantitative way, try to use family data to, to make the diagnosis. And it really is the only approach that uses this uh, uh, a, a, in a quantitative way, using at least LDL levels in multiple family members to make a diagnosis. So here's some of the examples. So we would call a definite heterozygote certainly somebody that uh, uh, had a diagnosis by gene testing. Most people don't even know that was a MedPed criteria. Uh, another thing, a tendonxanthoma, LDL, uh, really should have been any level practically. Once you have a tendonxanthoma, there's not many other things that do it. Uh, other of these uh, little rules. If you had an isolated pediatric case with LDL over 240, uh, that was kind of you were 99.9% .9 sure they were in that FH group. So that would call them, uh, qualify them as clinically definite heterozygotes. If you had two first degree relatives that met uh, what we arbitrarily called a general population. So there, there are all kinds of rules like this. And uh, it got difficult. Uh, anyway, I will go back to that shortly, but I just wanted to now track a little bit of the history of MedPed. We, uh, in 1994, uh, funding ended from the CDC. The CDC says, great, you have a, you have a great project here. It worked. Uh, now you're on your own. Uh, so Roger was very energetic, got uh, industry funding, uh, and the... Uh, this was Merck at the time. They had simvastatin. Uh, they were very anxious to uh, pursue relationships with FH uh, experts all around the world. So many of you might remember some of the meetings we had over those years in the 90s and uh, a lot of excitement. I had up to 44 countries involved. The Netherlands took a hold of this and uh, really implemented in, a, in an exemplary way. Here's our MedPed registry growth uh, after 94 or 5. Uh, it increased to just over 8,000 people. This is painstakingly case by case, making diagnoses by hand, calling people, uh, going back and forth with mail, no electronic uh, uh, abilities to, you know, contact these guys by, there was no email, there were no texting, so, so this was a very expensive process. Um, interestingly, we found LDL or cholesterol levels dropped as people in, became introduced into the program over the years, so people were more aware 
uh, of their cholesterol levels, even though they had familial lipid, uh, you know, d problems. But uh, we don't have any data currently. So, you know, this is the last year is 1997. So I don't know right now what percent of FH patients in the U.S. are being treated. There's no current data that I know of. Uh, we did find, uh, this slide got messed up, my, my uh, numbers there, but this was an uh, attempt to intervene in people that lived well away from lipid centers, lipid intervention, clinic uh, expertise, lipid uh, expertise. Uh, we called it the treatment support program. It was back and forth mailing of, you, you know, you tell us what your latest cholesterol levels are, we'll make a recommendation, you take it to your physician. Uh, we tried this with physicians. They didn't pay any attention whatsoever to our mailings, uh, so we went straight to patients. And what we found here, and I won't go belabor this, but basically if you started with really high LDL levels, uh, we could do something for them. And the more contacts we had back and forth by mail, the bigger the reductions we saw. Uh, if they were already somewhere around 215 to 230 total cholesterol, that was about as good as we could get at the time with the uh, treatments that we had. So there wasn't much effect at that level. Um, we showed in that program that uh, FH patients respond just about how you would expect uh, to lipid lowering medications. So here is untreated is in this category zero. Notice that's about 210 LDL. So that's much closer to current estimates of FH populations than our old MedPed criteria that were up in the 260s, 280s. It was clearly too high. And uh, you can get down around 160 if you're on uh, higher dose medications uh, or combination regimens. But that was the mean of the most aggressively treated population in this group, somewhere around 160, 150. So there was a lot of room for uh, better treatment. We found uh, lots of fun pedigrees. This is a pedigree that was clearly an LDL receptor uh, mutation, and they had a lot of high triglycerides thrown in there. I liked Dr. Kachadurian's uh, uh, comment about high triglycerides. Oh, they're not type 2A. Two, two uh, they're, they're severe familial combined. No, they were, they were FH. Uh, clearly in this population, and yet you can see high uh, triglycerides mixed in. We've had huge populations uh, of pedigrees. This uh, particular one was a Utah pioneer that had married seven wives, and uh, we calculate some 100,000 descendants from this one man. <laughs> Not all with FH. So now... I wanted to move to the present, and, and, and Dr. Rader's already uh, basically told you about it. Uh, we uh, are looking towards uh, joining with the FH Foundation and uh, are excited about consolidating our efforts. Uh, I currently have an amendment uh, uh, submitted to the Utah, uh, University of Utah uh, IRB they left us with a wide open sort of encouragement, and when I submitted the amendment, I get back a whole list of nitpicky things that they want to do. And I'm thinking, why do I tell this, the FH Foundation's going to do this in the future? Why am I going to say in my amendment how we're going to do it? I, anyway, you know how IRBs are. So we're very excited. Uh, about that. It's going to happen. Uh, we're going to send letters uh, to all these 8,000 uh, plus folks and follow up, I hope, with phone calls and update all their contact information and uh, really move ahead on this. So the future, uh, that's the future, really. One I excited about is a new algorithm approach to diagnosis. And uh, how this will be implemented depends a lot on uh, the effort it will take, funding availability, so I'm not guaranteeing this is going to get implemented right away, but I'm very excited about it. And uh, it's based on complex segregation analysis theory, just briefly. 
uh, it takes into account the structure of the pedigree, however little information a person has. And just to give you an idea, rather than read through this, if you say had a, a, a daughter with an LDL of 180, they might have 50, 60 percent probability of having FH. If you now add to that that their father had a heart attack at 32, the objective calculated probability rises to over 95 percent. So just that little piece of information can make a huge quantitative difference and this approach is what I'm hoping to implement and uh, really objectify as best we can uh, this diagnosis, at least on clinical grounds. So what's left to do is uh, testing this formally in comparing families with DNA diagnosis. Uh, you know, this is a little tricky because you need the ones that don't have FH proven by DNA diagnosis as much as the ones that do have FH to do formal sensitivity specificity testing. So it'll be fun. Uh, it'll be a challenge, but we hope to uh, do some formal testing of this approach in the future. So thank you very much. I'll end there. So well, maybe this is a question for Josh, but um, and this is really exciting about the collaboration with the FH Foundation, but won't this introduce a significant bias in terms of exclusion of, of the ethnic, racial, et cetera, homogeneity of Utah? So the MedPed registry is, uh, there's maybe 800 of those 8,000 that are in Utah. So this was a national effort. Uh, we were the... Um, the center, you know, that we, we, we had these five other centers that sort of quickly developed a base, but then we found very soon that uh, our website is where we got most of them, and they were from all over the place, so it shouldn't, and, and by the way, Utah uh, is not, it is totally representative of Northern Europe genetically. In fact, there is less inbreeding in Utah than most states, and that's been proven genetically. Actually, I was able to to make uh, Dutch pedigrees in uh, your pedigree system. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Surprising. You had a question as well. I just wanted to bring up one issue that we run into, right? Um, as we are better at treating our patients, they don't have as many um, events. So that sentinel event of the heart attack in the 32-year-old isn't really available to us because we've been successful in treating our patients. Um, just wondered if you have any comments about that. Yeah, so um, you can, so the, the, the idea of using coronary disease uh, in, this, in this algorithm is basically uh, looking at cumulative untreated, uh, you know, risk in, in untreated pedigrees. And if they're treated, I don't have a direct, uh, you know, number. They're, they're, they're closer to the non-pedigree. But, but if they don't have the event by 35, 45, basically they don't change much what the uh, algorithm would say. And you're, you're dependent more on, you know, things like xanthomas in the family. Just LDL, though. Just the LDL in that father, and this was an actual case, uh, we knew at age 16 was like 250. And just knowing that put them at 99% probability of having FH, so this offspring. So you can get pretty far, but, but if you do have an early event, uh, it is extremely informative. So thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, an excellent uh, physician scientist. <laughs> Um, who is set to work at the Stanford Center for Inherited uh, Cardiovascular Diseases. But during the past months, he had to explain who he was at the place where probably his wages are paid, uh, because he's spending so much time as a chief medical advisor and 
also to the scientific board of the FH Foundation that they hardly recognize him at Stanford. <laughs> he will talk about uh, the American uh, screening program for FH, the Cascade FH uh, uh, program, which actually um, I thought it was an ID, and then they were already going. It is um, an, 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 a program with uh, exponential speed. So, Josh, I'm uh, excited to get an update from you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, one quick announcement. We are going to have the annual photo uh, just after Dan concludes his talk at the end of the session. So we will ask all of you to gather here. And bef if you don't gather here, we will not have lunch. So that's, that's, your, <laughs> that's your carrot. You know, uh, th this is our third annual summit. It's just uh, tremendous to be here. You know, Pasadena is beautiful, and it's wonderful to see so many faces coming back and also some new faces. Um, the, I'm going to be talking today about the Cascade FH Registry, which we have to remember was begun at the first summit. The first patient entered their data at the summit, and, um, and I'll give you an update about how far we've come since then, and, and it's really uh, a tribute to the blood, sweat, and tears of, of the FH Foundation and also many of the members of the audience who have uh, contributed um, way beyond what, what they have been uh, f reimbursed for. And uh, this is the number, uh, to start out with, this is the number of patients we now have in Cascade, uh, the Cascade FH registry, over 2,500 again in a uh, little under two years, so I think it's been tr tremendous growth, and uh, I think everybody should give themselves a hand for that, honestly, because... Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so this is really uh, what we are trying to do with the Cascade Registry. I hearken back to Margaret Anderson's uh, talk uh, last night where she said, you know, what you, you really have to have as, a, as an organization if you want to move the ball forward is um, data, and you have to be able to present a compelling case. And she gave the example of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and that's sort of what we were trying to mimic with, uh, with our registry, Cascade. And it's a really a multi-center U.S. registry to increase the awareness, characterize treatment, and monitor outcomes. And, and uh, there's some beautiful um, graphics that have been created by Mary Louise and others uh, that, that illustrate this on our website. And if you haven't seen it, I urge you to, uh, to look at that. So we have a hybrid uh, registry design. Again, um, we'll probably be comparing best practices with other uh, organizations that continue to do that. But we had the idea that we wanted to have patients be able to be participants and register themselves through a patient portal. And that's on the right side of this, or on the right side of this graphic. And then we also have a robust uh, efforts at many lipid clinics around the country adding more all the time to enter data. And we're collecting um, uh, retrospective and prospective data uh, in the lipid clinics that's entered by the research staff. And we're, we're capturing all kinds of interesting things, demographics, family history, uh, uh, cardiovascular history, medications, et cetera, to try to um, gather this crucial data that, that actually is already coming into play, I think, in, in many ways. So how has this grown? So Catherine always tells the story about how, uh, how I kept t telling her we would never achieve you know, the numbers that she said we would achieve. And there's debate about whether who was really right about that. But you know, just a year ago, this is, so we started at zero in 2013 in, in October. And then by, by year one, we had already exceeded wildly my expectations. Uh, we had 1,236 patients enrolled last year. And I was very, very cautious. I was like, Catherine, we can't say that we're going to get to a certain number by next year because I don't know how this is going to go. And uh, I think she persisted and said we're going to have double that by, by next year, and we have more than doubled that. So there's now 2,500 patients. And as you can see, the, a lot of, most of the growth has been through the uh, most of the growth has been through the clinical sites. We now have 18 active clinical sites enrolling and en enrolling patients with several more very close. We also have. Uh, 350 patients that have d enrolled themselves, and, and uh, one of our, as you'll see later, one of our biggest uh, areas of, of growth, hopefully over the next few years, will be to improve that number. So how do we do that? And uh, here I'm highlighting, you know, really the people that have made this possible, and what you see in the light blue uh, boxes are the active sites with the PI and the number of patients that they've enrolled, and the red are sites that uh, soon will be coming online, hopefully by the end of the year. 
And, you know, it's as, uh, I can't say enough about these sites enrolling these patients. I mean, we we, we uh, try as best we can to cover the costs of the research coordinators that, that are doing this, but really without their, uh, again, blood, sweat, and tears, this would not happen. And uh, really, I want to in particular highlight the, the, the places in, in blue bold because those centers have enrolled over 25 or, 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 or so patients, which is you know, a remarkable achievement. I, I mean, if you look at some of these centers, um, uh, Bart Dwell and, and Michael Shapiro up at OHSU uh, started um, not right even, even right at the beginning, but have already uh, enrolled a tremendous number of patients. We've done a little bit at Stanford. And, uh, and then you see the middle of the country, I think there's like a big funnel from the whole middle of the country that goes right to uh, Kansas. Every FH patient in, in within six or eight states must be in Kansas, uh, except for the ones that fall off down to Baylor or UT Southwestern. And, uh, and, um, and uh, a lot of these slides and a lot of the data that I'm going to be uh, presenting are, are directly the result of these folks. And then we have, of course, uh, um, Emil Dagoma and Zahed Ahmad have really done a lot of the hard work, heavy lifting, and getting some of the data together for the initial manuscripts. And I've stolen some of these slides from them. We have a lot of uh, uh, pediatric centers that are coming online. Uh, Lisa Hudgens and Sam Gidding and uh, Sarah, I know your site is coming on soon, Sarah DeFranti. And, and that, that's, that's going to be a tremendous area of growth. Um, so. Uh, if you are interested in participating, we would love to have you. And uh, Iris Kent, who is here, is, is really, and, and Bill Neal are really coordinating a lot of the day-to-day -day efforts, and so get in touch with us. This is the uh, basic demographics of the patients that we already have enrolled. Over 18, about 1,900 people, uh, more f females than males. Um, and this is through the clinical uh, portal. And then we do have, again, uh, about 240 um, children. And I, I think that this is, uh, you know, um, again, an underserved and under-recognized area that we're going to be continuing to look at very, very closely. Now, as Mac uh, Linton pointed out so nicely, that we, we just don't know enough about non-white uh, race, race ethnic groups across the globe in general, and that's that was highlighted very nicely by our other speakers. In Cascade, you know, we do, we we have, uh, uh, do have a, a good size number of non-white populations. We have 10% overall, 10% now are, are African American, 5% Hispanic, 4% Asian, that's both East and South Asian, and then 6% other, uh, but uh, still more, more room to grow in that regard. Now, this is an interesting conundrum. We've all been talking about this. We all struggle with this. How, what is FH? And if you, if you poll all, all the FH experts in the world, you, you'll get a, a lot of different answers. And uh, it's something that we struggle with. We know that, uh, like Paul said, that the, the original cutoffs were used for MedPed criteria. Even one of the originators says, you know, maybe we should should need need to refine that. We have the inventors, a part of some of the inventors of the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network criteria here um, with Eric. You know, he's he's modest about that, but the uh, you know they're they're not um, they might not be completely optimal in this day and age. And um, and Pat Morardi says, you know, I know FH when I see it. And so uh, this is a this is a struggle that we have. Uh, there are there are there are um, there are actually guideline-based documents now from Canada and from Japan that suggest that you know we really do need to to refine the criteria. And so what we have a, a lot of people do have a standard diagnosis with MedPed or Simon Broom or, or Dutch Lipid. We don't actually know in reality whether every single one of these patients uh, has um, has 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 FH. We know that uh, the clinician at that site. Has, has verified that they do, but it's sometimes, as you can imagine, hard to keep track if there's multiple clinicians at multiple sites. How exactly did they, did they use the Dutch, we, d we don't know exactly, but we, I can show you the characteristics and I think you'll all agree that these are, these are FH patients. So uh, I'm going to highlight some data, and this is early data. This is not representing every single patient that we have in. This is an early uh, data analysis. That was, uh, uh, we, we were really helped with by the folks at the DCRI with Matt Rowe and Emily O'Brien and, and their statistical group there. And we took a look at the, about the first 1,500 patients that we enrolled, did a, did a more deep dive, and we'll be updating this for the American Heart Association. Emil Goma will be giving an updated presentation there. But uh, we took the first 1,500 patients, and we were really going to look at heterozygous adults, and that's mostly what I'm going to show data on. 
And so after we excluded uh, 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 pediatric patients or homozygous FH patients or, or patients that didn't have a, a, a information about their statin dosage, we have about 1,295 patients that I'm going to show uh, most of the rest of the slides on. Um, and then uh, some of these data are, are going to be um, about how do patients respond, what was their pretreatment, what was their post-treatment uh, LDL. And obviously, we, uh, we know that over the years, patients' pretreatment LDL or total cholesterol might not be known. And so some of the, and that's a big problem. Um, you know, we have a fractured healthcare system. People move from place to place. They don't remember what their initial LDL was, bit, was necessarily. And so I think we have to recognize that there are, are limitations to the data, but I think the strengths greatly outweigh those, those limitations. So what do we have? So the average age and enrollment, the, sorry, the median age and enrollment, 57, the interquartile range, 43 to 66, again, 59% uh, uh, female. This smaller set of data, only 7% were uh, African American. Again, we've, we've uh, increased that a bit over the last uh, few months. Um, and I think this is remarkable. That starting here, I think you'll, you'll see something on every slide that might catch your eye. So here, you know, uh, Sam has uh, nicely pointed out that the guidelines, you know, say we should be screening for FH at age 2 to 11, maybe initiating statins between 8 and 10, depending on how, how severely they're affected. Uh, the American Heart Association guidelines, you know, say we should be looking for lipids, you know, at age 21, and they really start their, their recommendations about therapy there, the ACCHA. What, is, what about the diagnosis of FH in, in Cascade? And these are, at, again, leading lipid clinics. Aver average age of diagnosis, 47. So people are being diagnosed late. They might have been told they had high cholesterol, but they weren't formally diagnosed with FH, and so that's a huge missed opportunity for the family. And, you know, this is uh, obviously this is contrary to all the guidelines that exist. What about, what do we know about the untreated or LDL cholesterol for the patients that we have those values on? So uh, up top is the untreated values. Again, we don't have this on every patient, but if you look at the ones we do have it on, the, the untreated LDL is 240, uh, total cholesterol 329. Uh, what about treated? And uh, we have this on more people because if they've been in the center, we, we often have the treated lipid values. And I think this, this, this kind of data is remarkable. Even at leading lipid clinics, treated patients, the, the average LDL is, is 134. So that means that there's a lot of patients that are not getting to where we would necessarily want them to go. And I think um, uh, this is a, 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 a remarkable step snapshot in time. We're at, where again, we're at the crossroads. We're here. This is, this is where we are today, and we're going to be asking questions over the next few years. What is this going to look like in two or three years as these new therapies come on board? What about risk factors in the, uh, in the, in the cascade participants? 16% um, have two or more, uh, sorry, 23% uh, have two or more cardiovascular risk factors. 43% uh, have hypertension. This isn't actually too far off of the U.S. Uh, in, in, the, in the United States, about 33% of adults over 20 have hypertension. So, you know, uh, we're a little bit above, but our, our age is above 20. So I, think, I don't think that's too bad. Diabetes um, is actually, the, this is close to the national average, about 12 12% of American adults have uh, diabetes. Uh, smoking, 7%. Uh, Obesity, 32%. Again, this sort of mirrors uh, what we see in the United States. It's hard to believe that 33% 30, uh, of a, a U.S. adults are obese, but that's, that's the world we live in. And I think this is a really a, a take-home shot, one that should get emblazoned on the brain, you know. What about a presence of ASCVD at, at the time that they registered, 30, at the time they're they in Cascade, 38% ROV have uh, ASCVD, and that's uh, MI, stroke, uh, uh, PCI. Uh, most of this is coronary heart disease, a smaller, much smaller number of, are, are stroke, and I think that's what, what, what has been historically found. Um, what about men? 47% of men have coronary heart disease, age at onset, age 47 on, on average. Uh, women, 29%, age at onset, 55. So, you know, um, we, we have made tremendous progress in, in cardiovascular disease over the years. We're still missing these FH patients. What about statin medications and non-statin medications? And here, uh, I'll preface this by saying that there is going to be some referral bias here. I mean, these are patients that are coming. They, they might be some of the worst of the worst, hardest to treat. So we have to recognize that. But in the statin-treated patients at these leading lipid clinics, high-intensity statin, only 56%. Um, 
lower moderate intensity of 44%. Most of people are using, uh, obviously, rosuvastatin or torvastatin. 45% that are treated with statin are also on azetamib, uh, lower percentages on the other therapies. Non-statin treated, a high percentage of patients in, in Cascade are non-statin treated. This might reflect, again, some of this referral bias. But uh, most of them are on other, other medications to try to lower their cholesterol. Some are on apheresis. So why are people not using maximal doses of statins? Well, there's some sort of intolerance or allergy is given uh, in 60% of patients. Pre patient preference, 11%. Uh, physician preference, 11%. I don't really understand that one. Uh, pregnancy, 3%. Cost, 1%. Clinical trial participation, 1%. So, you know, statin intolerance is a big problem, especially at these clinics. And um, so we'll have to see, again, how this, this, these uh, LDL values change as these new agents are, are coming on board. What about combination therapy and apheresis? So uh, statin plus azetamib, again, uh, uh, 445% are on both. How many patients require more than one LDL lowering therapy? Uh, a majority, and this is this this data echoes what has been shown previously by the Dutch that the majority of patients with FH require more than one medication. So, if you add you know 36 plus uh, 19, 55 percent, you know, or on two or three lipid lowering medications, obviously that's going to be less in the non-statin patients because one of the medications is taken off the table. This is another, I think, uh, remarkable slide. So uh, how many patients can get to a healthy or optimal or however you want to, whatever uh, word you want to use to describe that? Uh, what percentage of patients actually achieve uh, an LDL of less than 70, even though 38% have preexisting coronary heart disease, 6%? Uh, what about even a, a more modest goal, less than 100, you know, 26% if you add these two. So uh, big time uh, room for improvement there. Still a very high percentage of people maintain LDLs over 190 or even 160. I say. So I think this is something that we need. And, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll show you in, in the future that this is not, uh, this is not we shouldn't be uh, kicking ourselves. The U.S. physicians are not that bad. This is not, this is not uh, something that is, has not been seen in other places. What about LDL? The more modest goal of LDL 50% reduction, only 45% achieved that. In non-statin patients, of course, things are going to look much, much worse. And uh, this is a, a nice graph that Emil put together uh, on statin therapy. It's in the lighter blue and uh, on statin therapy plus non-statin therapy is in the darker blue, and you can see that more patients that are on combination therapy get to, the, 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 the distribution is, is, is looking better in patients that are on combination therapy um, uh, for LDL values. And uh, shown another way, um, what, what about LDL reduction? So over here is 50% LDL reduction, greater than 50% LDL reduction, 44% of patients on statin and non-statin achieve that modest target. Only 12% on statin alone ach achieve that mod modest target. Things are improved if you accept uh, a lesser uh, a treatment, but um, probably none of us are going to be that happy about doing that. Now, well, how does this compare to US, uh, the U.S.? And so we, we looked at NA comparing Cascade uh, patients, patients in Cascade to the NHANES. So, uh, 6% of uh, U.S. Uh, adults in, in this range have uh, coronary heart disease or, or ISCV, uh, coronary heart disease, compared to much higher rates in, in, in uh, Cascade patients. And so uh, this is, I mean, quite eye-opening, five to seven-fold higher prevalence in these patients. Of course, there's going to be some referral bias, but I'll show you that this it does seem to echo trends in, uh, in other places. What about other associated risk factors? And um, I showed you that hypertension is pretty common. Diabetes is, is a, mirrors the sort of the general population. Low HDL mirrors the general population smoking. Uh, the, the, and the odds ratios for those are shown here. So obviously the combination of FH in any of these is a, is a, a problem, especially since 24% of uh, patients in Cascade have more than two traditional risk factors. And it used to be, you know, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago when the U.S. was a much leaner, uh, much less diabetes, that this wouldn't have been the case. But FH is changing. You know, we used to say triglycerides over 150 was, you know, would, would probably uh, greatly hedge you against FH. But nowadays, I think it's hard to, hard to argue that that's always the case, given what we're seeing with diabetes and, and, uh, and obesity. 
So what about comparing, uh, and then we have an international audience here, so Emil did a great job and he looked back and, and looked at some of the data that's coming from uh, many of these other countries. What about the, what is the prevalence of uh, coronary heart disease and LDL in Cascade versus some of the other data that's out there? And uh, you know, we're, we're not quite as good as other countries. <laughs> and we're, we're lagging behind. We're trying to change that at the FH Foundation, obviously, but 36% uh, high prevalence of coronary heart disease. But this is not that different than what is, is seen in other places, Denmark, Canada. You know, obviously the Netherlands has, uh, is, is the bellwether. We're, we're all trying to get there. Um, France, of course, people live a lot, a lot healthier in France, so, uh, and they do a great job there as well. Um, LDL uh, is shown down here, 239, not too, not too um, distinct here. What about goal attainment for um, uh, U.S. patients in Cascade versus other places? Uh, and again, what I, what I said before is that only 25% of uh, Cascade patients get a LDL less than 100, but this isn't that different. Nobody seems to be able to get LDL less than 100, and only a minority of patients can really achieve that. Uh, and what about LDL reduction of greater than 50%? Again, we're not quite as good as other places, but um, um, again, nobody, there, there's a huge number of FH patients that can't get these modest goals. I'm gonna spend the last couple of slides telling you just a few snapshots about what we're learning from patients, because it's orthogonal data. It's not exactly the same. It's overlapping to some extent, but it, it tells us some new things. So the last few slides are gonna be about the data we got from these 350 patients that enrolled themselves. And, um, and I can't tell you how important it is that these data are. I mean, when we, when we show these data to other groups, it's, it, it's very eye-opening, uh, including at places like the FDA. So how satisfied are you that everything possible is being done to treat your FH? Well, if you say uh, mostly satisfied, well, that's a majority of patients. Again, these are patients that are highly motivated. They've gone online. They've spent half an hour registering their data. But a significant minority say they're not, they're not satisfied. How often do you worry that you may have a heart attack or die suddenly? Well, a majority, if you put all these three together, a majority think that about that at least occasionally. And some people, 27% thinks, say, I often worry or I can't stop worrying. And what about FH understanding? Again, patients that are, are highly motivated, highly educated, what percentage really completely understand these things? How FH increases the risk of heart disease? 55% completely understand. Where I can get in more information? 33%. Why FH screening of family members? I think this is the mo probably the most important area that we need to address, why screening of family members is important. So what are the gaps and the future plans? Where do we want to go from here? So we need more patient-centric data. We're going to be launching a new version of our patient portal very soon. Uh, there's a demo outside. I encourage all of you to go uh, uh, play with it a little bit. I think it looks really good. We, again, have limited data on non-white populations. We need more generalizability. We need more sites. Uh, we are, uh, again, have a goal of 25 sites by the end of the year. Um, you know, uh, Mayo came online just a couple of days ago, and they've already enrolled about 20. 20 patients, something like that. So it's a race. It's a race between Geisinger, Mayo, and OHSU uh, to see how many patients they can have in by the end of the year. Just putting that out there for you guys. Uh, more longitudinal data. Oh, and UCSF. UCSF has, we just heard, they have uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of patients that uh, we need to get online in, in the registry. Uh, track efforts as PCSK9 inhibitors are in, uh, introduced. What We have a snapshot, and I think we, we are fortunate to get this snapshot and what, what's going to change over the next year. Um, and then, of course, as Paul said, we're going to be integrating MedPed. So in conclusion, there's a very high prevalence of CHD among adult FH patients. We don't do great in terms of LDL goal attainment, either by uh, getting patients to LDL less than 100 or less than 50 percent. There's huge uh, gaps means opportunities, I guess, uh, huge opportunities for early diagnosis, uh, improving care. And uh, I would urge all of you, please, to consider becoming part of this registry, guide your patients to, to registering, et cetera. And I, don't, I will definitely say that this couldn't have been done, again, without the incredible efforts of all these people and more. Um, this is the site PIs and, uh, 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 and, um, and for Cascade and the Publications Committee. I uh, can't read all the names, but uh, Emil de Goma, is, this is his list, actually. He put this together. He's, he's not listed, but he's played a huge role in helping to put these slides together as well. 
And um, uh, I think, of course, we have to thank our uh, registry sponsors who are listed here for their, uh, their foresight as well. So I think that's, uh, that's it, and I'm happy to take any questions. Catherine says, how many are we going to have next year? I'm not getting in that game anymore. Yeah, actually, yeah, we're coming. Hey, Jennifer. Uh, did we ask the question about how many had genetic testing? Oh, yeah, so how many have had genetic testing? I, can't, I couldn't show all the data, but uh, only about 3% of patients in the country have had genetic testing as part of their diagnosis. And that, if you look at, there's a huge heterogeneity if you look across sites. Some sites do a lot of genetic testing, and some sites do no genetic testing. And um, so obviously that's a huge uh, area for um, continued research. LP little a data. Oh sites. yeah, so uh, LP little a, um, you know, there's, there's, still con there's still a huge amount of heterogeneity about what units are used and, you know, what assays are used. And so in the redesign of the, of the registry, we're going to be um, collecting much more robust about L uh, data about LPA. testing America is so far behind Europe. I mean, what's the real reason why you're behind you? I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, uh, we're, we're 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 really far behind in many many ways for FH. You know, I, I don't think I don't think we can say you know we can hold the flag up and really be saying you know well, look how great we've done. I mean, there's a lot of reason for that. I think the most important reason for that is that in the United States, things are not paid for unless they're standard of care. And, uh, and it's not standard of care, um, partly because um, uh, organizations haven't said that this should be standard of care. There's not a highest, high, the, the level of evidence has, has not been there to say that, that we should be doing this. Now, the, the, uh, the CDC, uh, US CDC, says that cascade screening for FH uh, incorporating genetic and genomic data, but that also includes family history, is a tier one indication. So. But we're very uh, hopeful that um, the cost, as the cost of genetic testing comes down, that this will become more uh, more important. And Dan is going to talk about um, at the end of this session. I'll just prelude that he's going to have a, present a vision for for how this might be be, be better incorporated. Oh yeah, so you know uh, one of the big this is incredible. I mean, I just I, I think it's absolutely incredible that we have not had uh, a distinct codes for ICD-9, ICD-10 for FH. I mean, the, if you look at what patients are getting those codes, it's garden variety high cholesterol is lumped in with with FH. And now that we have multiple therapies that are specific for homozygous and heterozygous FH, it doesn't. And for many other reasons, it makes no sense to not have specific ICD-9, ICD-10 codes. And so uh, a while ago, things moved like at a glacial pace, but we applied for distinct codes for heterozygous and homozygous FH. And that would not be, we didn't mandate how that would be defined because we know that there's controversy about that. But it's, it would be heterozygous, homozygous, and undefined FH, not necessarily based on a molecular diagnosis. And those, uh, that, that was that process was very well received. It hasn't been implemented. It would be, we haven't received the final word that it will be implemented, but we're very hopeful if it does, it would be in the first update after the initial uh, uh, release of the ICD-10 codes, which are the, the initial release is supposed to happen in October of this year. I, no, not not from. I mean, we, we we can't tackle everything. I mean, I think that's worth worthwhile, but we we didn't take on that beast. Thank you very much. Bjork, we were used to tease the Americans about that they were so far behind with soccer, 
but the last game of our, uh, our Royal Orange team, we were totally defeated by the Americans. So be aware that we will be defeated in the end with FH as well. Um, the next speaker is uh, the world champion of the uh, Cascade FH registry, Professor Moriarty. He's a professor of internal medicine at the University of uh, Kansas and the head of the Lipid Averesis Clinic. But above all, he's an esteemed clinician, um, also very well known for uh, the way he manages uh, healthcare. Patrick. Thank you. I don't know what that means by that, but I'll take that as a, that's a compliment, right? Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. I was asked, because of our numbers, to kind of give an overview of our clinic to see why we have so many numbers, and I really don't have a definitive answer. Um, I like putting this uh, symbol. This is the symbol of KU on there. It's, it's been there for 100 years. It's, it's Moses in the burning bush of knowledge. And a friend of mine who's Jamaican says the Rastafari I think that's Moses in the burning bush, not of knowledge, but something else. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move ahead. And, and uh, as Josh showed you, this shows you a comparison to the Cascade uh, population in our isolated clinic. We're a little bit older. Uh, triglycerides modestly a little bit elevated. And uh, also looking at other things, we're a little bit higher in these things. Kansas City is uh, notoriously has a ratio of 10 to 1 barbecue restaurants to uh, to uh, coffee shops. So, uh, well, you can see our CHD event rate is much higher also, and we have an older group anyway. I, this is a recent paper that just came out uh, in Jack, and I thought it was quite interesting. It's from Slovenia, and it was a study since 1995 in Slovenia. They do testing on children at age five for lipids. And once they, once they have a high LDL or high total cholesterol over 230 with no family history or a total cholesterol, I think, over 190 with family history, they then uh, do genetic testing. And they found about a 250 patients out of a 50,000 number analysis, which is roughly one in 200. And they found, if you look down here, the family, I don't know if this, does this register? No. The family... Uh, History was like only 33% predictability based on Simon Broom in this patient population. And they found that the cholesterol was at like a 90 some odd positive predictive value that they had uh, genetic FH. And as our pediatricians here will say, they, they probably see this quite often because there's no insults yet on the outside of their genetic nature. But it's a very interesting study. So let me go through our clinic. So let me go, I was, I was going to talk about the outpatient clinic. Some of our our tricks of our trade in the clinic to capture patients and to diagnose disease, talk about research, some apheresis, and how we promote awareness. So um, since 1962, a man named Dan Asnoff, who's a, who was director of clinical pharmacology at KU, he's still alive, he lives here in California, started the lipid clinic. It's been run as an outpatient lipid clinic for atherosclerosis disease for adults and children. Past graduates, you might remember uh, Donald Honeyhock, who passed away a few years ago, moved on to the University of Minnesota and did fantastic work in the field of lipids. Uh, Cesare Sertori, uh, graduate also from KU, went back to Milan, is famous for discovering uh, APO1 Milano. And everyone must know Carlos de Hoveni because he did research on every lipid lipid drug in the last 80 years. Uh, <laughs> And my, my staff includes physicians, nurses, PharmDs, dietitians, study coordinators, ultrasound technicians, research assistants, students, and so forth. I mean, it's a large group of dedicated people. And our referral base is mainly every cardiology group in the city, primary care physicians, endocrinologists in the KC Metropolitan, and also the state of Kansas. And we specialize in the treatment, as you would think of, primarily in our clinic is the statin intolerant FH, elevated LPLOA, hypertriglycemia, uncontrolled dyslipidemia, and so forth for primary and secondary prevention. Uh, we offer both lipid and genetic blood testing for some, for family members of patients diagnosed with FH. We always offer that to family members with elevated LPLOA or other potential genetic related hyperlipidemias. All patients are interviewed by a licensed dietitian and also by a uh, uh, pharmacist on their first visit. Carotid intermediate thickness 
analysis is also performed in the first day of visit in our clinic. We have our ultrasound tech is right on site, so it makes it very easy for her to do that testing during that patient's visit. Then we talk a little bit about carotid and tumor thickness. It's a computer-driven edge detection system, which uh, measures early asymptomatic atherosclerotic disease. Patients are allowed to visualize their disease and before symptoms are present. It improves compliance and installs a better understanding for the necessity of medical management, particularly in parents who are seeking information of confirmation that their children really needs lipid lowering therapy. And we repeat this every two to four years uh, to evaluate, evaluate regression, progression, stabilization, whatever. And it varies, depends on the severity of the patient and also their wish to have it done. I have some patients I want it done every year based on their anxiety of finding if what they're doing in the sense of medical management is actually reversing or stabilizing the disease. This is a nice study by Park looking at carotid plaque. Now internationally, if you have a wall thickness of 1.5 millimeters, it's nat internationally recognized no longer as thickness but as plaque. And at about a 90 some odd percent probability if you have carotid plaque of that size, you have coronary plaque of that size. Very strongly correlated. So this is looking at survival with carotid plaque, with coronary disease, hard mace, or total mace. You can see a significant difference in these patients if they have carotid plaque on board. This is a way we sometimes further diagnose this patient. This is a 33-year-old male who had an LDL of 148. His BMI was, as you can see, very stable. He was on Torva 80 and azetamide 10. According to the WHO score, he was a 4. Uh, but we did his carotid, and he had plaque of 1.5 millimeters. And we also do with this technology is we can measure vascular age, because as you know, you, when you, it, you age, your wall thickens by hardening of the arteries or arteriosclerosis, which is actually thickening of the media. And you can't delineate the media in the, in the intima by ultrasound. So we can estimate how thick the wall is for a person his age and gender. And this 33-year-old man had the wall of a 60-year-old normal adult. And this kind of information resonates with the patient to understand this. And they don't like hearing themselves being a 60-year-old man. That doesn't go too well. This is a sister and brother who are FH. And the parents were kind of leery what we do. And so you can see the sister here, who's six years old, had a carotid wall thickness of a 45-year-old woman. In fact, she, her wall was thicker than her mother. And her brother had a wall of a 40-year-old male. And he was only 11 years old. So it really helps in a sense of uh, educating the patient and building up compliance. And that's the name of the game, compliance, compliance, compliance. And you have to get them on board because if you don't get them on board, you can talk to your dead in the water, you're not going to get the, get the cholesterol down and get the risk factors under control. Research. So we have a three study coordinators, two research assistants, one administrator, PhD and dietitian. We get support from KU Research Institute, which has a GCRC, which allows us to do phase one clinical trials. We perform multiple trials in our center, both on lipids, hypertension, and obesity. We used to do diabetes, but we don't do diabetes anymore. I use that to my endocrinologist. Some referrals to clinics are actually based on the physician's desire that these patients who have uncontrolled CVD may be able to get into one of our studies. So it's a great stick to, to stimulate a referral base by the physician and also by the patient. I'll get self-referrals by patients based on the knowledge that we're doing these clinical trials. Uh, I get calls, I'm sure you, a lot of you in here who do research get these, I get calls from Texas or something hearing about the study and want to come up here and get treated. So it's, it's very helpful to have research involved with your clinic if, because it, it's a good little stick. And here's some of the present lipid lowering trials we're doing. L during a host of PCSK9 trials, some of the antisense oligonucleotides with lp a and APOC3, anti-inflammatory, sterile regulatory element binding, adesantrite, phosphate, and niacin analogs. And we're doing some apheresis. We're doing the so-called escape trial, which is using PCSK9 inhibitors to wean patients off the apheresis. And uh, we actually finished enrollment of that study uh, last month. So that's, we should get results of that. Uh, shortly, early next year. Apheresis, speaking of apheresis, we started, when I took over the clinic from Dr. Dehoveny back in the mid to late 90s, I started the program of apheresis because he had a host, and we had a host of patients that were just not getting a call. 
So we started in 1999, and now it became the largest center in North America with about 50 patients. Unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, I should say, now a lot of these patients are on PCSK9 inhibitors, so we're weaning that number down as we speak of uh, these patients who, are getting, who were getting apheresis. Uh, approval for FH patients in this country is an LDL less than, greater than 160 on maximal pharmacotherapy uh, with cardiovascular disease. This was recently lowered by the FDA from 200 to 160. And it was designated specifically for the Konica device, the life resort machine, or an LDL greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter uh, maximum pharmacotherapy without symptomatic disease. The two machines approved is the Help for Tura from B. Braun from Germany and the Life Resorber uh, by Konica from Japan. And lipid reductions are LDL 60 to 80 percent with an LPLA about 60 to 70 percent. What else apheresis does, it reduces inflammation, rheology, and improves vascular function. And recently, it has other uses that have been approved by the FTA. As of this year, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis has been approved by the FDA to use lipoprotein apheresis. I've already had started two patients on it with very good results on their kidney function, decrease of the GFR, decrease in the creatinine levels, and so forth. So it's based on no American data at all. It was all based on Japanese data that was, they've been doing it since 1992, treating these patients with lipoprotein apheresis. It's a one week for 12 week therapy and it's good for a year. Uh, regional uh, approval is for L LP low A. As in, happened in Germany, there's more patients in Germany being treated with LDL apheresis uh, for LP low A than there is for FH itself. And everyone's moving in that direction. That's happening here in the United States. We have about 10, 12 patients who have specifically high LP low A, normal LDLs that have ongoing cardiovascular disease that we're doing apheresis for. And under investigation is some studies going on in preeclampsia, I think in Boston, and uh, Linda Hample knows about this. Uh, PADs going on, uh, macular degeneration. And again, this also increases referrals. I'll get patients with hypertriglyceridemia, and they come in and they say, well, my doctor told me you're going to put me on that machine that takes the cholesterol out. Or they have a low HDL or something. So it's another tool of stimulating interest to get into our clinic to get treated for whatever disease they might have related to lipids. And then finally, we, we try and promote awareness. We, we educate for general population for the university program, and also in our clinic when the first day of the patient sees us, which is about a two-hour session, counting the dietary and pharmacist and everything else, uh, we kind of educate them on atherosclerosis and FH, if they have FH, which they've I would say 90% of the time when the patients see us for the first time, they never know what the word means. Speaking of that, and I was telling Dan about this uh, earlier, and uh, we get all the referrals from the hepatologist after they give liver transplant to the patients. And uh, I found out two of the patients that got, they were sent to us, actually got FH livers. Their LDLs were 300. So I went back to the hepatologist and I said, do you know you're giving your pati these patients FH livers? And his response was, what's FH? <laughs> <laughs> what is FH? So he now is stimulating in the American Hepatology Society to change the guidelines, to make an awareness of this be before and after. Obviously, you're not going to refuse a liver for a patient because these are very rare organs to have and the necessity of these patients is very high, but there should be an awareness that this could be occurring in these patients. Uh, we are, I'm also the director of this program I started in around 2000, it's called Midwest Atherosclerotic Society, uh, Prevention Society, it should be there, MAPS, and we have quarterly speakers that come in, national leaders, international speakers, and I bring in local physicians and nurse practitioners and healthcare providers that are interested in atherosclerosis to sit down and listen to a lecture like that. Uh, we network with other physicians, like my hepatologist, and in local international conferences, publications, local TV, radio, and actually I'm on some of the insurance companies, uh, advisory boards locally to uh, assist them in, in deciding what to do for patient care when it comes to atherosclerosis and FH. Oh, I don't want to talk about that because that's, so that's it.
Any questions? Thank you. Anybody? Yeah, John. How do I fund it? Uh, I lowered the price to less than $100. I, for 10 years, in my clinic, insurance and Medicare covered it. That was amazing. This is local. And then after 10 years, they said, no, it's experimental, and they dropped it. And the insurance companies followed suit. But it's such a great tool for so many reasons, like I tried to explain. Uh, we had to do something, so I lo lowered the price to just where it covers my technician, it covers the machine. And I would say 80 to 90 percent of patients, once I see them for the first time and describe this, uh, they'll try and get it done because they understand what they, they want to know. They want to know what their vascular age is, and they want to know if they have plaque and so forth. And they'll come in and bring their spouse in next time and say, could you do her or him? Yeah. We have a lot of questions still. We save them for the uh, Okay. Save them all Thank to you. And then, of course, there's always the dubious honor to speak after the champion. <laughs> we can take that risk with uh, Professor Dan Rader. He is, of course, you all know, the professor of molecular medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a great translational uh, researcher, and he's, I think, we are very happy that he's the chief scientific advisor of the FH Foundation. Then. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, so, Pat, I want to say, uh, you know, um, at Penn, we used to have the biggest LDLA phoresis program in the country. I've said that a long time. Joyce, Joyce helped me build it. But you blew by us there, so I can't say that anymore. Um, for a while, we were the highest enroller in, FA, in Cascade FH. Uh, you blew by us there. So I have to admit, I'm just folding my hand. You, you <laughs> <laughs> so uh, th thanks so much for your presentation. So um, listen, I, st I, I stand uh, between uh, you and the photo and then lunch. So um, what I'm going to do is actually go quickly. I'm really just going to give a, a short talk, and I'm going to be flipping through a couple of my slides. What I really like to do is First, I want to remind you that the whole issue of the ICD-10 uh, coding, that came out of the first summit. So the first summit, we had a long discussion about that. It became an action item from the summit. Um, a, a group of individuals really pursued it, and we're hopeful that it's going to happen. I think it's a great example of how this kind of meeting can generate ideas that actually uh, tangibly come to reality, hopefully. So what I'm going to do here in this very brief time is present an idea that I feel very strongly about, that I would like to hope that um, out of this third summit will come an action item that will actually come to reality. That's my goal in this short time, is to try to make a case that this is something, as a foundation, we really, and as a community of FH uh, investigators, physicians, and patients, that we really should do. So um, I feel that we really need to be working, now that we've established a great registry, as you heard from Josh, to uh, developing a, a companion FH biorepository. And uh, again, uh, a lot of this is self-evident, but I think having a biorepository that ideally would include both DNA as well as plasma and serum for biomarkers could really provide additional insight into the phenotypic heterogeneity, as you heard from Case. Um, discovery of modifier genes, Case touched on this, the idea that other gene variants may modify the effect of that FH uh, gene mutation uh, in a way that impacts on outcome. Case also addressed the issue of discovery of new genes causing hypercholesterolemia. If we have a, a big repository and we do sequencing, those patients who clearly have FH but don't have identifiable mutations are fantastic opportunities for new gene discovery. And I would also argue that recruitment for clinical trials, which is increasingly going to depend on better characterization in terms of biomarkers and molecular characterization, would be markedly enhanced uh, with uh, such a repository. So that's the basic uh, case that I want to make here today. Um, I don't need to go into this, but the idea, of course, would be ideally to have a system where we can obtain blood, barcode it, get it processed in the right place, and get it stored uh, in, in, a, in, in a very effective way. I will say, um, in theory, we could try to do this with something like uh, saliva, like 23andMe does, and really focus just on DNA. But I would at least suggest to you that if we could figure out how to do this uh, funding-wise to include blood, and get the plasma and serum, I think the value of this would be even substantially greater, uh, although having the DNA alone certainly would have value. <coughs> so uh, insight into phenotypic heterogeneity, I think we heard a lot about this from Case, the variability in the age of onset of CHD. Uh, we still don't really understand uh, a lot of what underlies that. 
And there are a lot of factors that we heard from Case and Borga that um, uh, we could talk about uh, for a long time. But clearly, such a biorepository would allow us to focus on other biomarkers, other mutations, and other genetic factors that impact. <coughs> the discovery of modifier genes, I'm not going to say any more about it. I think Case made a great point about how this uh, is something that uh, a biorepository would allow us to do uh, at scale, uh, which I think could have tremendous impact. Just imagine, FH is a, a fantastic um, a disease model for uh, markedly increased cardiovascular risk. So that those FH patients who have been exposed to these high levels of cholesterol, who do very well for a long period of time, um, may have, in fact, variants that actually are protecting them, at least partially, against the effects of the high cholesterol. So think about the potential impact of that if we could find variants in other genes that are protective against the effects of the high cholesterol would be fantastic potential new targets uh, for therapeutic approaches. And uh, that's really one, one of the practical aspects of, uh, of that type of investigation. <coughs> Discovery of new genes causing hypercholesterolemia, Case touched on this. I wouldn't want to use this just very briefly to illustrate one project that we carried out at Penn. And this was a project in collaboration with uh, uh, Progenica uh, that is one of the sponsors here. And there's some individuals uh, from Progenica. We basically took 25 people from our, uh, from our clinic who had really definite FH by the MedPEG criteria, Paul. <coughs> um, and then we basically, collaborate, collaborating with Progenica, uh, uh, had them perform next-gen sequencing for the, the three genes that are known causes of FH. Um, and then, as shown in this slide, for those individuals, as I'll show you, who, who didn't have um, uh, identifiable mutations based on their first round, they went that back and did MLPA uh, to look for uh, uh, deletions or duplications. So I won't take the time to walk this slide. I just want to point out that um, we found 17 of the 25 had pathogenic mutations. Um, there were two so-called variants of unknown significance that we think are probably pathogenic. Initially, we had six that we didn't find mutations, and Progenica very, very kindly went back and did the MLPA. And four of those six actually had duplications that are clearly um, uh, ca uh, causal and pathogenic. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to the lower right-hand box. Two out of these 25 that met strict MedPed criteria that we're quite certain have FH, we could not identify variants. So a little bit my case similar to cases is that we can uh, use these types of patients and really then look more carefully and try to identify new genes that might be causes of uh, the FH uh, phenotype. <coughs> I want to briefly uh, uh, remind you of the trial that we're now really uh, heading into the home stretches of. I've talked about this before, but it really is in the vein of genetic testing being applied to FH more widely. I think this is one of these cross-cutting themes for this meeting that's really, really interesting and important and one that we're going to have discussions about later on today and uh, for the next uh, uh, couple years. But this is a, a, a study being led by Emil with uh, Marina Kukul, who's here uh, as, as one of the co-investigators, um, really asking the question, do we improve family cascade screening by doing genetic testing? And basically, as you may recall, we're basically testing the hypothesis that <coughs> there's a difference between just telling someone you have a high cholesterol, your relatives should get checked, versus you have a mutation in this gene that's causing your high cholesterol, and we'd like to screen, or your relatives should be screened for that mutation. We think that the latter, the, b the bottom one, is going to be more likely to result in more family members wanting to be screened. So that's basically the trial. It's fully enrolled. We're now just following up and uh, waiting to see, in fact, if the genetic testing has led to uh, increased screening. <coughs> um, and again, this is a great collaboration with Progenica. I really want to uh, ca call out Progenica for our, our uh, collab collaborative uh, um, interactions with them. <coughs> And then finally, I, t I touched on the idea of uh, a biorepository being an engine for recruitment. I think uh, if we can go beyond just uh, who has FH and what are their LDLs, but what are their other biomarker characteristics, the subset who maybe have also high LP little a's, or a specifically molecularly defined subsets of patients would be a fantastic vehicle for recruitment. And I'm just going to use this. Um, to, to uh, tell you uh, about a, a, a new study that we're about to launch at Penn. <coughs> and um, some of you know we've been interested in liver-directed gene therapy for uh, homozygous FH for a long time. We've been working on it for a while. Um, and the concept here, of course, is in the absence of the LDL receptor, coming in with a vector that transduces the hepatocytes with the LDL receptor could be a really great way of actually potentially uh, curing homozygous FH. And we have a lot of preclinical data. This is just one experiment. 
the LDL receptor knockout mouse injected with a dose of the AV8 adeno-associated viral vector, 8 vector, uh, conferred marked reduction in LDL that was stable for a long period of time. So this is the kind of preclinical data we have. I'll just show you one other slide. You know, uh, we want to be able to test the human LDL receptor in this context. So we used human ApoB transgenic mice crossed onto the, um, our double knockout model. And you can see, um, I won't take the time, but basically um, the human LDL receptor works actually better in the context of the human ApoB. So a human-to-human -human interaction, a protein-protein interaction, where really works the best. And so we have a lot of preclinical data that gives us confidence that this approach just might work. <coughs> and I'm pleased to announce that um, we're about ready to launch a clinical trial. The PI is Marina Kukul, who's here in this audience. I do want to acknowledge Pat Moriarty. We had a lot of discussions with Pat over the last couple years about the design of this trial. He's had tremendous helpful input into the design. We have funding from NHLBI that we got a, a PO1 recently renewed, and we also have some additional funding from Regenex Bio, um, a, a, a startup biotech that um, uh, is going to also be helping to support this trial. And basically, it's in patients with genotype-proven homozygous FH. They have to be 18 or older. They have to have a, a, a level of uh, neutralizing antibody to AV8 that is below a certain titer level, as shown there. There are two cohort groups <coughs> um, a, a with the doses, as shown there. Um, and the pr of course, this is a safety study, uh, but we'll also be looking at LDL cholesterol and LDL turnover. I do want to say that AV8 as a vector has been used in humans. So uh, some of you may know there have been some hemophilia trials that have used AV8 already. Um, in, and so far, early days looks to be safe, and uh, actually there was some uh, real efficacy in those hemophilia trials. So it's an exciting time. I think the concept of AV8 as a vector for uh, transducing human liver for therapeutic purposes is really on the scene. There's tremendous excitement uh, in, the, in the academic and biotech community about this approach, and we're really thrilled to be able to initiate uh, this, uh, this protocol with the expectation that we'll be dosing the first patient uh, in the early part of 2016. <coughs> so this is basically my final slide. I think there's a tremendous value to um, initiating an FH by repository. What we need is leadership. We need basically one or more people to stand up and say, I really want to try to move this forward. We definitely need funding, so I'm talking directly here to our many sponsors who are here in this audience. If we all think this is a good idea, this would be the kind of thing that multiple sponsors could help together, work together to fund. Of course, we need a protocol, we need a governance model, and there are a lot of logistical issues to work through. It's not a trivial thing to do, but I really think that this is something that can be done, should be done, and we have the capacity to do. And to be able to link it to the Cascade FH registry, where we have all this biomarker and genetic data linked to this tremendous clinical and outcome data, would just be the kind of resource that would take us to, uh, to another level. Uh, in terms of the FH community. So um, with that, I'll stop. And um, <coughs> Eric, I think I'm not going to take any questions in the interest of time, uh, but um, basically thank everybody for this great session. And uh, I think we need to all come up and have our picture taken, right? So <laughs> we have a uh, an incredibly exciting session in store, so um, it'd be great to get started. So I'm sure people are going to be coming back in, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead. So th this session, we, we titled New Approaches to Finding FH Patients, one of the big themes of this meeting. Um, and we decided to start out with a couple presentations that really have to do with something that's very relevant to that, which is what is the newest data on how common FH is, how many patients might be out there. So the first two talks are, are going to be sort of uh, on that topic, and then we're going to segue to approaches to actually doing it. Um, and uh, I just think this is going to be a, a really exciting session with new uh, unpublished data and new approaches to accomplishing this very important task. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the session, Ann Tyver Hansen. Uh, and, uh, uh, Dr. Tyber Hansen is a professor of clinical biochemistry at the University of uh, Copenhagen. Uh, we saw two of her beautiful children on one of the slides earlier today. Um, and Anne's work, I think, is familiar to many of you. She's really been one of the world's leaders in the genetics of ischemic heart disease, especially capitalizing on the huge resources uh, that they've built over the years uh, in Copenhagen. And Anne, we're so delighted you could uh, come here and speak to us on the prevalence of FH. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really greatly great, great honored to be here. Um, uh, the title of my talk, the title I've been given is Update on the Prevalence of FH. Uh, but first, uh, an agenda here. Uh, I think I have to tell you a little about the history here. Where does the estimated prevalence of FH actually come from? Uh, then we move on to the prevalence of FH. How can you determine it? How can you determine it clinically versus with a molecular diagnosis? And then we move on to some new data on the prevalence of FH, uh, FH determined with the clinical diagnosis, the prevalence of FH determined molecularly, and finally a conclusion. So a little bit of history to start with, where does the estimated prevalence of FH actually come from? Now the dogma is of course that heterozygous FH, the prevalence of that is 1 in 500. And that's what we have all learned, at least in my age group. And for this heterozygous, uh, heterozygosity of 1 in 500, you can calculate that homozygosity is found in 1 in a million. And how do you get to that? Well, I'll not bore you too much with mathematics, but let's uh, say that in a stable population, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uh, takes place, and the Hardy-Weinberg law actually states that the frequency of homozygosity, uh, if you have two alleles, is p squared, uh, the frequency of unaffected is q squared, and the frequency of heterozygosity to be q, and this equals one, and also the allele frequency of P, the variant allele plus Q, the normal allele equals one. And uh, when you solve for these two equations, then with our example, where 2PQ is one in 500, that's the heterozygous frequency, then the frequency of the P allele is one in a thousand, and you can then calculate that P squared, the frequency of homozygosity is one in a thousand times one in a thousand, one in a million. But where does this one in 500 come from? Actually, it comes from this paper here, hyperlipidemia and coronary heart disease. The first author is Joe Goldstein, and there are a lot of prominent authors uh, on this paper, published in JCI in 1973. Uh, and it's a genetic analysis of lipid levels in 176 families and delineation of a new inherited disorder combined hyperlipidemia. But uh, what they did here is they estimated based on the frequency and relatives of survivors with myocardial infarction, uh, the uh, heterozygous frequency of familial hypercholesterolemia in the general population. And the frequency was estimated at one in a thousand uh, to one in 500. And the authors actually specifically write that this is probably a gross underestimation. So that's where the one in 500 comes from. Then of course there are exceptions as you have heard today. There are founder effects in some countries and that means uh, Hardy-Weinberg uh, cannot be applied here. Uh, because the heterozygous frequency is due to inbreeding are much higher, and that goes for the French Canadians, the Africanos in South Africa, the Christian Lebanese, uh, the Finns, and a number of other uh, places. Uh, this uh, paper was published in the European Heart Journal in 2013, and uh, it became a bestseller, I think. And uh, from this paper, uh, we have a very nice figure here, or maybe you don't think it's very nice, but it's very educational anyway. So this, uh, the numbers you, you see here are based on an estimate of FH of one in 500. And then, of course, on the number of inhabitants in these countries here from where we have data. And so the estimated number of FH patients based on this frequency here, you can see here to the left. And uh, based on these numbers, you can then calculate uh, how large a percentage of these individuals uh, have actually been diagnosed. 
And as you can see, it goes quite well up here. We know that the Netherlands are the world masters here, right? Norway is pretty good, Iceland, Switzerland, and the UK. But the rest is pretty dismal. And I just want to draw your attention to, I mean, I have to kid you a little, that the states are down here, right? That's not very good, guys. <laughs> Uh, Denmark is also not good, but basically the prevalence of FH, you can determine this uh, as a clinical diagnosis, more or less as you'll see, uh, or you can use a molecular diagnosis. So let's have a look at the clinical diagnosis. You know that there are different diagnostic tools uh, you can use and some people subscribe to one, some to the other. In Europe, we mostly use the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network, work, except uh, I think at my hospital sometimes they use the Simon Broom criteria, but there you are. Uh, suffice it to say that these two criteria here uh, include genetic diagnosis if available, while the MedPed criteria, as I've understood it, uh, do not actually include that. They include an age stratified LDL cholesterol level. So they are a bit different, these uh, diagnostic tools, to say the least. Uh, when you talk about molecular diagnosis, usually what you're thinking of is sequencing of the LDL receptor gene, uh, the receptor binding region of ApoB, or possibly the entire ApoB gene, uh, which is not a nice undertaking, and PCSK9, and sometimes uh, the LDL receptor adapter protein 1, but that's a recessive disease, right? So that's rare. Okay. But let's have a look at the prevalence of FH in the general population with the clinical diagnosis. Now, Mayanne Bin uh, in our group was actually the first uh, back in, I think, 2012 uh, to determine the prevalence of FH in the general population uh, using uh, clinical diagnostics. And what Mayanne did was, as you can see here, she actually uh, used the Dutch Lipid Clinic criteria and the Copenhagen General Population Study, which at this time had 69,000 participants. And uh, she then applied the Dutch Clinic criteria to this population and identif identified those who, by these criteria, had uh, uh, a definite or probable diagnosis of FH, i.e. by these criteria, a score above five. And here's the data. As you can see, the prevalence fraction or fraction out here, and this is for the total population. Uh, the red are the women and in blue the men. And as you can see, the frequency here is uh, slightly uh, less than one in 200, around one in 200. That's what you should remember. Uh, if you look here to the left, we have stratified by 20 year age groups and uh, men and women have the same uh, prevalence in this age group here, but you can see that uh, by, in the older age groups, the men tend to disappear and that probably means that the men with FH die off here. So that also means that this total frequency is probably underestimated. But around 1 in 200. And what does that mean then? Yeah, well, if the frequency is not 1 in 500, but 1 in 200, you can see here that for the entire world region, we don't have 14 million FH patients, but we actually have around 34 million. And for the European region alone, we don't, we don't have around 2 million, but we actually have more, uh, around 5 million. So a huge difference. And what about for homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia? This is another consensus paper from the European Society of Cardiology, uh, published in European Heart Journal in 2014. And here's the data then for homozygous FH. Again, if the frequency is not 1 in 500, but more closer to 1 in 200, then the frequency, the estimated frequency of homozygous FH would be 1 in 160,000. And for the entire world, we would not have 7 million individuals homozygous for FH, or not 7 million, 7,000 individuals, but around 43,000. And in the entire European re region, not 900, but uh, more close to 6,000. 
Okay, let's move on to the prevalence of FH in the general population and use of molecular diagnosis. So this paper, you have already seen some data from this morning, and several of the authors are actually present in the audience here today. And this is uh, from the Dutch group, and uh, this actually determines the prevalence of FH in the general population based on homozygous uh, patients. So, uh, as you all know, I'm sure the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam is unique in that it serves as a nationwide DNA diagnostic center for what they call autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia, but it's basically what I have called FH, but it incorporates mutations in the three main genes. And this is a unique situation, of course, uh, and uh, they have a database uh, in the DNA Diagnostics Lab here at the Academic Medical Center, and in this database they have almost 105,000 individuals. Quite amazing. 178 of these were double uh, autosomal dominant hypocholesterolemia mutation carriers, and then some were excluded, uh, mainly because they had non-pathogenic mutations, and the double heterozygous were also excluded, and a few others. So they ended up with uh, 49 patients with homozygous autosomal dominant uh, hypercholesterolemia in this analysis. There were some assumptions. The population in the Netherlands is about 17 million. Uh, and another assumption, of course, which may not be completely correct, but that doesn't really matter, is that all homozygous patients in the Netherlands are referred to the Academic Medical Center. Uh, and if they're not, I mean, this will actually underestimate the frequency. Okay, so the prevalence of FH uh, in this setting here, well, we had 49 uh, homozygous or compound heterozygous out of this population here, and that gives you a frequency of about 1 in 300,000 of homozygous FH. And when you use the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, you can then calculate that the frequency of heterozygous is 1 in 244. So pretty close to what uh, Marianne's estimate was uh, uh, that I showed you before. Uh, Marianne Ben in our group uh, did a similar study on the molecular diagnosis of FH in the general population, and she now used the again the Coman general population study now 100,000 participants. And in this study, she genotyped for four mutations accounting for approximately 39% of pathogenic mutations in Danish FH patients. Now, uh, the assumption here is then that the distribution uh, of mutations in the FH patients is the same as in the general population. And this might not be correct, but it's not going to have a large effect on the results here. So the prevalence of FH in the general population using the molecular di diagnosis in Mayana's study uh, was 1 in 565 for, for these mutations that accounted for roughly 39%. So for all FH mutations, we can calculate that the prevalence is 1 in 219. And hence the frequency of homozygosity around 1 in 200,000. So again, very close to the estimates I showed you before. But uh, let's make one thing clear. You have seen this slide before today because Case also showed it. And that is that uh, although the frequency is similar, there's not complete overlap be between a clinical diagnosis and a mutation diagnosis. So some patients have a clinical diagnosis, but they don't have a mutation, or at least we don't find a mutation, right? There might still be something there. And some people have a mutation diagnosis, but they don't have a clinical diagnosis. So they have mainly lower LDL levels. So let me just remind you that we don't treat the mutation, we actually treat the LDL cholesterol levels. So just to sum up, here is my take home message. So the frequency of 
appendicitis FH in the population is not one in 500, it's probably more close to one in 200, which makes a huge difference. The allele frequency is not one in a thousand, it's closer to one in 400 probably. And the frequency of homozygous FH is not one in a million, uh, but more close to one in 160,000, one in 200,000. And that's about it. And I thank you for your attention. So uh, I'm going to introduce our, our next speaker. I think uh, will follow up beautifully to what you just heard, Nate Stitzel. Um, Nate is an assistant professor of medicine at Washington University in St. Louis and cardiology, and uh, has really uh, been um, someone who has contributed quite a lot uh, in his early stage of his career to our understanding of the, the genetics of complex traits uh, like lipids and other cardiovascular risk factors and coronary disease. <coughs> and, um, he uh, uh, flew here from St. Louis to tell us about some of his uh, recent and unpublished data related to the topic of uh, FH. Thanks. Thank well, thank you, Dan, for that kind introduction, and thank you so much to the organizers for the uh, chance to present some of the work we've been doing on population sequencing. Maybe my slides didn't land with me. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, so I um, clearly uh, FH needs some introduction to this audience, and I don't provide these bullet points for way of, of, of education, but simply to um, point out some of the dogmas um, that we heard about earlier, um, and to try and think about how we can address some of these issues um, using some sequencing data. Um, so, you know, uh, beginning medical students um, you know, open up a, a textbook of cardiovascular or, or internal medicine, um, and, you know, they learn that FH is a disordered metabolism of low density um, lipoprotein cholesterol, but it's caused by mutations in the LDLR gene that are transmitted within families according to laws of Mendelian inheritance, and that it causes premature myocardial infarction, and finally, that in the population, if you look, you find FH in about 1 in 500 individuals in a heterozygous state. Um, and really, I think that we'd um, like to talk today about three of these bullet points and see if we can drill in a little bit further um, and explore beyond families, think about what role LDLR mutations might be playing in the population, um, to talk about what extent of early MI is actually due to FH from a population perspective, um, and then really to see whether or not we can um, follow up on the earlier talk about um, using DNA sequencing to update the estimate of the uh, prevalence of FH in the population. Um, the formatting on this slide obviously came across um, um, uh, actually not as I expected, but um, perhaps it actually uh, does point out nicely the complexities of the genome, which I was, <laughs> I was trying to get across. Since we met the human genome, we've obviously learned about a lot about genome biology um, and also individual point changes within the genome that I, you know, are quite complex. Um, as we all know, the genome is about 3 billion base pairs, 1% of which encodes for proteins. So we have about 20,000 genes. Um, and these slides are going all over the place. Um, each individual carries about 4 million point changes, 20,000 of which reside inside protein regions, and 5,000 of which actually alter protein sequence. And obviously the fundamental challenge for human genetics is trying to discover which of these changes lead to health and disease. Um, and in terms of thinking about gene mapping for Mendelian disease, um, either from a research perspective or um, in the clinic, and, you know, what we do clinically for genetic testing, and typically we start with the pedigree um, shown here. So shaded um, uh, symbols are obviously those are affected. So for instance, with FH, and we start with you know a, a handful of individuals um, in the family that are distantly related, and we try and perform uh, linkage or sequencing or variety of genetics. And then move on um, in a research perspective to try and segregate the genotype with the phenotype, or from a um, cascade testing perspective, um, for instance, in the clinic, to identify at risk individuals in future generations. And then bring up this point to really um, try and highlight the fact that genotyping is very helpful to study um, genetics within families, 
Um, and perhaps some Mendelian disorders um, that are characterized by recurrent mutations or sort of key, key, key residue mutations um, in certain genes, um, but LDLR obviously is not one of those genes, and FH um, is, is a sort of a different story. Um, and I think that was highlighted nicely by this figure from a review article in 2007 um, that highlights the um, exon, the 18 protein coding region, or sorry, protein coding exons of the LDLR gene that give rise to, um, to the LDLR protein with its different domains. And if you think about where FH mutations are found in the gene, you actually find them across the entire gene. Um, and not only are they found um, in various regions, but they're found obviously with, with um, high, high frequency in terms of numbers. The, the, the individual mutations may be rare, but, um, but obviously there are a lot of mutations that contribute to disease. Um, and so obviously since the discovery of the LDLR gene in, in 1985 through 2006, which was the year before the review article was published, um, you know, there had been 18, or sorry, 800 mutations that were discovered, and obviously that number has gone you know, nothing but upward um, since that time. Um, and so I think, you know, clearly this, um, this indicates that characterizing genetic variation in populations um, from a broad standpoint really requires full gene sequencing. Um, and uh, you know, previously that was quite intractable. It was very difficult to think about how to do that, but with advances in sequencing technology and now we have next generation sequencing, um, this is now finally possible. Um, and I think, you know, for the first time ever, we can really start to try and address the question, um, you know, what, to what extent does rare variation underlie disease? Um, so to, to try and address this question for um, myocardial infarction, um, I was involved in some work where we designed an experiment and we took 5,000 individuals that experienced MI at an early age and we compared those to 5,000 MI3 controls um, and we sequenced the entire exome for those 10,000 individuals um, to detect, detect changes across all 20,000 genes. Um, and then, of course, you're left with a, a pile of data that's jumbled, like the slide I showed you before. Um, and then you're left with a challenge in, ter in terms of trying to figure out, um, you know, identifying causal genes. And so I'll give you a sort of a cartoon example that I think will be instructive when we look at the actual data. Um, and so this cartoon example shows two exons, so two protein coding exons in a cartoon gene. Um, and individual circles are the um, number uh, on the left and the right are the number of individuals um, that, that, um, in which a mutation is discovered. And so there are four mutations shown by green, purple, um, orange, and blue. Um, and the first one is a green mutation that's found in five cases and no controls. Um, and you know, the orange one is found in one control and no cases. Um, and I, I, I provide this to highlight the fact that when you sequence genes, you often discover very rare things. And so it's very hard to figure out what the association is with disease, and so we typically end up collapsing these counts across genes. And so, for instance, in this um, cartoon example, we would have a gene that has eight mutations in cases compared with two in controls. And so there's a variety of statistical methods to try and figure out is, is this a chance observation or does this actually represent association with disease? And so obviously, you repeat this for every gene, um, and I won't get into all the details, um, but suffice it to say um, that we did this experiment um, and we sequenced 20,000 genes across 10,000 individuals, and we found two genes that were definitively associated with MI. Um, these data were published earlier this year, and we identified, um, I hope it's no surprise to this audience, um, that rare LDLR uh, alleles confer risk for myocardial infarction. I won't talk about the other gene that we discovered, um, but I'll jump right to the data for LDLR. And the data are shown, um, sort of highlighted in this figure here, um, where again, the 18 protein coding exons for um, LDLR are depicted starting from the five prime end at the top, going down to the three prime end. And again, on the left are circles um, that indicate cases that carry mutation, and on the right are controls um, uh, that carry mutations. And they're color-coded so that mutations in red are carried strictly by cases, mutations in blue are carried strictly by controls, and mutations in yellow are shared between cases and controls. Um, and the genomic position of those mutations is sort of tried to indicate um, using those lines that sort of go back to the gene. Um, Obviously, the challenge is that um, this class of, of, of mutation, or this class of variation, um, may include some things that actually don't alter protein function, even though they alter protein sequence. And those, uh, that sort of um, concept is highlighted, I think, by looking um, at the individual's, um, at the, the individual LDL cholesterol level of, um, of people um, uh, divided by their mutation class. So if you look at the population of people that carry no mutations in LDLR, they have an average LDL cholesterol of 134, which is sort of the population average. If you look at any rare protein-altering variant, um, and you sort of group those individuals together, and you, and you ask what their LDL cholesterol is, it's 142. So elevated, but you know, quite, a, quite a wide distribution, I think probably indicating that some of these alter protein sequence, but they don't necessarily alter protein function. If you take a computational approach to try and drill down and you look in that class of variation and you try and figure out which of these are likely to alter protein function and which of these are likely to, to be deleterious to protein function, you see that those class of individuals actually have markedly elevated LDL cholesterol uh, on average of 189. 
And if you then ask the association with disease, um, the risk of disease obviously goes up considerably because we're obviously enriching for um, functional mutations in LDLR. So we find that 2% of MI cases carry a deleterious mutation in LDLR compared to about a half percent of controls, indicating those individuals are at about a fourfold increased risk um, for MI. Obviously, even that class is sort of still a mix of missense and loss of function variants, and so there's, there's a variety of mutations in there. And so if you just focus strictly on loss of function mutations, um, you see that those individuals have markedly elevated LDL cholesterol on average of about 282. Um, those people, as you would expect, are quite, um, um, they, they're at quite a increased risk of MI, and so um, those occur uh, much more, uh, much less frequently in the population. So of cases, we only see about half percent of cases carry a disruptive mutation in LDLR um, compared to 0.04 percent in controls, um, indicating that those individuals have a 13-fold increased risk for MI. So these data now, we're sort of being able to tabulate across populations. We're being able to find LDLR alleles, try and figure out the biochemical impact, and then um, try and identify the numbers of carriers. And so obviously this gets at the question of, you know, can we start to address the prevalence? Um, we heard a nice um, piece earlier, so I won't um, belabor the point, um, but really the historical prevalence estimates, you know, date back to 40 years ago. Um, and, um, and so we can, you know, hopefully update that prevalence estimate using uh, now direct DNA sequencing. Well, I told you earlier, you know, maybe we can just say, like, well, you know, we're done. We sequenced the gene. We figured out what's in the gene, and so, you know, we're all done. Um, I told you that 4% of controls carry a rare LDLR variant that alters protein sequence. Um, and so the obvious question is, you know, is FH prevalence really 1 in 25? And, you know, it's a rhetorical question, and the answer is obviously no. And I think that's highlighted by these data. Where on the, on the left is the entire population of controls. So I should mention that we focus these analyses on control subjects um, to avoid any ascertainment bias because cases are enriched for um, elevated LDL and enriched for FH. Um, and so we look at controls on the left. Um, and so you can see a population distribution of LDL, which you'd expect. And then if you look at the number of individuals that carry any protein altering variant in LDLR, um, again, slightly average, or on average, slightly increased, and the distribution, if you squint real hard, it is actually shifted to the right, but I think this indicates that there's a lot of variants that alter protein sequence but don't necessarily alter protein function. So I think the real question that we need to focus on is trying to identify how many individuals carry a functional rare variant in LDLR. And I think one way to do this, I think, you know, we can talk about the best way to do this, but one way to do this is to ask how many people carry a rare LDLR variant and have biochemical evidence that they have disordered LDL metabolism. So um, how many individuals essentially carry a, a rare LDLR variant and have an LDL above 190? Admittedly an arbitrary cut point, um, but at least some sort of threshold. Um, and those data, or those individuals, there's about one in 217 from the control population. As you'd expect, this is actually quite enriched in cases, and so there's actually about one in 50 cases um, carry one of these, um, have the same criteria. Obviously, you can imagine that restricting to controls might slightly underestimate the prevalence if we're getting rid of, you know, we're getting rid of MI cases, and so we're focusing only on controls. Um, and these data are actually hot off the press um, this week, and so I'm fortunate enough to be affiliated with the uh, McDonald Genome Institute at the Washington University School of Medicine, and we have now population data um, that, again, just came off the the sequencers, and so I don't um, ha have a lot of data on it, um, but we have about 10,000 individuals from the population. So these are unascertained on uh, MI, lipids, they're just sort of general um, population individuals, and you can see the LDL distribution here, and if you ask the same question, it turns out that about one in 205 individuals have, again, elevated LDL and a rare LDLR variant. So I think just to wrap things up, it looks like about 2% of early on onset MI cases carry a rare vari variant in LDLR and have ele elevated LDL cholesterol. And I think it's actually quite interesting, you know, this meeting is um, there's lots of different orthogonal data, um, so sequencing and genetic and non-genetic. And so I think, you know, there's a, cons uh, a real emerging answer um, that's sort of focusing on the 1 in 200 uh, number in terms of individuals that probably have uh, heterozygous FH. With that, I'd like to um, thank um, the people that helped do the work and do a shameless plug that I have postdocs available if anybody knows good computational people. Um, that are interested in doing exciting work. Um, and I'd like to say thanks for the invitation and happy to take any questions. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you um, why you do refer to it as a, a, a rare 
mutation is it, if it is this prevalent. What is the definition in genetics then of, of rare? I'm curious about that since we fight that. <laughs> yeah, label. no, um, yeah, I think there's a, so I think um, individually these are quite rare. Um, and so again, if you sequence 10,000 people and you find it once, that's quite rare. Um, collectively, it's actually not quite so rare. Um, so one in 200 people may have this, um, but the individual mutation is very rare. Um, there's no real, uh, these are all sort of arbitrary words in terms of there's a big debate in genetics, what's low frequency, what's rare, what's common. Um, and again, you can sort of set the cut point somewhere. But I think most people would agree that if you sequence a gene in 10,000 people and you find a mutation once, that mutation is very rare. Although the cumulative frequency of all mutations across the gene is quite common. Does that make sense? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk again. <laughs> it, was, it, was that, it was that jumbled slide, wasn't it? That, that threw off the whole thing. The Dutch have two or three very common variants where the mean LDL in those guys is just 160. Um, and it counts for almost half. I believe, of their uh, FH cases. And uh, part of the reason why the means look rather different, if you look at the more severe mutations, they look just like oh, everybody else's old definitions of FH, and you include these new ones, and you know, all the cut points you have to throw out the window practically for them. So any progress in that area? <clears throat> I think it's a real challenge. I think. Um you know, I, I guess what would you like to do? You'd like to be able to sequence a million people, find mutations, and then biochemically figure out which of those lead to, to altered function of, of the protein. Um, you know, short of that, I think we have to cut arbitrary points in the data. Um, I think, you know, the reason, again, to sort of require that the LDL is elevated is that um, LDLR variants are common and not all of those affect protein function. Again, about one in 25 people carry a rare variant in LDLR. Um, a lot of those people have low LDL, and it's pretty clear that those aren't FH um, alleles. Um, if, you, if you set the analysis to require that people have LDL of above 160, there's a lot of ways to get to LDL of 160, obviously. And so we're still left with that question in terms of how many of those people um, truly have FH. So I think it's just, it's like the, the, the nice um, um, chart you showed or the figure you showed where it's a probability um, estimation in terms of trying to enrich for um, something and trying to, you know, exclude the, the false positives. Yeah, it's not really a question. It's more helping Catherine to educate Nathan. So it's like, I would never call it a rare disease. I always call it, it's the most common dominant inherited disorder that kills most people in the entire world. That's what I call it, not a rare disease. It's a common disease. No, I, and I, I may, maybe I misspoke. I don't think, I'm, maybe I said it was rare. No, but um, it's not a question. It was a common. Don't worry. Yeah, I was just trying to disease, help Catherine. That's variant, all. Yeah. yeah. Elements that are mitigating uh, some of the, uh, the, the the mutations effects. I think that's possible. I think um, you know we know that there are lots of um, we know that the majority of missense mutations in the human genome do not um, impact protein function to a large degree. Um, and so you can look at any disease gene and you can sequence in the population and you find lots of stuff. Um, and you know this we we do this in the clinic, right? We we sequence genes for cardiomyopathy in the clinic and we discover lots of things that probably aren't related to disease. Um, and so I think some of it may be um, modifying, but some of it's clearly neutral variation um, that so doesn't. Will, will they be looked at further, or are they just kind of thrown away, discarded? Uh, the, the, the one in 25, th those particular ones. I'm just wondering, you know, in the future, are we going to be looking at those more closely to see whether they're they're interacting with other. Uh, other genes and uh, other modifying agents. Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's hard to wrap your head around sort of how you do the experiment because it's, there's so many, um, there's so many possibilities in terms of gene-gene interactions and gene environment. And, but I, it's a great point. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Oh. Nate, thank you. Great uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, is your next paper, will your next paper be about uh, segregation analysis of these mutations in the families? Do you start screening now? 
Uh, in terms of finding these, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. It's a great point. Um, you know, unfortunately, these data are limited. These are sort of cohort data um, that were collected under um, study designs where the people are not um, contactable. So um, there's no recontact for the the people that were in that study. Um, uh, so I have a short question, I think, uh, related to Paul's question earlier or comment earlier, and that is <clears throat> one of the areas where I'm not sure there's agreement is what proportion of loss of LDL receptor function constitutes FH. Uh, if, if you have a total knockout of one allele, then everybody says, yes, that's FH. But um, is it 20 percent, 25 percent, 30? What's your criterion for determining that a, a, a mutation is relevant? I don't, I don't know that I have the answer. Um, um, uh, we don't have biochemical data for these uh, variants, and so I, I should say that these were not on biochemical data. Um, the initial upfront screen was sort of using computational algorithms that look at conservation and sort of areas in the protein, but, but have no biochemical data behind them. Um, and then the second cut was looking at LDL levels. Um, I don't know the answer in terms of, you know, at what point do you move into um, you know, something that alters protein function to something that disrupts protein function. Um, that's a, probably a gray zone that other people are probably better able to answer than I am. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, I just think it, it's remarkable how these different strands of evidence are, are converging on this issue. Um, and that leads me to my, our next speaker. I'm really delighted to introduce uh, Mike Murray. <coughs> Mike. Uh, one of these rare breeds. He's an internist who's uh, also boarded in medical genetics. Uh, not that many people like that in this country. <laughs> um, who, uh, after about a decade uh, leading clinical genetics at the Brigham, uh, moved a couple years ago to uh, Geisinger for just an amazing opportunity to uh, lead the essentially lead the effort of taking all the data coming out of cl clinical exome sequencing in hundreds of thousands of patients at Geisinger. Uh, and getting that data back into the medical record for actionable genes and instructing physicians about how to actually communicate and use that data. Just an amazing experiment that he's going to tell you about. But I think Mike is perfectly positioned in this program because they have a lot of data also on this issue of uh, prevalence of FH, but they're also at Geisinger very interested in using the electronic medical record as part of the eMERGE consortium to really lead efforts to try to identify patients with FH uh, using that approach. And uh, Mike is going to kind of bridge that uh, and lead to our final uh, uh, presentation for this session. So Mike, uh, we're so happy you could, you could come, come uh, be with us here. Thank you. Thanks very much for that kind uh, introduction, Dan. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm a um, geneticist, as Dan said, uh, who uh, is completely humbled in this room by uh, the knowledge base about lipids. Uh, I brought Carolyn Graham from uh, Geisinger, who's our frontline clinician who deals with uh, FH patients and has for some time. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about our case finding efforts, as, uh, as Dan mentioned. Okay, so um, when I left um, the Brigham uh, almost three years ago, uh, I was met with a, a, a recurring question. Uh, what is a Geisinger? Um, <laughs> and so Geisinger is a uh, integrated healthcare system in Pennsylvania. Um, and um, they have uh, got a lot of traction uh, over the years for being um, a leader in electronic health records. They were one of the first adopters of the uh, EPIC uh, electronic health care record. They've got a lot of attention for the business of medicine uh, and for innovative thinking around medical homes and some of the other uh, big ideas that are uh, taking place in healthcare in general. But until recently, they haven't been known for uh, genomics. So uh, over the last four years, a team has been built and a, uh, a collaboration has been forged with uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. So uh, I think in the booklet I'm listed as not having any disclosures. Uh, we do have this big project between our institutions, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceutical and our healthcare system. And uh, some of the work I'm going to tell you about today comes out of that collaboration. 
So uh, our healthcare system takes up uh, this part uh, outlined in white of uh, north central and northeastern Pennsylvania. Its catchment area has about 3.3 million individuals. Uh, and it is very highly uh, Caucasian, about 95% or greater are Northern European ancestry. And so the three case finding strategies for FH that we've been talking about uh, for some time now uh, include what we call our Genome First program. And this is where we are uh, taking the uh, patients in our biobank, which is called MyCode, uh, we are doing whole exome sequencing on them in collaboration with Regeneron. Uh, and then we are setting up a clinical return of results for 27 conditions, including FH. Uh, we are also offering cascade testing to first degree relatives for all of these conditions, including uh, FH. The second uh, project, which I'll uh, tell you some more about, is the Emerge. Uh, project, which is an NIH-funded uh, NHGRI uh, consortium of healthcare institutions. They have just entered phase three of the uh, consortium, and Geisinger has been uh, lucky enough to be involved in phase two and now phase three. Uh, the third uh, strategy we're talking about is Find FH, uh, and I'll leave that up to Kelly to tell you about uh, after I get done talking. So first to Emerge. Um, the Emerge network started in 2007. Phase one was uh, until 2011. We joined at Geisinger in 2011, and we're lucky enough to be funded in round three, which just started in the last couple months. And the basic idea is that a, a consortium of uh, healthcare uh, organizations around the country who have uh, electronic health records, uh, which meet certain criteria, and have uh, biobank and at least genotype data um, that's linked to the electronic records are uh, joined in this consortium. So this is the map of Emerge 2. There's been a few changes to the uh, organizations involved, uh, but most of the uh, players that are mentioned uh, on that map are still involved. This is from the uh, Emerge website, and it reminds me to talk about the work that they've done in phenotyping. Uh, so you can see there that they, um, the claim is that 38 uh, electronic phenotypes have been developed and tested within the eMERGE cohort. And so uh, the um, strategy is in phase three to develop more. Uh, when we proposed in our application to, uh, to develop a phenotype around FH, we found out that we were uh, not alone, uh, that there were two other uh, organizations that had uh, suggested that. One was the Mayo Clinic, uh, and one was Cincinnati Children's. So, uh, so you're on everybody's list when it comes to this sort of strategy of using the electronic medical record as a way to uh, detect cases and to develop algorithms to do that and then test them. So this is uh, from from phase two of the uh, network, it lists the uh, institutions that are involved, the repositories uh, that were brought to the network, um, the genome-wide association studies size uh, in the biobanks, the uh, e EHR, EMR description, so you can see not everybody's epic. Uh, there includes uh, Cerner and, uh, and some homegrown uh, EHRs as well. And then uh, in the last column there, you see that those are the proposed phenotypes in phase two, many of which have been uh, developed and uh, tested and published about. So as I mentioned, uh, Mayo, uh, our team, and Cincinnati Children's all proposed um, developing protocols around FH in phase three. And the way phase three is playing out is that the uh, consortium is developing a list of approximately 100 genes. So rather than doing whole genome sequencing in a merge um, or whole exome sequencing, there's going to be a uh, sequencing capture technology developed that'll look at 100 genes. Uh, and all the sites will uh, bring samples to the sequencing centers who will do this 100 gene list on all participants uh, that are uh, entered from the different sites. Uh, as you can see there, uh, LDLR, APOB, and PCSK9 are on the uh, 100 gene list. So our current strategy, 
uh, and this comes out of uh, discussions with Josh uh, and Iftikhar, uh, is to build upon the uh, Stanford EHR phenotyping work that's already been undertaken. Uh, we had a call about a month ago where we uh, all agreed that it would be uh, foolish not to build upon that work as we develop a new algorithm uh, and, or it'd be foolish to develop a completely new algorithm to, uh, to do this same kind of strategy. Uh, we'll we'll uh, build a new algorithm, test it at Mayo, uh, confirm it at Geisinger, and then give it to the other sites within Emerge uh, to validate. Uh, and so the process will probably play out over the next uh, 24 to 36 months. And uh, ultimately, all the eMERGE sites will have um, patients from their centers who are uh, sequenced for these three genes and that there's uh, eMERGE data around. So I think you'll be seeing a number of uh, papers related to FH coming out of these efforts uh, from a number of different groups over the next few years. So I want to turn now to our, uh, our Genome First uh, project. Uh, and I think it informs some of the uh, some of the work that we'll be doing within Emerge also. So the the notion of Genome First is that through this collaboration, where our biobank patients are having their whole exomes done, we now have a, a large cohort of patients that are still active within the healthcare system um, that uh, receive either their primary or their specialty care at Geisinger and have entered into this biobank. And so we'll be looking through their exome data, finding uh, pathogenic variants uh, in the three genes uh, of FH, and then delivering that result back to the patients and their primary care providers. So rather than there being a prompt uh, for a patient seeking care, the prompt for care in that situation will be this generation of a uh, genetic test result for the patient and the provider. And this is taking place at our, um, our facility in Forty Fort, Pennsylvania, um, which is near Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, which is in Northeast Pennsylvania, which is near New York City. <laughs> uh, we've named it the Precision Health Center. As many of you know who do genomics and personalized medicine, everything's being renamed Precision these days. Uh, we're renaming my son Precision in hopes of getting him into... <laughs> a good college and having somebody else pay for it. Um, so the genome first return of results, we're going to get 250,000 um, Geisinger patients. Their whole exomes will be done uh, through the collaboration with Regeneron. We'll look for medically actionable data within that data set. We'll return the uh, results to the patients and their providers. And then um, we'll support the patients and providers as they manage the follow-up. Uh, for those patients. And we've spent a long time setting this up and trying to get buy-in across the system because I'm constantly asked who else is doing this and how they've been doing with it. And the answer is nobody's really doing it quite like this or on this scale. So uh, we're um, honored to be uh, the first ones to do it, but it's, it's also quite uh, daunting. So 250,000 participants is the goal. We currently have over 80,000 enrolled in the biobank, and over 50,000 have uh, had their exomes done already. The number of QCED cases there, as you can see, is almost 43,000, and that's what the data uh, is around that I'll mention in the next few slides. So what kind of results uh, other than FH are being returned? We have uh, what we call the Geisinger 76, so we're looking at 76 genes. It's built upon the American College of Medical Genetics list of 56 genes. Um, they're all well-studied monogenic conditions. They're all believed to be highly penetrant uh, and medically actionable. So, um, so to meet that list, you have to have uh, something uh, like FH that could be uh, managed, not something like Alzheimer's disease, in which case we might say there's not a whole lot that we can do specifically uh, if you found out that you were at genetic risk for that. There's no uh, carrier status, there's no pharmacogenomics, there's no GWAS uh, data. So um, this is our uh, uh, more information about our list. 27 conditions driven off of 76 genes. Many of them are cancer predispositions, such as uh, BRCA1 and 2, which uh, 
most people have heard of, and uh, cardiovascular predisposition, including cardiomyopathies and FH. And then we have a couple of um, miscellaneous conditions that also made the list. We've had uh, two symposia. Uh, we're planning on having one every six months or so. The first one was on FH. We had the privilege of, uh, of having uh, several members of, uh, of this audience be part of that, uh, and I think it really helped us to, uh, to realize how important this is and, uh, and how we should be focusing uh, our energy in really taking advantage of this uh, opportunity to build a model program. So uh, in our re return of results, these are the top three conditions. Uh, they're all on the public health list of uh, conditions that should be uh, uh, diagnosed and managed. Uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, as you can see, is at the top of the list. And I have there the number of 1 in 175. Um, so uh, there seems to be a competitive edge around here uh, amongst people. <laughs> We're, we're coming in higher than everybody so far. Um, so just a little bit of data here. So if you take our entire EHR data set and you look at uh, LDL cutoffs, uh, as you can see there, uh, amongst those in the EHR that have a uh, lipid profile, 24% are, are above the 155 threshold, 6% above 190, and uh, 0.2% over 250. And then within the sequenced data set, um, you can see there that the numbers um, or the percentages are very similar. Um, there was a slight miscalculation in developing this slide, and so the, uh, the, uh, the numbers in all three of these categories are enriched and uh, slightly higher than what I showed there. But it gives you a sense that we are representative of the greater uh, Geisinger population. And here's what we have as uh, preliminary data. Uh, this is relatively recent, and um, I'm grateful to, uh, to my collaborators to be able to show this today. Uh, and this was developed with Rick Dewey uh, and his team at Regeneron. So what we did here is we took the 43,000 whole exome sequences that we had, uh, and we went through and looked for pathogenic uh, or likely pathogenic variants uh, within the three FH genes. And so uh, if you're not around genomics, uh, clinical genomics in particular, you may not have heard of Patho known and likely pathogenics as categories. So, uh, so as we look through variants, and I know Nate uh, handled a lot of questions there about variants and how we interpret them. Um, clinically, variants are being thrown into one of five buckets. Uh, variants of unknown significance is in the middle. Benign and likely benign uh, are self-explanatory. And then uh, variants are also being categorized as known pathogenic or likely pathogenic based on a number of criteria that's been developed by the American College of Medical Genetics. And so as we developed this list in those four genes, we looked at those with predicted truncating mutations of LDLR, which would fall into the category of likely pathogenic. Um, so many of them had not been uh, reported previously in the literature or in the databases. And then the other pull on the data that we used were those individuals with mutations in one of the three genes that were cataloged as pathogenic in ClinVar, which is the um, NCBI's uh, database for uh, variants across all genes uh, that is uh, very highly curated and uh, meets many of the uh, most up-to-date criteria for uh, classifying variants. And so as you can see, we uh, ended up with 147 uh, individuals with LDLR uh, variants, and that was distributed over 30 different variants. Uh, 96 individuals with ApoB distributed over just three variants, and then two PCSK9 uh, variants that uh, were um, in four individuals. What's been really fascinating to us is we've recruited the patients into this biobank broadly across our healthcare system. And uh, it mostly takes place by consenters being in uh, physicians and other providers' offices and going up to people while they're waiting to be seen and asking them if they want to join a biobank. 
So there hasn't been any targeted f familial uh, recruitment at this point in time. Yet as we start to get this data back, uh, and this is um, through a program uh, from Jeff Staples, one of our collaborators, we can align uh, the individual uh, sequences into predicted pedigrees based on the amount of relatedness. So you can see here that the two people with the Purina uh, symbol uh, there, the red ones, and the two open circles are four individuals who entered this biobank, were not recruited together, and are uh, related to each other. So the, the younger individual down there at the bottom um, appears to have uh, a second-degree relative on one side, uh, who is an older female and a presumed aunt, and on the other side, uh, a uh, presumed uncle and a presumed aunt. And you can see that in these four individuals, uh, the LDL plays out uh, according to what uh, you might predict as well as some of the family history. Now, as part of our um, engagement of these individuals, we will bring these four or invite these four into the clinic, we'll evaluate them, We'll get family history, we'll invite their uh, family members in, and we think that this will become a very rich pedigree over the next 12 to 18 months. So of the, um, of the variants that we've, uh, we've listed, and this is similar to the uh, slide I showed a couple ago, uh, we are now uh, looking at, and this is a, a, uh, a very conservative call of one in 174 individuals within uh, this this biobank. And the reason why I say it's conservative is because we have not analyzed novel mutations in any of these three genes. We think that additional uh, pathogenic mutations or likely pathogenic mutations will be found through that methodology. So we think the number uh, will go up. What's interesting, uh, when we went back and we said, okay, in these 175, uh, excuse me, um, getting my numbers mixed up. And these almost 250 individuals, what's their EHR data say? And uh, what was interesting was I got this back uh, when we looked at the data. So 24 uh, out of the data set were probable by the Dutch uh, Lipid uh, Clinical Network criteria, and the rest were definite. Uh, so those of you that know these criteria um, know that you get eight points and you're probable just based on a DNA variant. So that means that 24 of these individuals have nothing else in their EHR data that support this diagnosis. And uh, so that's very interesting. Some of those will be individuals who might have come to Geisinger just for specialty care. They might have come and had a neurology consultation or something like that. Uh, but there are other individuals, and as we dig in deeper over the uh, next few months, uh, we'll have more granularity to this data. But there are other individuals who simply uh, don't have anything in the EHR related to, uh, uh, to FH, though they're getting all their care there. And so I think the lesson that this seems to be uh, telling us is that EHR data uh, is probably going to have a pretty good positive predictive value but not so good negative predictive value. And we hope over the next uh, 12 to 18 months to have a lot more information around that. Uh, looking still at that 250, when you break it down, uh, according to the criteria, and uh, group five in the criteria are the genetic results. So everybody in our 250 was group five positive. But when you look at those that had only group five, uh, 24 out of the 250, as I mentioned, almost 10% had nothing else in their EHR record. Um, about two-thirds had um, LDL evidence in their EHR uh, consistent with FH. Uh, and then, as you can see there, uh, the others were positive based on other factors. Now, uh, you could talk all day about uh, whether you can get some of this data out of, a, out of an EHR or not, and our data folks are uh, are really fabulous, and if it's there, I think they've found it. So, uh, so things like physical exam findings and family history, which typically are not very good in EHRs, uh, are decent in the uh, Geisinger record, and uh, and our team really dug around for it. Uh, another interesting thing that we found when looking at these uh, variants and looking at those 24 individuals who appear non-penetrant, so they have 
only the gene variant and nothing else going for it. We found that those uh, that were non-penetrant had 10 out of the 35 variants that were discovered, and the other 25 of 35 were fully penetrant within the uh, EHR in this very preliminary analysis. And what's interesting, uh, you can think of all different reasons why those um, 10 might not be penetrant in different individuals. But in, uh, in the ones that are highlighted there, uh, those are individuals where um, you know, some are penetrant and some aren't. And we're hopeful that as we get more data and we build these pedigrees and we engage these patients, that some of these might be opportunities to find those modifier genes. So when five out of 11 um, with a specific variant are, penet are not penetrant and six out of the 11 are, we're hoping that those will, those will fall out into Mendelian patterns that we might be able to dissect and get some, uh, some better data. Uh, this slide uh, demonstrates that when you look at the relationship between the LDL levels and whether people had a pathogenic variant, as you might guess, the lower your LDL, the less likely you are to have a pathogenic variant. But even in those, if you look uh, down at the last line there, even at those with uh, greater than 250 LDL cutoff, uh, only about one in five had a pathogenic variant. So uh, I'm not telling this group anything new to say that there's more genes out there or there's more explanations than what we currently know by these uh, th three genes. And uh, so uh, the overall work that we're doing, uh, one of uh, my mantras at uh, Geisinger is that your DNA is not your diagnosis, consistent with uh, some of the things the other speakers have said. Um, we think that's going to be true in all the conditions, and FH won't be alone. Um, I don't want you to look at this in any detail, but we're excited and would love to have collaborators as we think about we're going to be identifying for the first time um, several hundred FH patients uh, and family members, and we're hoping to develop a uh, protocol for getting, getting to goal quickly. And uh, we won't go into any of those details. But those are the three complementary uh, case finding strategies that we're hoping to employ. We're hoping that within a few years we'll be able to give people some granularity about the uh, sensitivity and specificity of each and uh, which might be both best implied in different scenarios. So thank you for your time. These are uh, some of our Geisinger team, some of our Regeneron team, and uh, like everything, we don't do this alone. Thank you. Uh, sorry, are you including any children in this, or what are you doing about the children of the people that you identify? So as, as we do our cascade screening, of course, we'll be bringing in as many children as we can into that uh, screening. Uh, the biobank does enroll children, uh, but so far none have gone to whole exome sequencing, so they're a small minority, but we're going to be boosting that up over the months ahead. So, so we will be doing screening of children through the biobank, we will be doing it through the cascade strategy, and there are separate efforts within uh, Geisinger to uh, start to implement the pediatric guidelines that are being ignored uh, so readily throughout clinical care. Sam? Yeah, actually, I had a different question. Um, <laughs> the Because uh, I know you have an Amish population, and there's an ApoB founder defect within the Amish, and I wonder, and since it is ApoB, and you only have three defects, and there's 96, do you think you have a hidden founder population within your catchment area? So we actually don't have a whole lot of the Amish. We're a little bit north of the, the big Amish communities. Uh, but Alan Schuldner, uh, who's one of our colleagues uh, at Regeneron now, um, has, uh, has been thinking about that same, same question. And uh, I don't have an answer yet, but, but we're thinking about that. Thank you for a fantastic talk. This is very fascinating and very impressive that you have organized this. Uh, Thinking of the future, of course, what would be fantastic when you have your 250,000 people with whole exome sequencing uh, to look at uh, hard endpoints, various diseases and things. And, and so my question is sort of like uh, exploratively, how good are you at keeping all the patients within the Geising? I mean, what you have lost to follow up and how will you deal with that and, and how good are you at finding the cases actually? So... Um 
there's very little out migration from, from the Geisinger catchment area, which is, uh, which is one of the really attractive features of, of the area. And Geisinger is the largest provider of health care in the area, but not the only one. So um, we expect that we'll be pretty good at uh, keeping patients in the health care system and tracking them to hard endpoints, but, uh, but we don't have uh, a whole lot of information about about that or a concrete plan of how we're going to do that. John, last question. How, how many of your patients would have been uh, suspected or, or possible or, or probable definite FH by the Dutch Lipid Clinic criteria without the genetic diagnosis? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't done that yet, but, uh, but the, uh, the data folks are pulling that from the, uh, from the available EHR data. Um, and as we bring these indiv individuals in, so, so we've only given back one result so far to, of the 247. Uh, but as we bring these in, we'll be, we'll be seeing how many fit criteria pre and, um, and post that encounter. And we'll be very interested to have those details. Mm -hmm. Good point. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Wow, just great, great, great data. This has been great. So uh, our, our last uh, presentation before we have a bit of a panel discussion is going to be a presentation of the Find FH program. You've been hearing about it, and uh, this is the presentation where you're going to learn more about it. It's going to be a tag team of uh, Nigam Shah and Kelly Myers. Uh, Nigam's an assistant professor of medicine at Stanford and assistant director of the Stanford Center for Biomedical Research. And Kelly Myers is a, um, a founder and CEO of uh, Atomo and uh, the chief technology advisor for the FH Foundation. So I think Kelly's going to lead off in a bit of a tag team. So Kelly? <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Um, Find FH is a, uh, an initiative of the FH Foundation that was launched in January this year. It had a very ambitious goal: is how do we use available healthcare encounter data sets uh, to use machine learning technologies, computer uh, algorithms, if you will, to predict the probability that an individual within those data sets has FH, and then once a high probable FH individual is identified, then um, talk to those uh, patients' physicians about getting that patient screened and uh, possibly diagnosed. It's one, one project with three major components. The two major data sets that we're looking at is lab and claims data. I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, and EHR algorithms that Nigam will be talking to you about as well. And then finally, the output of those two algorithms are going to identify these probable FH individuals and that involves engagement by the FH Foundation to reach out to those providers and their organizations. Uh, as I mentioned, Nigam's going to talk to you first about the EHR algorithms. I'll follow up with lab and claims and the HCP and individual engagement. Certainly want to acknowledge our initial founding sponsor, Amgen, and our sponsors, Sanofi Regeneron, and want to especially recognize Josh for his receipt, uh, a, a recipient of the National Innovator Award for American Heart on behalf of Find FH. Nigam? Thank you. Okay, so I actually know where Geisinger is because I trained in State College, Pennsylvania, and you probably have no idea where State College, Pennsylvania is. <laughs> okay, so, right, so I'm going to try to talk to you about how to use machine learning to identify uh, patients at risk. And I'm going to use very little text and mostly pictures, so to, let's see if I can uh, uh, pull that off. So you've heard, electron, you've heard phenotyping, and what we're talking about is electronic phenotyping. And what that means is we're going to look at some electronically captured data about an individual and then try to figure out what phenotype they have. And there's a spectrum of things you can do, so that's that, uh, that arrow over there. You can do simple things. Um, these are old slides. Yep, these are old slides. No, I already gave them.
so I, I reduced things a little bit and uh, I need to have certain things there, so just uh, bear 10 seconds and we'll have the new one up. So while that's coming up, you can think of various approaches for electronic phenotyping. The simplest could be you come up with a heuristic and say, I will believe somebody has diabetes if I see the word diabetes. And that's a pretty crude way of doing it, but it is possible to do it at that level. So that would be something called keyword labeling. And beyond that is something a little bit more uh, suitable where you come up with consensus definitions. So continuing the diabetes example, you could say, I will believe somebody is a diabetic if I see the word diabetes twice, I see a metformin prescription, and I see an abnormal glucose level. And that's the classic way of phenoty electronic phenotyping as it is done, uh, even in the eMERGE network, and they have a database, a, a repository called FeeKB for phenotype knowledge base, where you can go and download these consensus definitions, sometimes also called clinical algorithms. Getting a little bit fancier, you can have things like classifiers. And most of you would be familiar with Gmail, and so you've been exposed to classifiers, and that's the thing that prevents spam from getting into your inbox. And the way these things are trained is you show an example of 100 true examples, real spam emails, and 500 or 100 non-spam emails, and you learn what features, what characteristics, the sender, the subject line, the time of the day, the total word count, the language, you know, 500 such characteristics based on which Conceptually, you can think of it as a point system that you're just adding things up and say, if I see this, 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 then the email is spam. But you don't sit and write it out. You let the machine learn it from the data. And then there's fancier stuff uh, in the phenotyping universe that I'm not gonna talk about today. So keyword labeling, the gist of it is you would have uh, a list of words that you pick and choose and the reason I'm harping on that is that you can go from keyword labeling to classifiers by a machine learning trick, which we'll get into. So that's why I need you to see the slide. Okay. So then, if you're doing phenotyping, you have the patient's medical record, and all of the stuff that you see with the hashes and the dots, that's coded data. The other is the unstructured clinical documents. And if I ask clinicians, you know, what fraction of the data is unstructured, I would get numbers ranging from 50% to 95%, depending on what uh, EHR system and uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, group they're practicing in. So you have some longitudinal data, and then at some point, event X happens, that's the red arrow. If you are doing whatever you're doing, the electronic phenotyping, after that event, it's classification. And so that's why I call these things classifiers for phenotyping. In, uh, in rough speaking, we tend to call them predictions, but FH is present at birth. You're not really predicting anything. True prediction happens before the event. So if I predict tomorrow's temperature, then uh, it's prediction. If I look up yesterday's temperature and say it was a hot day, it's classification. Okay, so then in order to do either of these tasks, you have to talk about, you have to pay attention to two things, and those are the source of the data or the features that you're going to use and the choice of the features. So in that email example, you know, the subject line, the header, the IP address, the time of the day, stuff like that. And so in the case of the medical record, you really have to think about what are you going to use as features. So for example, if you have uh, this blue document, which is an unstructured medical record, you can process that, find terms, group them into concepts, which means diabetes, diabetes not otherwise specified, will all get grouped into one thing. You'll have ICD-9 codes, you'll have laboratory tests, you'll have prescriptions. Now, for laboratory tests, for example, you can say, I'm going to use the value of the result, or you can do something fancier and say, I don't want the value, I just need to know that amongst all the tests that someone had, what fraction of those tests were glucose related? And that fraction is what I'm showing over here. And if that fraction, if you had 20 tests and nine of them had something to do with glucose and then every, the rest was other stuff, then you probably have diabetes, because otherwise why would you be measuring glucose that often? So that's the intuition. In, in practice, this feature engineering task is more complicated than that, but at least that gives you an intuition. Even for the codes, the ICD-9 codes, we can count how many times a given code appears 
divided by the total number of codes you have because sicker people who have more codes by chance have the probability of getting uh, an ICD-9 code attached to the record. And the second thing you need to think about is the source. So we're focused on the EHR, we're focused on the claims, but that is not the, the total universe of data. So what I have up there is a slide from uh, Griffin V, but at Harvard, where if you look at every kind of information you want, medications, demographics, encounters, you can go get it from multiple places. And that's sort of the main take home. And one of those multiple places could be asking that individual. And having a registry kind of allows you to do that. And the EHR, that's the stuff in the, in the blue over here. It gives you some structured data. It also gives you some unstructured data. And then how you deal with it dis determines uh, how far you get with your uh, machine learning. Okay, so just to give an example of the kinds of data we see. So the blue is the LDL cholesterol levels. Red will be, or red dot is a visit, and then a gray dot is any time the patient comes. And this is data from a, a randomly selected patient. You see all of those gray dots. Somebody's been measuring cholesterol at you know, certain points in time, at age 40, 45, 50. At some point, it's decided they should be treated. You start seeing statins, that's the, the red dots, and then LDL goes down. Okay. When you see this, you feel good about it, but real data looks like this, unfortunately. You'll have visits and then random measurements, uh, sometimes miscoded. There are statins mentioned, but your cholesterol is still going up. You know what's going on? It was low before you had the statin. I mean, <laughs> stuff like this. That's real life. Uh, if your data doesn't have pregnant men, then it's not real data. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the tests we do, you, you, because it'll be babies miscoded uh, and their data attached to their mothers, and that tells you it's real data. There's even data after death. Uh, it's actually autopsy <laughs> reports, but they do come after death. Okay, so in order to build a classifier, uh, because FH is a rare condition, and very few people write out the whole thing, familial hyperlipidemia the whole, in the text, instead of trying to get it from a text perspective, uh, from just these keyword labels, we relied on Josh, and uh, we got 71 cases that he has seen and knows are true cases. And then the second big challenge is what are we gonna compare these people's records with? So I can compare that with the record of a random person walking into, into the door at Stanford and then it'll be really trivial to train a classifier because most of them are not gonna have FH. And so we said the real task is to figure out who has high cholesterol that is the garden variety versus the FH variety. So we chose to find people who have a mention of hypercholesterolemia in their record and use that as the control set against we make the dis discrimination of the uh, people with FH. And so from this, we're gonna sample 57 cases and about 300 controls to match the expected prevalence. And then we leave aside 14 cases and a few controls. The stuff that you see in the greenish yellow, that's the training set in machine learning uh, lingo, and the blue is the validation set or the test set. On the training set, we go find the words that are mentioned, the ICD-9 codes, the CPT codes, the drugs, and, and the laboratory test results. We create features out of them. That's the normalization part. We then train a classifier looking at these 57 positives and the uh, 300 uh, controls randomly selected. We do that 10 times. And each time, the, the 300 controls are different just to train this classifier to, for, against a different set of, uh, uh, of people who have high cholesterol. And so we then keep the most consistently informative features. And then just remember this part. So there is a model where we've done this 10 loops and we've selected features by this, by this uh, heuristic process. And then we also have a model where we don't do any of this and we just say, we're just gonna train and that's it. Okay, and then we evaluate model performance based on these 14 held out cases. So how do we do? This is a receiver operator curve. And on the x-axis, we have the one minus specificity. So you can think of it as your uh, 
uh, how often do you get things wrong? So if you're, if specificity is one and one minus one will be zero, so you'll be somewhere over here. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have sensitivity, which is recall. And the best place to be is over here, that you find everybody and you don't have any false positives, or you don't have any um, wrong ascertainments, not necessarily false positives. So the red is the default model, which is where we've done the feature selection. And then the light blue is we don't bother with the feature selection. And from these curves, they look about the same. And the dark blue is just running plain logistic regression. And that's sort of the usual baseline people use. Now this is where the problems begin. So we have this model. Looks good. The area under the curve is pretty high. It's like 0.86 or something. And you pick the best point and you apply this model. Well, we've already applied this model many times over the training. So we're just keeping track of how good did we do. And then we finally do the validation set. So across all the 71 patients, including the 14 validation ones, based on which this, these curves are made, but across all of the runs, this red curve, if you pick the best threshold, you're going to get 43 true positives correctly identified, and you're going to miss 28 people. And then from the controls, 3,000, because we're doing 10 runs, so each time we have a different control set, overall we're going to have 138 unique false positive individuals. And that's with the red model. Now from here, the red and the blue, the light blue look about the same, but this is how the light blue one works. It has, finds 36 people, it misses a few, so the, the missed ones are instead of 28, it's 35, so seven more misses, but a lot less false positives. So that's the hard part. When you're, looking, when you're doing machine learning based classification on things that are quote unquote rare, and you might argue where the boundary is, but you're looking for a needle in a haystack, seemingly good models from classical evaluation perspectives, from sensitivity specificity trade-offs, perform very differently. So what you need to look at is something called the precision recall curve. And there what you're looking at is the positive predictive value against the sensitivity. And as you can see, the model without any feature selection, without any fancy things involved, actually performs a lot better because it, can, it is consistently better performing than the red model. And so in these situations, the traditional evaluation of discrimination accu accuracy, how well can you tell a case apart from a control, is actually not that meaningful. What you really want is a precision recall curve. What this boils down to is that you're basically having 38 more false positives for finding seven more true positives. So it's a five to one ratio. For every one correctly identified case, you'll get five false positives. Now, is that a trade-off that's acceptable? That's the question to ask. And where you apply the model dictates what that trade-off will be. If I apply this to everybody that walks into the door at Stanford, that ratio will be 10 to one. The cardiovascular clinics, and if I apply it to just to Josh's practice, it will be one-to-one. -one. Okay. So going back to phenotyping, we have really small sample sizes. There's 71 cases, now about 101 at Stanford. And I want to train this thing, class, this, this red arrow. And the best thing that can help me is more data. So what do we do? The nice thing is that there is this trick you can use for machine learning that allows you to go from keyword labeling to classifiers. So now my classifier, the first one that I built, is kind of messy. It's about as good as a keyword labeler because it's making a mistake about 20% of the time. If I, knew, if I knew the mistake rate, then I can figure out how many samples I need according to this formula to figure out how many cases badly labeled will let me learn a good model. And that's what this scales, uh, this scales with. So if I have 20% error, I, I need 2.7 times the samples I would need if I had really clean label data. So that's a nice property because now, as Kelly was talking about, we're doing stuff on the EHR side, and I've showed you that classifier from 71 true positives 
We're going to validate the classifier. But once we're done with that, we can apply that classifier to create a much larger training set, more than 71, more than 100 patients. And at that point, jump over and then flag these patients' claim data, because we already have the claim data for these individuals. And that creates a much larger training set, which would give you a better model to then apply on a national level. And Kelly can talk about the strategy for doing that. So when I first started talking to this group about, um, if you can get the second part of my slides up, uh, when I start, first started talking to this group about using claims data, I'm sorry. Uh, when I first started talking to this group about using claims data, there were a lot of clinicians in the audience, and, and, and I realized fully that claims is the bane of your existence, right? And, and so there's not much perceived value uh, to claims data. Um, but I, I'm here to argue that if you know where to look and how to look, um, there's a significant amount of, amount of value that can be gleaned out of them. Are we close? Okay, so, uh, so let me give you an analogy here on the claims data. Uh, it, 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 most people appear to think that it's outdated technology, kind of like a, an old pile of uh, cell phones. But if you know where and how to look, there's a lot of value to be gleaned. Did you know that in a pretty good pile of old cell phones, you can end up with about 700 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of, of gold? All right, so let's go mining for some gold. So Find FH Lab and Claims Algorithm has, has been designed to identify uh, these true positives, um, and, and there's some challenges with that. One is, uh, as, as we've heard several times today, FH is heterogeneous, uh, it's very diverse, uh, there's, F, there's not an FH diagnosis code available, so how do we build an algorithm with those kind of considerations, and how do you structure it so that it can, it can work successfully in a claims data set? Um, Nigam is giving you a good overview of what machine learning is. Let me give you a, a more conceptual uh, view that makes sense to me. Um, just imagine a model that only had two features, and let's assume that it's two lab results. Uh, if, and, and you show it examples, as Nigam was talking about, of true positives, the triangles, people with FH, and the true negatives, people that don't have FH. The algorithm would say, you know, I think anybody above the line has FH, anybody below the line does not have FH. Um, and then when you show the algorithm a new piece of data, it says, okay, that person's above the line, so I think they have FH. Well, that's a model based off two variables. Our model that we developed has over 350 var variables in n dimensions, if you will. So it's a very robust model that looks at um, hundreds of data with, with, within the data set. Uh, the next is, what data do we use? Um, the FH Foundation has pulled together one of the most unique data sets I've ever been around, and I've been doing this for about 20 years. It's healthcare claims data on 89 million Americans. Um, it's roughly, at, at best guess, it's about two-thirds of their available data. And, and why 89 million? These are individuals that have any diagnosis for any cardiovascular disease uh, from one of over 300 or so different diagnosis codes, a similar number of procedure codes for various cardiovascular procedures, uh, and, uh, and or medication codes for lipid-lowering medications. Once we brought that, once a patient was identified by one of those codes, we brought in all of their corresponding uh, claims data. So if they went to the emergency room for the flu, uh, that data is in the data set as well. Um, and, and on top of that, we were able, we were able to add uh, lab result data on a sizable fraction of those folks. So three years of data, uh, it's over a terabyte, and it's the, it's the largest single data database that I know of to do this kind of a study in cardiovascular disease. So in order to build this model for this size of data, we actually built several models. Uh, so we would build a model on, that works on lab results only. Uh, we also built a model that works on diagnosis codes, a different model that works on procedure codes, and a different model that works on prescription medications. So 
Each one of those things operate independently, and each one of those came up with a probability of FH for each of those 89 million folks uh, within, within the database, if you will. And then we took the output of those models, and that fed an ensemble model. So those, beca those outputs became inputs uh, to the ensemble model, and the ensemble model would make a, a final prediction, if you will, of, of, of FH for each individual that it's exposed to. Uh, so what were the variables that were most predictive? And, and what you're looking at here is 38 of the over, over than 350 different variables in the data set. Um, as you can see, the top few are in blue or in lab results. The green are patient demographics type information like age and gender. The reds are all the various medications, and the purples on the bottom right are primarily diagnosis codes or procedure codes. So if, if you scan those codes, there's no big surprises there probably. But remember, this is just the top 10% of over 350 uh, different variables. So how did the model do? So uh, as Nigam was talking about, precision and recall are the metrics that you really need to look at uh, when you're looking at this kind of uh, 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 modeling process of looking at something that has a, a, a prevalence of 1 in 250. Um, and, the, and the way to compare the precision and recall, because there are always a trade-off, is to look at the F1 score, and I'll show you a, a graphical representation of that as well. But think of the F1 score as a harmonic mean, if you will, or a fancy mean uh, as a comparison between the precision and recall. Um, and, and another way to state the results of this is that we should be able to identify about 73% of the undiagnosed FH patients out there with a false positive rate of around 9.9% or 9.92%. You know, and those numbers can be adjusted. If, if we think that clinicians will tolerate a little higher false positive, we can dial that up and, the, and then the sensitivity or recall of the model go, will go up as well. Um, the, it, we also have had the benefit of working with a couple of data sets here. Uh, one uh, that Nigam described for you, uh, and then one that uh, Dan was able to secure for us from the University of Pennsylvania. And so we did modeling on each data set independently, and then we built a combined model. And, and good things happened all around. Uh, each model independently had good statistics. And then uh, most importantly is the two models together combined uh, were more robust and, and had excellent results as well. And we've started applying this to the, to the terabyte of claims data that we have, and, and early indications are that we, we're expecting a prevalence somewhere around uh, 1.2 million total patients in that data. All right, so, uh, so this is the precision recall curve or the Mike Sun recall curve. Um, and and what, the way you read the precision recall curve here is the further across you go closer to one on the uh, precision side, uh, those are predictions that you have high accuracy or a high faith in, if you will. And you can see where the curve starts to drop off over to the right around 0.73 or 5. Um, that's, that's where the F1 score comes in. So the F1 score basically looks, how long do you hold good precision um, before the, the uh, or how long do you hold re good recall before the, the precision starts to fall off? So that's a very good sign. Um, also, as I showed you when we started, we have more data on prescription information than we do claims than we do labs. So we actually have to build several models to operate on each of those various data sets. And each of those models will have varying degrees of performance, uh, but at the end of the day, what we're going to end up with is a model that should be able to identify about 678,000 uh, probable FH individuals within that overall data set with a, a reasonably high uh, uh, F1 score or, or predictability, if you will. Um, an, another way to look at that is, you know, what degree of false positive rate would a clinician be comfortable with? And uh, if, you, if you think a false positive rate of uh, around a third uh, would be successful, um, then you, you should be able to identify somewhere around 800,000. So you can see that it, you can slide the uh, identification up or down based on the uh, degree of false positive rate that you're willing to accept. So now how are we going to put this data to work? So we're, we're applying this data to the data set now, and uh, inside a couple of weeks, we're going to have a national heat map with each of those 89 million Americans scored between 0 and 1 of the probability of FH. They're de-identified to us. It's HIPAA-compliant data, but their clinicians are identified to us. So we'll have the ability to aggregate those de-identified high-probability FH patients up to the physician level and also the, up to their institution level. 
And so um, in this process, we've been talking to clinicians about how they would like to be approached with this data, uh, with the, uh, the possibility of uh, there being probable FH patients within, uh, within their practice. And the number one thing they told us is they wanted peer-to-peer -peer communications. They wanted to hear somebody that they knew. They wanted to hear from somebody they knew um, to uh, reach out to them on behalf of, of this information to encourage them to screen and possibly diagnose. So most of our engagement strategies are, are engineered around that, whether we're approaching an integrated delivery system, and, and as uh, Mike mentioned, we're going to be working closely with Geisinger, not only to develop, validate the model, but to test some of our engagement on initiatives, or we're working with individual healthcare providers. So this seems daunting, right? You know, several hundred thousand uh, patients, you know, at least tens of thousands of physicians, how, how are we going to take this on in any kind of scale? So. Um, you know, let me, let me take you to an application here that I think we can learn from. Um, uh, have anybody ever heard of the 10 Red Balloon Challenge? Uh, in, in 2009, DARPA uh, launched a contest where they said, um, okay, we're going to hide uh, 10 balloons somewhere in the United States. And, and, and the only thing we're going to tell you about them is they're going to be within sight of a road. That's the, only, that's the only information that they were told. Teams were only given 30 days to prepare, and the balloons were only going to remain up for 30 days. Okay? And at the, end of the, at the end of the day, whoever found the 10 balloons first okay, would win. All right? So uh, this is 10 needles in an extremely large haystack, uh, a, few, a few hundred square feet across 3 million square miles. Okay, this is where the balloons were, but obviously nobody knew that going in. So, uh, who won and why do we care? All right, on, on the who won side, it was a team from MIT. All right, big deal, no, no, nobody's big surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you hear a team from MIT won, you probably think, okay, they, they hacked into NASA and, <laughs> and they looked at the satellites and they found the 10 red balloons. No, nope, that, wasn't, that wasn't what they did. Uh, they used a Hollywood game and some cleverness uh, in networks to figure it out. And the Hollywood game they used was the Kevin Bacon game. Does anybody know the Kevin Bacon game? So it, for those of you who don't, uh, virtually every actor in Hollywood can be linked to Kevin Bacon within three moves by who they've collaborated with on various movies, right? And everybody thinks, if you think about all the actors in the history of, of movies, you would think that'd be 10 or 20 degrees of separation. It's actually less than three for Kevin Bacon. And it's, uh, it's least for Rod Steiger. For some reason, it's 1.8 for Rod Steiger. Um, but it's who do you know, okay? And do I know something? And if I don't know somebody, do I know somebody who knows something, all right? And so that's, that's how the winning team won. And I mentioned to you the balloons were going to be up for 30 days. How long did it take the winning team to find the 10 red balloons? It took nine hours. <laughs> took nine hours, okay? And they operated under, pretty, as I mentioned, pretty simple premise. The team said, do I see a red balloon? I see a red balloon. Okay, that's one. All right? So I see a red balloon, but I don't see any more red balloons. Do I know anybody that sees a red balloon? Do I know anybody that sees a red balloon? Oh! <laughs> All right? So they developed a contest-based approach to, to find those 10 red balloons, and they found them in 10 hours. Now, now why do we care? All right? Catherine mentioned the other night that it takes 17 years for something to become a standard of care. All right? And I'm not saying we should get it done in nine hours, but what can we learn from this? <laughs> what, what can we learn from this? All right? So how can we use the technology and the relationships that we have to get this done? All right? Well, inside a month, we're going to tell you where all the red balloons are. Okay? We're going to tell you what practices they're in. All right? And, and not only that, there's some other really good news working for us inside those practices. Uh, and it's called the power law. And, and for whatever reason, what you're seeing here are the top 1,000 practices uh, uh, and the number of patients in each of those practices. And, and this particular example here is the number of people that have had a, coron a cardiovascular event um, in, in the last three years that, they're, uh, that their LDL is above 190. Uh, so these are not FH patients, but they're FH-like kind of patients. And there's a practice out there that has over 200 of those patients. 
all right? And even the thousands rank practice has 50 of those. So we don't have to go to tens of thousands of physicians. We have to go to a few hundred to several thousand, all right? Now, the next thing is even more important. That same uh, demographic that I just talked to you about, I looked at, okay, how many of those physicians are connected to other physicians like them, all right? And so what you're looking at here is a physician in Mobile, Alabama. And, and what's significant about this physician? He shares patients with over 1,000 other physicians just like that. They have patients in common. So I'm not saying that he knows those 1,000 physicians, but there probably is some name recognition between those physicians, all right? And those other physicians have dozens or hundreds of patients just like that, all right? So what we're talking about here is how can we leverage this knowledge and the desire that the physicians gave us to be reached out to by a peer. So we're going to start with our scientific advisory board. Okay, and we're going to ask them to reach out to their peers that have high concentrations of um, uh, probable FH patients, and we're going to do so in a, in a communication. And, and so it's not going to take mountains of a movement. It, it takes a small group of dedicated people. And, and I'll close with uh, one of my favorite quotes. It's from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. That was great, Kelly and Nigam. Uh, so we, we started about 20 minutes late, so we're, we're going to uh, go now into our panel discussion. I'd like to invite our um, panelists to come, come up. Um, and um, uh, we're going to have some, some discussion about uh, how to put this information uh, into practice, particularly in the context of large health systems. So just to recap, while our, while our panelists are, uh, are coming up to the front here, <coughs> um, what we've heard in this session is incredibly compelling um, data that, in fact, the prevalence of FH is uh, considerably higher than what the textbooks say. Uh, what we've also heard is... Uh, uh, an approach to finding a lot of those patients uh, in, in a very effective way. And now I think we have the challenge of how are not just individual physicians, but large health systems who ha are faced with the fact that they're going to be presented with lots of patients in their health systems who have FH who are undoubtedly not being appropriately treated. How are they going to put that uh, in, into practice and, and act on that? So um, we're really pleased to have uh, representatives from three of the country's uh, most distinguished large uh, health systems here for this panel discussion. You've already met uh, uh, Mike, <coughs> um, but I want to introduce uh, the other two. Uh, Ron Scott, Ron's a uh, family medicine physician and lipidologist uh, from uh, Kaiser Permanente Southern California, who's been involved in developing uh, guidelines uh, for, uh, for that institution, and, um, including related to cardiovascular disease. And uh, Steve Kopecki, who um, was an interventional cardiologist and saw the light and became a preventive cardiologist <coughs> uh, at the Mayo Clinic uh, and has uh, written and thought a lot about how to put uh, guidelines into practice for preventive cardiology. So we're, we're, we're delighted to have, have you all here. And uh, I asked Kelly to stay up, too, because there may be some questions about uh, find a fate as it applies. So. Um, um, I'd what I'd like to do, uh, uh, Eric and I have so certainly have some questions prepared, but I'd like to really open this up to the audience first and see if we have some questions from the audience uh, related to, to our, our distinguished panel. <coughs> yes. Kat. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Kat Davis Ahmed from the FH, FH Foundation. I wondered, um, especially Mike, but maybe others, uh, if you could share about how you're giving that data back to the patients. So um, the return of results is set up so that um, it, it may be more detailed than you want, but the, the um, Sequencing is being done in a research arena, and to bring that back to patients, you sort of have to do a couple backflips. So we have to confirm the data in a clinical laboratory, a reference laboratory, and then what we do is we return it to the primary care provider on the case first, and then to the patient themselves, so the patient gets the data back personally. Uh, and then they are given all the tools that they need to uh, engage our genomics team or engage cardiologists 
uh, and other experts in the system that are knowledgeable about FH. And so uh, we're hoping that by having enough support built into the system that, uh, that as we give that data back that there'll be appropriate measures taken and family members evaluated. Yes. So um, a lot of people uh, think that since we did the whole exome that we're going to sort of know everything that's in there, but an incredible mountain of data, and we're specifically going through and just picking out variants within our list of 76 genes and then classifying them. And then those that are classified as uh, pathogenic are being confirmed through that second step with the clinical laboratory and given back. There's tons of data that we won't be acting on, at least in the first phase of this. Uh, there's a lot of research going on around it, but, uh, but there, each individual that has their whole exome done is going to have a lot of research data available for future use, but not, not being reviewed specifically at this point in time or given back to anybody. But we're, we're specifically avoiding the, uh, the entanglement of what are being called uh, variants of unknown significance in genomics right now, uh, and those are variants that kind of maybe might uh, be important, but, but they don't meet all the criteria. So this project, uh, just out of the gate, is going to focus on only those things that we're pretty sure of. So I'm going to I'm going to um, uh, ask Ron a question. Ron, um, you've been involved, I think, in, in guideline development for Kaiser Sun California. Could you just maybe summarize for us what currently you have in place in terms of um, uh, identification and appropriate management of patients with uh, with FH? Sure. So um, I'm with Kaiser Permanente, and from those of you from other parts of the world or country that may not be familiar, we have 10 million members, um, 8 million of which are in California, and in Southern California where I work, we have about 4 million members. And we leverage a lot of um, systemic care across that large group of individuals because we've had electronic health records for nine years now. And we have um, historical data in our electronic um, data going back 20 years or more. So we have uh, interactive registries that pull data from the electronic health record every day, every night. We have these electronic registries that interact with the health record, and we use that to achieve high levels of Medicare five-star performance metrics, but we're also using it to pull in people that have had an LDL over 190, let's say, on their last reading. Even, even if that last reading was 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we're pulling them all into a registry. So we have all four statin benefit groups, as outlined by the ACCAHA, and when a provider's at a point of care with a patient, they'll get a flag on this proactive care tab within the electronic health record. It's a window to this electronic registry system. So they can see if it says somebody's post-MI, and they look in their electronic health record and say, I don't see any evidence of an MI, and they ask the patient, they go, oh yeah, when I went to Las Vegas on a trip, I had an MI over there. So it's not in our system, but there was a claims data that pulled it in. So they'll add that to the health record. Um, same thing from LDL190. Sometimes things are old, or they, they were, so we're pulling in this data and we're telling the providers, pay attention to this patient. Their last LDL was over 190. Do a workup. We give them prompts to outline specific uh, lab workup and then encourage them to treat these people with statins. So since we've started this, um, in about 2012, we noticed uh, just losing that as a rough, as a percentage of the total population, about 1% of the population, their last LDL was 190 or higher, looking back over time. And we've reduced that to 0.75%, partly by just flagging the patient when they come in for an ankle sprain or if they come in for other care. And we've also started to do a little bit of outreach at some of the medical centers. There's a lipid pharmacist, for example, at one medical center that started sending letters to these patients and trying to call the patients that are not engaged and try to get them re-engaged and try to get them lab work up and, and treated. So, Ron, are, are there family ties in your registry as well? How do you know the family ties? Family, no. We don't have a good way to link up family members at this point. We haven't figured that out. Well, you should add that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah, at this point, it's just one of the you know uh, ways to grab a, a group of patients that may need action. So, so at this point, that's what we're doing on a systemic level. It, you know, individual doctors hopefully are engaging with patients at a much deeper level and, and identifying when they get the results and treating them and et cetera. But as far as step back, look at the whole four million patients over the last decade, what are we doing? We're pulling in the ones that have had LDL 190 or higher at this point and trying to get them re-engaged. I think we have a question in the back. Just a second, Josh, and yeah. then you. <clears throat> Kent Liffick from PTS Diagnostics. My question <clears throat> excuse me, is primarily for Kelly regarding the reimbursement data. You've done a lot of great modeling. That's very encouraging. But is your model and all of your models uh, built to handle the codes when they change to ICD-10? There are translational tables that will carry us from one to the next. And, and the ICD-10 codes won't even start rolling in really until next year. So, so we can make that transition. That's good, encouraging. One more follow-up question. Um, as we all know, there are many, many organizations that are constantly uh, developing new codes, and those codes don't always get migrated into the scrub engines that all the payers use in a timely manner. I just wondered if you've got any bias built into your models for that, because oh, there's a lot of uh, research that actually shows about five to six percent of all the reimbursement codes are actually not the right code, because those scrub engines have not been updated. Uh, and the anthems of the world actually, you know, admit to that. In, in this particular data set, we've accounted for that because if, if they have a diagnosis code for dyslipidemia, we get every code that patient has, okay? So even if it's a non-common or, you know, one that's not on the books yet, but if it's in the data, we'll capture it. Josh. <clears throat> yeah, great. So I'm going to pose this question t to both Steve and Mike. And, you know, so both of you guys represent kind of places that are world-renowned for focusing on delivery of care, patient satisfaction, delivery of cost-effective care, um, uh, standardization of care across the organization. So can you give us some insights into how you've done that at a systematic level? You know, do you have places to flag FH? Do you have ways to screen families? Um, have you developed ways of getting people to take their statins that some of us might be able to learn from, you know, these kind of insights that might be uh, necessary once we find the 1.2 million, you know, that, that we find. Steve, why don't you go first? Yeah, it's interesting. At Mayo, we've tried to identify uh, people with, with FH tentatively with LDLs greater than 190. We found 980 patients within our county, of which 450 were our employees. And so we started with our employees, <laughs> and that was, that was within the last two years, because in the last two years, all clinicians in this room know practice pace has changed tremendously. It's always been a one-on-one -on -one at Mayo Clinic, and no longer do we have time for necessarily for that. So we tried to shunt them into a nurse-driven clinic where they're then talked to, they get follow-up every three months, they start to get on their medicines. It's almost a courage study-based protocol, which has been shown to be very effective, and hopefully it'll, it'll get those 450 employees down. It was interesting, too, because Mayo would not allow us to approach our employees. They said, no, you cannot talk to them. These are our employees. And we said, wait a minute, These are you're going to pay for their heart attack when it occurs, you're going to pay for their stent, but we can't talk to them in the meantime. They said, well, you've got a point, so go ahead and talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, anything you want to add? No, I would just say that I, I'm not aware of, uh, of anything that's been implemented in our system to flag these patients, like Ron talked about. Uh, in the uh, Kaiser network, so we're, we're behind on that. The comment I was going to make in response to Ron, but maybe it's, it's the issue of flag fatigue and uh, alert fatigue in general. Uh, Rob Wachter from UCSF was recently at our place and you know give, talks very elegantly about that issue. And I just could you speak to that? It sounds like your your approach was useful, but I have to think that many of the docs are just co totally like ignoring those flags. <laughs> the, the key is to make it very, very time efficient and, and just to the provider that needs it. We have a uh -huh. lot of our uh, alerts that go to the staff that's rooming the patient. They have a whole list that they're going through. And they've sometimes complained as we keep adding to their list, but we keep hiring more of them and <laughs> because yeah, we, they yeah. have a really long list. As they're rooming the patient and doing the blood pressure, they're saying, oh, you're due for a lipid panel. You know, you need to go to the lab. And, and they're doing a lot of that kind of uh -huh. at least the prompting to screen. Oh, yeah. And then we're building a best practice alert with, for our, that 
interfaces with this other alert that I told you about so that all they'll have to do is an alert will come up and say the last LDL was over 190, click here once and it'll load all the lab orders. They don't have to make a list of the seven lab tests mm -hmm. and then go to another screen to like type them in. No, we just make it one mouse click. So we try to really be mindful of the physician's time right, um, right. because of that reason. And we're also, there's we have to be very careful. They have to be um, a priorities for the organization, and you kind of have to get bandwidth sometimes. And right. and luckily, there's you know cholesterol enough, is important enough that I was able to to get some things on the table. But it's not always easy. So right, yeah, no, that's great, um, Pat. Um, I think your practice that thing that Kelly showed you know with that uh, parabolic curve. I think your practice was that one on the far left at the top. But anyway, uh, Pat Pat has a question. <laughs> ACCHA 50% reduction or they, they use a target or is it optional? Right, so I think overall one way to think of it is, is we're bringing up the floor. The people that are not engaged and not out there floating that had an LDL over 197 years ago, we're trying to pull them back in and get them engaged. We're not micromanaging the providers and when to use add-on therapy and when to do this or that. You know, that will leave that to providers once the patients are re-engaged. But it's re-engaging the unengaged patients that we're, we're really doing the systemic levers on. And one more question. How about LP A? What's Kaiser's uh, thought process on testing for LP A? Yeah, we haven't done a lot on that on a systemic level, again, because it hasn't made it into the major guidelines. I think individual providers may be ordering it and using it, but not at a systemic level. Quick question. Catherine? Yeah. <laughs> Flagging those who, um, for further workup, who have an LDL of over 190, are you including some messaging that says um, possible FH or suggesting that as a, as a concrete possibility? Yes, cause. so a lot of the time when we do a new alert or prompts, it's coupled with education because a lot of times when a provider comes across a new alert, they're like, oh, what's this? So, so we come with tip sheets, particularly like a, a page of bullet points kind of that go along whenever we're rolling something out. And it has very specific, you know, um, make sure you screen family members, make sure you look for this and that and, and you know, look out for FH. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Eric? Um, first, to Mary Malloy. Oh, I just wanted to comment. I'm uh, the consultant for the Kaiser uh, Regional Genetics Clinic in Oakland in pediatrics. And we have a lipid uh, clinic there that I've been consulting with for quite a few years. And I just wanted to make uh, the point that I think that pediatricians um, are a good group to target to find FH patients. Um, our clinic came up with a series of recommendations for how to screen and, and send it around to the um, pediatric community. In other words, which patients should they be referring to the specialty clinic? And uh, through the years, we picked up quite a number of FH patients. And so we do the cascade screaming, screening backwards. <laughs> we find the, uh, the child, and then we do the, the whole family. Um, and all these patients get LP little a measurements. And more recently, uh, we've also been measuring LPPLA2, which I'm finding um, a, a, just another bit of data to put into how aggressive we should be in terms of treating children uh, with FH and with other lipid disorders. So I think that um, there are problems within the Kaiser system in terms of turning over the care of these patients to various people. And right now, we're using the pediatric endocrine group uh, to be the ones that will pick up the care, although I would think pediatric cardiology would do it as well. But anyway, in the larger community, uh, I think that we need to target uh, pediatricians more than we're doing right now to turn up these cases, which we can then uh, look at families. And, and it's a very important way to turn these people up. Thanks, Mary. Um, Eric, Eric, last question. Uh, Ron, your, your system should be a learning system. How do you test the effects of it? Um, well, one of the, we have 13 medical centers. We, when we did, I, I mentioned in 2012, we had 33,000 members who their last LDL was over 190, and we take we run run charts basically over time to see 
which medical center, I told you the one medical center had a lipid pharmacist reaching out and mm -hmm. their performance goes up. So then he shares his best practices with the other medical centers and then the other medical centers start doing that. And we, we use that for performance improvement across a whole array of, of metrics. So, so we're kind of trying to learn and I'm learning a lot here um, from, is you it, know. Is it also monitoring heart endpoints? Oh, hard endpoints. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's ideal to remove that. We don't have a, a great way of um, ongoing monitoring of that okay. and reducing that, but that is, is on our wish list. Okay. Can I just ask, we have all you guys up here. So the, the eMERGE approach, which both the Geisinger and Mayo are going to be involved with, and then the FindFH approach. Can you clarify, so are these going to be sort of parallel approaches, or are they going to come together kind of in one one big, big approach? I mean, maybe maybe that's too big a question to answer here, but I'm just curious. <clears throat> well, the, um, the claims approach, the find FH approach, um, really has the possibility for us of being a regional approach. Uh, uh -huh. So patients not only in Geisinger, but also outside of Geisinger. And so we're kind of excited to use that in parallel with, with the eMERGE approach. Uh -huh. Though uh, I think we still need to get a lot more granularity yeah. behind all Tem the Temporally, things. I have the sense. Find FH, I think, is a little further along in terms mm -hmm. of actually uh, it being implemented, uh, eMERGE is going to take a while to kind of get its act together, I think, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Kelly? I, I, I agree with that. And, and I, I think there's synergies all the way around, just as we've had synergies in building the, the two models. So yeah. I, I, we'll continue to look for those. Yeah. Great. Um, well, this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate the, all, the, all the panel members uh, participating. We're going to take a short break, come back at 3 o'clock, and we have a fantastic next session. So. <laughs> Could you see, please search for your place? We want to restart, reboot. Many of the early FH landmark studies have been done in uh, South Africa, and still a, a lot of the great clinical work originates from South Africa, and pro probably it has to do with the uh, founder effect. Actually, it's uh, partly an uh, old Dutch export FH to South Africa. I've, and at the first summit, I've shown the large Dutch pedigree we've been working on, and there was one branch missing, and that's probably the branch uh, Dr. Raal is working with. And uh, Dr. Raal is uh, head of uh, endocrinology at the University of Witwatersrand, and that is really also a next export article. That is our tricky language with the nice G's. And he's based in Johannesburg. And uh, Frederick Raal is uh, a, a very good uh, clinician scientist. And he will talk about uh, PCSK9 inhibition. Well, just to thank uh, Catherine and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, the, the role of PCSK9 in the management of patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. It's been a remarkable journey. Um, I think this is the second wave after the statin era 
Um, and just uh, to start off, uh, I'm just going to take a step back uh, to follow on last night. Once we get the slides. <laughs> I'll do it with us, eh? Hopefully they'll be here sometime. No problem. I'm hoping the colour of my slides will keep everyone awake this time of the afternoon. Everyone's still at tea. I have been to all three summits. Yes, yeah, yeah, and it's it's been a, it's been great to hear. I think this is the important one in terms of the crossroads. I mean, there's a lot of discussion, and hopefully now we have the armamentarium as when we start talking about the PCS canine inhibitors to really offer patients uh, something extra. Nothing yet. Hopefully my slides are in the system somewhere. No problem. <laughs> I once went to a really little outlying town. I had to give a talk and I, and I took a flash card, you know, card my sp and they didn't have such a thing. They were still using those old stiffy or the floppy disks. So sometimes you have to do things without slides. But... Uh, Draw as, as we go along. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I've got, got it here, but it looks like we're getting places. Any luck? At least it gets everybody to finish their tea and have their tea break and come back. Not in, I've got, I've got it in the room, not on me. Okie doke. Yes, yeah. well I think the statins, were, I mean, you know, uh, here we are. So we can definitely address that in question time. <laughs> okay, slightly different format. Are we all okay to go? No, no, it's absolutely no problem. We can skip over my disclosures and, and all set to go. Uh, so unfortunately the, the format is slightly different, uh, but hopefully you can follow the slides. I thought we'd just step back and uh, just talk about uh, the last 200 years, because it's only really 200 years ago um, that was that cholesterol was first described, um, coming from the ancient Greek words um, bile and steros, solid. And uh, Francois Pochelier uh, basically identified cholesterol in solid form in gallstones way back in 1769, but it was really only 200 years ago. That was in 1816 that the chemist uh, Michel Cheviel named the compound cholesterolin, which we now know as cholesterol. A hundred years ago that Nikolai Anoshkov um, described or sort of caused atherosclerosis in the rabbit model, um, uh, and that was really the start of this, this process of atherosclerosis. 75 years ago, Carl Muller 
1939, really identified these cases with what he called hereditary xanthomatosis um, and really described the sort of clinical condition of familial hypercholesterolemia. And then as we heard last night and we honored um, um, a, a Cachadurian, um, uh, basically when he described the two clinical forms, which is the, basically the heterozygous and homozygous form of familial hypercholesterolemia. And then 30 years ago was the major breakthrough when Goldstein and Brown, as you know, were given them a Nobel Prize for describing really um, the LDL receptor and the specific mutation in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, which was really a major break breakthrough. And then more recently, and I think this is now the latest big wave, um, was uh, when Marin, um, Marianne Abifable described in 2003, only just over 10 years ago, the PCSK9 gene resulting in the FH uh, phenotype. Uh, and that's what really we're going to talk about today is the place of the PCSK9 and PCSK9 inhibitors. So as has been talked about a lot at this meeting is that we're probably under-diagnosing FH, and this is Bo's slide just sort of saying that probably the prevalence is nearer the one in, after the last session is much nearer one in 200 than one in 500, which we previously predicted. We can clinically define or divide uh, FH into the two categories, uh, heterozygous and homozygous FH. Um, but as uh, Kiss uh, told us this morning, I think the, the overlap is much greater than, than we previously thought. And uh, this phenotypic variability uh, is, is now much greater. So in terms of the studies that we've done, we've found patients uh, that we thought had heterozygous FH, which are actually genetically homozygous uh, patients. And similarly, patients that have homozygous FH that have a much milder ph phenotype than we previously thought. So I'm really going to talk about the manage of, of patients with severe FH, which could include patients uh, with heterozygous FH or the milder or more severe homozygous FH. So... As Catherine mentioned, I really think the statins were a major uh, advance in the management of patients uh, with FH. And interestingly, despite uh, any randomized trial that was done specifically in patients with FH, since the introduction of, of statins in the late 1980s, they really become the mainstay of therapy. Just a little going back to medical school and how do statins work, because it's very important when we discuss the PCSK9 inhibitors, is statins inhibit the very important rate-limiting enzyme called HMG-CoA uh, reductase within the cell. And cholesterol is an essential component um, of any cell. It's like petrol for your motor car. So if you are to inhibit that very essential uh, key element um, uh, enzyme within the cell, the cell will have to get its, uh, its cholesterol from elsewhere. Uh, so what the cell would then do... Um, is upregulate. It's uh, sorry. We here we are. Is upregulate LDL receptors on the cell surface, and would put pull cholesterol into the cell uh, to maintain the cholesterol level within the cell within very uh, certain limits. So basically, the action of of statins is to upregulate LDL receptors. Now. <laughs> The traditional thinking was that patients with homozygous FH who do not have LDL receptors or very poorly functioning LDL receptors would not respond to uh, statin therapy. But in the early days, um, I was involved in studies where we used very high doses of statins, up to 160 milligrams of simvastatin, 80, even up to 160 milligrams of atorvastatin. And patients with a clinical diagnosis of homozygous and subsequently proven to be genetically homozygous patients did respond, albeit not as well as homozygous FH patients. So on average, the response in terms of reduction of LDL cholesterol was about a half, about 30%, uh, as opposed to the 50 to 60% uh, that you would get uh, with heterozygous FH patients. 
We do know that statins have been remarkably effective in, in managing patients with FH, and this is just uh, some data from the Simon Broom Register showing the relative risk of coronary artery disease before the introduction of statins, where the increase was nearly 100-fold, uh, compared to not that many years, sort of five years after the introduction of statin therapy, with this dramatic reduction uh, in the, r the relative risk for coronary artery disease in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. This is just looking at heterozygous and homozygous study. The Dutch um, the study uh, from Femissen uh, on the left, looking at heterozygous patients since the introduction of statins, compared to the background population, you virtually now have a mortality very similar to that of the background population. We were able to look at our homozygous population uh, in South Africa because of the founder effect. So we had a, a cohort of about 149 patients with homozygous FH. And we showed since the introduction of statin therapy, um, uh, together with azetamide, that we uh, reduced uh, events uh, even in this much more difficult uh, group to treat. But unfortunately, they still are very high risk for cardiovascular disease. So statins are really the backbone and uh, very important therapy for these patients. What about azetamide? And, uh, the similar feeling was that perhaps azetamide wouldn't work in patients with homozygous FH or severe uh, FH, but uh, uh, this is uh, Claude Gagne's uh, publication, which showed that the addition of azetamide to a statin, even in patients with homozygous FH, would result in a further 15 to 20% reduction in LDL cholesterol level. So what we have in, for most of our patients with FH, the combination of statin therapy with a cholesterol absorption inhibitor, azetamide, plus with other agents available to us, such as resins, perhaps niacin, not many of us use fibrates, we can reduce LDL cholesterol levels in the order of uh, 55 to 70 percent. Unfortunately, however, and this is the Dutch data once again, is that when we talk about getting to sort of cholesterol levels that we would think would be ideal, unfortunately these are in millimoles, but in terms of converting uh, to milligram percent, so uh, this is a Dutch code of about 1,200 uh, 1, patients with severe FH, trying to get to an LDL cholesterol of 120 milligram per deciliter, you can only get about 50% of patients there, uh, trying to get patients to uh, an LDL of 100 milligram percent only about 20%, and if we want to try and get to the much lower targets of, uh, of uh, 70 milligram percent, very, very few patients with the current therapy available can get to those targets. So what is available, what's on the horizon? Um, there have been some drugs that have been used, but unfortunately because of side effects or because of inefficacy, and those are sort of the first drugs indicated in, in gray there, uh, have been withdrawn. Uh, there are, there's the antisense uh, APOB drug, mypomersin and lamitapib, which is mainly used for the severe homozygote patients. Uh, there are other drugs under development by the CTP inhibitors, but I'm really going to talk about these new drugs, the PCSK9 inhibitors, which are now for the first time becoming available for use uh, for patients with f familial hypercholesterolemia. So it's been a remarkable story in a very short period of uh, just on 10 years from when they were, this, the PCSK9 was first described, uh, when Marina Fable described patients with uh, gain-of-function PCSK9 mutations, to now the rapidly advancing phase three studies, which hopefully uh, we will have the results of within the next uh, year, to, uh, year or two. So... Uh, as I mentioned, Goldstein and Brown were given the Nobel Prize for discovering the LDL receptor and for the way things work. Um, but it's very much, if you think about it, like a motor car. It's very important to have a mechanism of, of, uh, of accelerating, of pulling uh, more cholesterol into the cell. But it's not very good if you do not have a brake on the system. And what PCSK9 really is, is a brake on the system to very carefully uh, control the amount of cholesterol that is taken up by a cell. When we give a statin, uh, not only do we increase, increase the LDL receptors on the cell surface, 
but at the same time, by stimulating stereoregulatory element binding protein 2, we also stimulate the production of PCSK9. And that's why we know that when we increase the dose of statins, we don't really get a double effect. It's very much like trying to drive your car by putting your foot on the accelerator, increasing the number of LDL receptors, but at the same time putting your foot on the brake, uh, which means the car doesn't necessarily go any faster. So it therefore makes very logical sense to try and knock out PCSK9 or try and uh, uh, prevent the brake from being applied. Um, and that's mainly been done um, with the development of PCSK9 inhibitors or monoclonal antibodies. So there's a number under development, but um, as we all know, uh, the, the top two, which is the Sanofi Regeneron drug Alarocamad or Preluent and the Amgen drug Evolocamad or Repatha have very recently been approved by the FDA, mainly for the use in, uh, in FH patients, but there are several others under development. These are mainly monoclonal antibodies, uh, so they are directed against PCSK9. Um, normally what would happen is PCSK9 would attach to the LDL, uh, and if that was done, the LDL receptor would then be destined for uh, degradation within the lysosome. So if you uh, administer a, a PCSK9 uh, inhibitor, a monoclonal antibody, against uh, PCSK9 and knock out the PCSK9, that means all the LDL receptors, none would be destined for, for degradation within the lysosome, and they would all then return to the cell surface, which means you'd markedly upregulate the number of LDL receptors on the cell surface. So this is just a summary of many of the phase three studies that have been done in the last few years. I've highlighted the studies um, in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, which I think is the most important group. If you really want to show that a drug is going to work, those are the patients uh, to really study. And I'm just going to say a little bit about uh, the most important uh, of those studies. So the Odyssey uh, FH1 and FH2 studies were done with the monoclonal antibody alirocumab at a dose of 75 milligrams given every two weeks where you had an option to increase the dose. Um, uh, and importantly, I just, uh, as Joss alluded to this morning, uh, this is just the patient characteristics in the FH1 and 2 studies. And I just want to highlight that the average age of these patients was in the early 50s, but very importantly, uh, 40 to uh, 30 to 40 percent of these patients already had established uh, cardiovascular disease. So it is still a very atherogenic condition and people are still dying in the prime of their lives despite the availability of statin ezetimibe therapy. So this was the reduction at week 24 in LDL cholesterol with the addition of a PCSK9 inhibitor on top of statin and ezetimibe therapy. Uh, the reduction was in the order of 50% uh, on top of this therapy. So for the first time, we were now able to get patients uh, with familial hypercholesterolemia to targets that we never dreamed of before. This effect was maintained, so a twice weekly an injection given every fortnight or once a month uh, is maintained in, in this study over a 52-week period. In the Rutherford study, and this is with the Amgen drug Evolocumab, a shorter term study, but in this study, a very similar study design, we were also interested in looking whether the genetics in terms of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia would affect the response to this medication. So in this study, two doses of Evolocumab were used, 140 milligrams given every two weeks, or uh, 420 milligrams given once a month, and this was a short-term study. We just looked at the primary endpoint, which was at 12 weeks. And once again, this drug was remarkably effective at reducing LDL cholesterols on top of statin and zetamib by an additional 60% in this patient population. So for the first time, we were being able to now achieve LDL targets um, that we would all love to have so it, a level of uh, LDL of less than 70 milligram per deciliter was achieved in uh, over 60% of patients uh, in this uh, patient in this study, in the Rutherford study. 
We also looked at the genetics, um, and as was mentioned, in terms of the elder receptor defect, uh, it could be a defective or abnormal receptor, or it could be an absent receptor, what we call a null receptor. But at least in patients with heterozygous FH, it doesn't, does not uh, appear to make any difference whether the abnormal allele has no receptor function at all or still has some residual LDL receptor function. And that's probably because PCSK9 inhibitors are upregulating the normal allele or the normal LDL receptor. So at least in heterozygous FH patients, the response is, is not dependent on the underlying genetic defect. Now what about the use of these drugs in homozygous uh, FH patients? Now in theory, because these, uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors act mainly by upregulating LDL receptors, these drugs should not work in patients with homozygous FH. But many homozygous FH, in terms of the clinical diagnosis, do not have no receptors. They still have some residual LDL receptor activity. So we thought it was a good idea to at least test and see if these drugs will work uh, in this pa patient population. And after a small proof of concept study, which, posed, uh, which was positive, we did a much larger study called the Tesla study in patients with homozygous FH. Very similar study de designed. It was only a 12-week study looking to see if this drug would be effective in, these pa in this patient population. This is the study design. Uh, patients in, in with uh, clinical homozygous FH, which was confirmed genetically in all patients, were randomized just to a single dose of evolocumab, 420 milligrams given once a month, and the primary endpoint was at 12 weeks. Not as effective as in uh, heterozygous patients where the average reduction was as, as 60%, but very similar to statin therapy, the addition of evolocumab in this very difficult to treat patient group resulted in a uh, further 30% uh, reduction uh, in LDL cholesterol levels. But once again, we were interested in looking at the genetics of this patient population. And if you had absolutely no receptor function, unfortunately there was only one patient in this, in this, uh, in this study that had, uh, it was a true receptor negative patient who did not respond and in fact had an increase in LDL cholesterol during the study. If you happen to have a defective, one defective or two defective mutations, you can see that patients with homozygous FH with two defective mutations had a nearly 50% reduction in the LDL cholesterol levels. So that is a pretty good response over and above uh, on top of other therapy in this very difficult uh, to, uh, treat, uh, group to treat. So we do know that in homozygous FH there's an inverse correlation between res residual LDL receptor activity and the pretreatment level of LDL cholesterol, the age of onset of coronary artery disease, and also now in terms of the response to present pharmacotherapy. So this is just shown here by Petoni, the Italian group, that if you look at LDL cholesterol uh, and you compare it to residual uh, LDL receptor activity, the lower the LDL receptor activity, the higher the LDL cholesterol level. Uh, this was shown earlier by Kiss, but just to look at the, uh, the Dutch population, um, this is just looking at uh, LDL cholesterol levels and you'll notice that patients, uh, once again, this is pre and post treatment, even those with two null receptors indicated in green uh, on the left do respond at least partially. And this was with standard lipid lowering therapy, statin and azetamibe. So absolutely having no LDL receptors does not necessarily mean you will not respond uh, to some degree to lipid lowering therapy. So where do we stand at the moment? Even patients with homozygous FH, the, uh, with uh, a combination of a statin plus a zetamib plus a PCSK9 inhibitor, not all patients, but we're starting to get patients um, with homozygous FH to a clinical phenotype that resembles more like heterozygous FH. And in fact, some of the patients even get, uh, get their LDL cholesterol levels to below uh, 100 millig milligrams percent with the advent of these drugs. In terms of LP little a, and that was also brought up, um, unlike statins, which do not affect LP little a, 
there is a reduction in LP little a with the use of PCSK9 inhibitors uh, on the top dose, an average of about a 30% reduction in LP little a. So where do we stand with uh, PCSK9 inhibitor therapy uh, in, the, in the treatment of familial hypercholesterolemia? It's an extremely promising, and I think it's a second wave, as we mentioned, the, the first wave was statins. Uh, we've got the cholesterol absorption inhibitors, but uh, in terms of patients now with heterozygous FH, the vast majority uh, respond to the addition of PCSK9 inhibitor therapy with a reduction of LDL in the, in the order of 60%. Um, in terms of uh, patients with homozygous FH that have been described around the world, the majority probably still have some residual LDL receptor activity. Um, so those patients would also respond to this medication. Um, so I, th I think it's really fulfilled an unmet need in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia. So in terms of a treatment algorithm, in terms of where we stand at the moment, uh, statins are still first and foremost. If we can't get patients to goals that we'd like to achieve, we would add a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. There are other drugs that may be of some minor or moderate benefit, but now with the addition of the PCSK9 inhibitors, I think we've really fulfilled an admit need and allowed many of these patients to, um, to achieve targets that we may have been able to ch achieve before. So just to end off with, um, Goldstein and Brown, way back in 1996, wrote an editorial, Heart Attacks Gone with the Century, because they were so impressed uh, with uh, the, 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 the uh, statins uh, in terms of um, cholesterol reduction that they th predicted that we would have the end of cardiovascular disease atherosclerosis by the end of the last century. We know that that unfortunately hasn't happened, um, but I'm hoping that now with the introduction of uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors, we are much nearer a cure for this condition. So this was the first patient that I treated and what got me interested in this field. It was a young boy called Andre. He was 10 at the time. Um, and this was in 1990 uh, when statins first became available in South Africa. So his uh, LDL cholesterol was over 1,000 milligram uh, per, per deciliter. We put him onto statin therapy, but he had only been on for a very short time uh, when unfortunately when he was swimming at school, uh, he didn't make the other side of the pool and died from a heart attack when he was just 10 years old. I think the important... Uh, message there you can see is a slim, thin boy and unfortunately had inherited a very se severe condition from both of his parents. But as has been said repeatedly at this, uh, at this, uh, uh, at this meeting, these patients with homozygous FH are, are, are subject to a very, very high cholesterol load from a very early age, heterozygous less so, but compared to the normal population, their arteries are being exposed to the same amount of cholesterol uh, that somebody, you and I would have at the age of 80, a homozygote would have that cholesterol uh, burden by the age of 20, a heterozygote by the age of 40. So I think our big challenge ahead, um, and that's my final slide, is what's really been said at this meeting, is we need to really try and identify these patients. It's no good waiting until they present clinically in the prime of their lives in their 40s or 50s with an event. We need to identify these patients early because we now have the armamentarium, we have now the medication available that will allow us to get virtually all patients uh, with a heterozygous FH and a, a good proportion of patients even with a more severe homozygous FH to levels we've never been able to see before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick, for this impressive uh, keynote lecture, um, making us optimistic about the cure for uh, FH, and perhaps, perhaps in a broader sense, uh, in future, uh, humans as an LDL-free species. Um, perhaps um, Dr. Morris, a cardiologist at the University of South uh, Carolina can uh, uh, change my uh, ideas into more educated approaches.
Yes. There you are. Um, specific indications within FH, probably. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you, in case I forget. Okay, great. Well, um, I must say I'm, it, I am a little intimidated to follow um, Dr. Rawl, in particular, not because of his brilliant accent, but because of those incredibly colored slides. Um, <laughs> You would have thought those would have been mine, but actually mine are a white background. But you know, um, what I'm going to be doing is something very different, um, and that is we're going less science, more practical, and some of the considerations for these novel therapies. Many of you in this room are clinicians, as am I, um, taking care of these very high-risk patients. And day in and day out, we're having to make decisions about what the order of therapy is. Um, and importantly, I think this disease and the availability of the, the variety of um, agents and all the aphoresis make it more important than ever that we consider the patient-clinician discussion. And I think about, um, before I, just before I begin, just uh, one, uh, one patient case for me is a, very, a young man who had bypass surgery in his early 30s. He's an HOFH patient, had bypass surgery um, in his early 30s, has subsequently had multiple stents, et cetera. Um, ultimately was on a four-drug regimen, and when the LDLA phoresis program was started, he chose to go ahead and begin a phoresis. But he's very active, he surfs and he does weight training. And when his fistula became the size of a cable stay for the suspension bridge over the Cooper River Bridge, he said he had had enough. He works full-time as an engineer. And he said he had had enough, so he chose lamidipide. So I offered him mipomersin, I offered him lamidipide. He made the choice to go ahead with lamidipide. He maintained his other drugs until he couldn't take niacin any longer. He was tired of the flushing. Um, and fortunately for him, lamidipide allowed him to get down to um, very, very low levels. Actually, his last LDL cholesterol level was 65. But he's now having GI uh, side effects on lamidipide. He is having difficulty with the six tablets of colacevalam a day. And he is now trying to make the next decision about where to go in his therapy. So I think more than ever, this disease really requires the important consideration of the patient's um, issues. And so this disease, as we've heard time and time again, represents a considerable burden for FH patients. There are the, we've talked about the physical signs and the physical limitations of the disease. We've talked about the psychosocial factors. Um, as we've seen with my patient who had to take off to get uh, work as an engineer to go get LDLA phoresis, their employment and educational issues. And most importantly, what I want to talk about today are the treatment-related issues um, that are important to the patient. So uh, Dr. Rawls already shown us the variety of agents that we have available to us. And what I want to do is talk about what are some of the considerations as we make choices. First of all, there are, as we've said, patient-specific considerations. And as any of you will know who have tried to have lamidipide, mipomersin, and now the PCSK9 inhibitors approved, um, there are clinician-specific considerations. We now have some long-term safety considerations. And then, of course, um, as Dr. Goldman will discuss with us next, we have issues regarding um, the healthcare systems, the payers, socioeconomic considerations, and also some issues with regarding these more expensive therapies of whether or not this will further play a role in widening some of the um, gaps in terms of healthcare disparities. So what are some of the questions that we need to think about as we make decisions? Number one, what are the threshold levels for initiation of non-statin therapy or um, some of these other novel therapies? 
what constitutes a less than anticipated therapeutic response to statin therapy, what are the lipid or the lipoprotein goals in patients um, with FH, and that varies from guideline to vi uh, guideline. As Dr. Rawl just showed us, a knowledge of the underlying genetic defect, receptor negative, receptor defective. What are some of the issues in um, efficacy of the different agents, the cost, the convenience, the accessibility, the tolerability, the adverse effects, and the safety? So let's look through some potential algorithms for how we would initiate non-statin therapy. So first of all, this is the easy part because this has been sort of the algorithm um, of care all along. So lifestyle therapy and um, high intensity statin therapy, both in children and adults, is the foundation of care for these patients. If they are not at goal, they have less than a, uh, an anticipated response, then we would consider the uh, addition of a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. Now, what if they are, and likely not going to be, again, not at goal and have less than an anticipated therapeutic response, and we're adding one of these agents, what, is the, what are the considerations? Well, azetamibe is currently brand name only. It will go off patent on December 12th of next year. Um, we have issues with the combination products that may be more expensive than the um, individual agents. Plan coverages vary. And now we do have long-term outcomes data in post-ACS patients. Are we willing to extend that to other high-risk populations? And I believe in, in a, uh, FH, we would, are obviously more than willing to do so. Now, what if that is not enough? Thus far, the standard of care, or in most of the algorithms, has been a bile acid sequestrant, plus minus nicotinic acid, and I'm just going to go ahead and take the fibrates out with the, the CARES, the other medications that we have available now. Um, really, I don't think it plays a very important role. So what are some of the considerations with these agents then? Well, there are generics available except for colocevalam. Now, interestingly, colocevalam went off patent um, on March 2nd of this year, but the generic agents have not yet been approved. Um, it does have fewer adverse effects, it's better tolerated, and it has fewer drug interactions. But again, planned coverage can vary. Um, tolerability can be an issue for some patients, although it is better tolerated than the other bile acid sequestrants. Um, less of an issue with hypertriglyceridemia for colocevalam, fewer drug interactions, and we have the small uh, benefit in terms of um, improved um, glucose control. Niacin, we have a generics available. There are numerous um, potential adverse effects. Uh, requires dose titration. It is not generally recommended in the algorithms for the care of children. And I would say that it has been used for its LDL-lowering benefits for um, a long time now, in part because we were waiting for other better tolerated, more efficacious agents to be available. So in the next tier after that, we have um, most recently had, we have therapies such as LDLA phoresis, mipomersin, and lamidipide. Uh, MIPO and lamidipide both approved for patients who have homozygous FH, and LDL apheresis approved for any patient with FH, uh, depending on the baseline LDL cholesterol level. What are the considerations here? Well, we do have um, good evidence of potential um, benefits in terms of LDL apheresis, observational evidence in terms of outcomes, also plaque regression and stabilization. It is considered to be cost effective in HOFH, particularly in the most severe phenotypes. Um, and in the most severe phenotypes, and most guidelines recommend that it be initiated as early as possible. With lamidipide, these agents are only available through REMS programs, so the prescriber and the pharmacies are certified. From the patient's point of view, it does require ongoing laboratory monitoring due to um, hepatic steatosis. Um, cost can be an issue. 
Lamidipide has, um, uh, is oral, but does have some GI side effects and dietary restrictions. Mipomersin, on the other hand, is sub-Q sub injection, and the main adverse effects are injection site reactions and flu-like syndromes, which are somewhat variable in their uh, occurrence. From the clinician's point of view, we've got the prior authorization and the prescriber training. Both, pro both agents do have a patient um, assistant or a patient care program that can help both the patient and the prescriber through the um, prescribing process. Now, of course, now we have the advent of the PCSK9 um, inhibitors and looking at how that plays a role in the decision process. What are the considerations with the PCSK9 inhibitors? Well, they're brand named only, and plan coverage has, how many of you have, have prescribed them? How many of you have written prescriptions and gone through it? How many of you have had them denied? How many of you have been successful on prior authorization again when you re resubmit it? Fewer hands there. <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, how many of you do the paperwork yourself? How many have a, a, a APP who does the work for you? Yeah, that's what I thought. I do it myself, so I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. um, there may be some quantity limits, and also there may be some issues with the payers in terms of what drug, depending on what they negotiate, what drug they'll pay for this year compared to what they'll pay for next year. Will they continue the drug um, based on um, the patient's response? From the clinician's point of view, it's time. It's time and paperwork. Also documentation, because you do need to have um, documentation of prior statin therapy tried, um, documentation of the patient's diagnoses that would qualify for therapy, and again, you may have to justify um, ongoing treatment. Um, laboratory monitoring, you have to be sure to um, be very specific to the patient. Do you want the post-dose or the immediate pre-dose laboratory studies? Um, from a patient point of view, also these drugs do need to be refrigerated. Alirocumab is continuously refri uh, refrigerated. Evolocumab may go up to 30 days without refrigeration, which may make it simpler for patients when traveling or vacation or work-related um, issues. Again, we do have the patient support programs. Um, there are issues with adherence due to cost, sub-Q injection. Um, but again, both programs um, do have patient assistance programs um, and um, do have education programs for um, administration, of, of, uh, administration of the agent. So now the next thing becomes, based on all the considerations that I've just given you, how do we know what to do when and what are, the, what are the issues that would help us decide which drug first? So let's start with accessibility. Well, that makes it easy. LDL apheresis is not widely available to everyone. So if we're making decisions based on apheresis in many areas, that takes that out of the decision-making equation. What about patient convenience? So here, apheresis, we've already talked about, that requires a half a day, requires um, uh, the uh, travel to the facility, requires an IV, a fistula, or a port. Um, Mipomersin is a sub-Q injection, as are the PCSK9 inhibitors. So if oral therapy is important, as this was from my patient's point of view, we may prefer lamidipide if the patient would like to go um, all oral therapy. What about tolerability as an issue? Well, we know the statin-related uh, uh, side effects are myalgias. Azetamibe generally well tolerated. There is some cross-reactivity. I'm sure many of you have seen patients who swear statin intolerance 
due to myalgias may, uh, may also complain of myalgias on azetamide. Um, I have had from time to time GI side effects, whether I believe them or not is unclear. The bile acid sequestrants, it's the powder, it's the number of pills. Um, uh, if it's not colocevalam, a higher incidence of GI side effects. We know niacin well. Lamidipide and mipomersin, um, we've talked about. LDLA phoresis we've talked about. Now, the, the PCSK9 inhibitors, on the other hand, other than being sub-Q injection, are really generally well tolerated without real consistent issues with tolerability. So if we're making decisions based on tolerability, then we might go straight from statin and azetamide straight to one of the PCSK9 inhibitors. What about cost? Um, here, so this has really been an issue while there's a lot of excitement about the PCSK9 inhibitors, um, just as there were with uh, mipomersin and with lamidipide, there are concerns about the cost effectiveness. Um, here. So um, again, when we look at the landscape, we now have generic statins, but and rosuvastatin goes um, off patent December 12th of next year. Most of the others available generic, but on the other hand, PCSK9 inhibitors brand only. This is more just for your interest, and hopefully you'll have access to these slides afterwards. I went through and just looked at what the average wholesale um, price was and cost per month here. For statins, you can see for the generics, um, all very affordable. Those which are um, available, uh, branded, uh, anywhere in the range from about $112 to $160 per month for the average wholesale price. Uh, for the Let's see if this will go. There we go. For the other agents here, bile acid sequestrants, um, you know, again, looking at colocevalam here um, in the range of 560 some odd dollars um, per month, azetamibe about $260 per month, uh, mipomersin $23,000, uh, lamidipide $29,000, PCSK9 inhibitors about $1,200 per month. And aphoresis is approximately $2,500 per treatment. So again, taking those things into consideration. And so the real key here is net benefit and cost effectiveness. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Goldman to let him sort all this out for us in his talk following mine. Again, route of storage, uh, route of administration and storage, um, an issue to the patient. So um, aphoresis IV, MIPO, and the PCSK9 inhibitors, again, uh, subcutaneous uh, injection. What about pregnancy? Another important consideration for younger patients who are of childbearing age. Um, knocks out a number of the agents, um, the statin, azetamide, nicotinic acid, mipomersin, lamidipide, alirocumab. What you're left with in pregnancy is lifestyle, colocevalam, and LDL apheresis. Efficacy, really, Dr. Rawl has gone through this data, so I'm not going to look at this again here, um, but suffice it to say that it oftentimes requires um, a village of drugs um, to get these patients um, to goal. So um, what we do know is that LDLA phoresis is effective in all FH patients, mipomersin and lamidipide approved for um, uh, homozygous FH patients, and alirocumab, as Dr. Rawl pointed out, except in negative-negative LDL receptor patients, um, does have um, excellent efficacy. What about children? So the, most of the uh, drugs, whether it's statins, um, azetamide, bile acid sequestrants, are all approved for use in um, children here, down to a variety of ages, anywhere from 6 to age 10. And um, LDLA phoresis in HOFH uh, children may be started um, as early age 2 in specialized centers. 
So um, in children here, I do think we have some questions about what the role will be of some of these agents. We do know that MIPO Mersins, um, in their pivotal phase three trial, they did um, have data down to uh, a participant age 12, lamidipide down to age 18, and both alirocumab and evolocumab are being studied now in children, so that work um, is in progress. What about drug-drug interactions? Well, we know with aphoresis, you can't use ACE inhibitors. Mipomersin is quite clean. There are no clinically significant drug interactions in these complicated patients. Um, in uh, alirocumab and evolocumab, no clinically significant drug interactions. Lamidipide is contraindicated with moderate or strong um, inhibitors of cytochrome uh, p 4 uh, P453A4, which is, again, consideration in these very high-risk patients with complex cardiovascular disease. What about hepatic or renal insufficiency? So mipomersin is contraindicated in moderate to severe impairment um, in the liver, lamidipide as well, um, and also lamidipide uh, patients with uh, end-stage renal disease on dialysis um, should not exceed 40 milligrams um, daily. No adjustment needed for the PCSK9 inhibitors, and then we can see nicotinic acid, um, which is also contraindicated in active liver disease and should be used with caution in renal impairment. What about long-term safety? Um, obviously, I'm taking nicotinic out acid out here now because of recent data of um, no real net benefit, so put a question mark on that. LDL apheresis, we do have some long-term observational um, data. With both mipomersin and lamidipide, we will have um, its been, uh, it's being monitored through the REMS program, so we really will have some good post-marketing um, surveillance information, and um, of course, the, uh, there are no specific safety concerns thus far with alirocumab and uh, evolocumab. There is this question of the um, potential neurocognitive um, signal, which is under investigation. And then, of course, long-term um, cardiovascular outcomes here, a cross-off nicotinic acid, and we still have much to learn about um, some of the other agents here. So what I really wanted to do was to just sort of run through to you what we as clinicians and you as patients need to think about as we address these very complicated high-risk patients. And I wish I could say it was incredibly straightforward. I wish I could put up for you um, a, a, a static algorithm, but I don't actually think it's that simple. Um, again, I think I would like to emphasize here the importance of the patient-clinician discussion, and um, this may be um, really the way we're moving toward, if we, particularly if we get um, long-term outcome um, data from the PCSK9 inhibitors, this may be, um, may be a reasonable um, algorithm uh, to consider here. So I'm going to stop at that point, and I thank you very much. And I know this wasn't a lot of science, but I hope it was very practical. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent lecture, Dr. Morris. I want to continue with uh, panel discussion. And I want to invite uh, Seth Baum, uh, Dr. Handelsman, Dr. Harada Shiba, Dr. Hutchins, Dr. Norderskart, Dr. Rao, and Dr. Shah on the stand. And I want to go back to uh, um, sp uh, specifically inhibition of uh, PCSK9. And I can imagine that uh, you have a lot of uh, questions. Okay. 
Are there any burning questions in the audience? Yes. Very good question. Frederick. <coughs> Not that we're aware. I mean, it's a difficult thing. And before, first, in terms of the monoclonal antibodies, just to realize, I mean, there is probably PCSK9 in the brain, but monoclonal antibodies will not cross the blood-brain barrier. So in terms of safety and the neurocognitive effects, uh, you can't put blame that on PCSK9 inhibition. It would have to be on cholesterol. Uh, synthesis. So uh, I'm not aware of any of other effects that PCSK9 has, but you know the question is why we have PCSK9 in the first place. And I think the most logical uh, explanation is the reason it's mainly at, at the level of the, of the hepatis of the liver. So the liver is making VLDL particles which are now being secreted by the liver. If there was no PCSK9 there, the LDL receptors, if you give a statin, and you're upregulating receptors on the cell surface, the, the particles that are just being produced by the liver are going to be taken straight up back by the liver. So the PCSK9 is basically a way of saying that we want the particles to get out into the circulation to be circulated. So that's the, the simple uh, answer, but uh, we may well find that PCSK9 uh, does have other roles, uh, but at this point in time, I, I don't think we know them. If there's no other question, I would actually like to ask people here at the panel different ones. I mean, it's when we started with the statins, uh, there was absolutely no side effects. We came from using niacin and bilacid binding resins, and there were side effects in every consultation. But then came statins, there was nothing. And now we have a PCSK9 inhibitors, and we talk about as if there's going to be no side effects. But after we had statins for years, and journalists came into it and started writing about it, and suddenly there were side effects. Uh, well at least we think so, muscle side effects. But what do people in the panel think that will that same thing happen with PCSK9 inhibitors, that in five or ten years' time we will suddenly talk about side effects? Well, I'm a pediatric lipidologist, and it's certainly a, a big concern of mine um, with the thought of even going into the, the heterozygous FH population of children um, with the intent of, of treating children without really having a clear idea of the side effects. I think, on the other hand, we need to push hard forward for the homozygous FH child who has really, I think, been, been left out of the clinical trials. And in the future, I think we really need to make a push and maybe have discussions about the obstacles in getting uh, clinical trials through um, for the pediatric homozygous um, age group. So I'm not so sure that the statins came with no side effect. It's correct that compared to cholesteramine, compared to uh, niacin, the side effects were by far lower. But statins came with some side effect, whether it was monitoring the liver, though it changed over the time. Uh, the myalgias came pretty early on on many of the patients, not to the level that we thought, but remember also we started with lower uh, dosage typically at the early days of the statins. Uh, every drug, the moment it will go out to full use, may show a side effect. I think that uh, if we look at would it affect the PCSK9 somewhere else on a function that we are not familiar with that time will have to tell us. But until that time, knowing that it's supposed to affect just this one particular aspect of PCSK9 and typically does not address any other part of metabolism, it seems right now to have quite a clean profile, the time will tell. I think that the largest part of this question would be, as we heard before, the LDL levels are going to be very low on many patients. And it may mean nothing on the short term, at least in the trials, there was no side effect. What will it do 10 years, 15 years later if LDL is wanting to be 12, let's say, LDL cholesterol? If it's 8, does it have any kind of a metabolic effect or not? 
I don't know, because we're not losing cholesterol. It's still there. It's still in the body. It's still in, in the liver. But I think that may open the question for the future. I don't think we can compare uh, the type of drug that this antibody represents compared to the general effect of a statin. Yeah, I, I, I would just add, uh, getting back to Pamela's uh, main point, you know, because that's really what we're all talking about is where, where does this drug fit in uh, in clinical practice? I would invoke the Pope once again uh, with, the, uh, <laughs> with the do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And uh, so I, I think that's a very nice way to look at how we should treat our patients. And so I would say, you know, obviously if you have a patient uh, who's uh, heterozygote, let's say, who has an LDL of 70 and just presented for uh, his or her third stent, is that somebody that you would put on a PCSK9 inhibitor even though the person has an LDL of 70? I would then put myself in that position and say, yes, I would do it. So I don't know how everybody else feels about this. But uh, I think that's the, the easiest way. It was a little off topic here, a little bit, but the, that's the easiest way to approach this, I yeah. believe. Uh, sure, these statins have side effects, but I think, I think that the trade-off still is good. The profit is clear of statin use. Then. Well, Seth, since, since you opened open the door to this topic, I, I'd love to hear the panel discuss how are we going to make rational use of PCSK9 inhibitors in the absence of LDL targets? Like, is it really going to be up to the clinician to decide the LDL is too high? Or does it inevitably mean that we're going to have to bring targets back to actually give some sort of structure to how we make decisions or how payers are going to pay? So I, I think that this is, this is, to me, one of the key, key issues, and I'd love to hear, hear the thoughts. So the targets have been there. Targets did not go away. There is one group, one society or two societies that decided that they don't want target for a while. But we have to recognize that many other groups, whether the European Society of Cardiologists or the European Association of Study of Diabetes, the IAS, uh, my society, which is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, we have targets all along. So the targets did not go away. Uh, yeah, how do we manage our patients? I think we do manage with targets, but we also manage clinically. So if I have a patient who, I'll tell you a today patient, a patient today. She, last week actually, when we were out at, uh, in Washington at, the, you know, at uh, ACC discussing some of these same issues, um, she actually walked into the hospital with acute MI. She's 71 years old. Her LDL ranges between 160 to 240, which means does she take her well call or does she not take the well call? The reason she's on well call is she is allergic to statins. She's not statin intolerant, it's not muscles, it's severe rashes and swelling and so on, and believe it or not, a couple of people like that. She was on four different statins and she, all of them could not tolerate her, and she got an acute MI even though it said in the hospital that she's got severe allergic to statins, immediately she got a torvastatin 80 milligram, which she swallowed one time and it was not a very pleasant situation in the hospital and she did not continue taking it. So she is 71 years old, she's a very active lady, her last LDL with the well call was 165 and she just had an acute MI. Do I treat her? I chose to treat her. Do I have something else but PCSK9 right now? Lucky not. Actually, for two years I tried to get her in a study, but I couldn't because she was not on a statin, and she could not do the statin intolerance study. Yeah. A question over there. I was, I, while the while the question is coming up, I would just say so. I think I think. Yes, uh, we still will use, use targets, but I do think it's going to come down to individual, uh, you know, a clinician and a patient conversation, and I think, I think that's okay. You know, I, I know we all want to have the guidelines direct everybody, and we will have those established guidelines at some point, but I still think it's going to be... I don't be just impatient. What's that? We are just impatient. We're For just the homozygous patients, we do not need uh, targets. We That's need to. Correct. Right. They need to go as low as possible. Right. But for the heterozygous patients, we need heart endpoint. Right. So, so. Uh, we are just we are impatient. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm still concerned the payers are going to want to have something. 
Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. if I could just, yeah, quick comment as sort of the sole representative of the much maligned ACCHA <laughs> guidelines. Uh, you know, I mean, our, our emphasis was to take, look at the evidence which clearly supports getting appropriate patients on statins because that's the overwhelming evidence we had available. So now that there's new evidence that, you know, incremental additional benefit from adding azidamide, but not niacin or phenofibrate right, when we looked at it, I think that it will be revisited. We just published a paper in the European Heart Journal to try to help guide people. Because ideally what we would have are risk prediction equations in statin-treated patients. You could say this is the absolute risk of the patient. If I add azidamide and lower LDL 20% from you know, 70 to 54, number needed to treat of X and blah, you know, it's a very quantitative, well, we don't have risk prediction equations, and, and, so, and, and they're working on them, they will come. So I think in the meantime, uh, what we're kind of working on proposing is kind of backing into at least LDL thresholds uh, so if the LDL, for example, is over 130 in high-risk people, which we define, there's a likely, you know, a good likelihood of a net benefit from adding a non-statin. It's between 100 and 129, you know, in selected people, uh, but you know, it probably it's not much in people who just have coronary disease with no other complicating factors, and if it's less, so there are ways I think now that we have new evidence to, 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 to help guide people because I think it's absolutely necessary to provide some simple way to do that. Yeah. Can, can I just, oh, sorry. So I just wanted to ask this question. I noticed that the, the cost of the drug is around um, $1,200 per month, uh, mm -hmm. PCSK9 individuals. I mean, that's, a, that's the income that a whole family makes in a developing country for the whole year. So is this a drug that has been developed for the people living in the West? Because there is no way, I mean, this drug could be administered in any part of the developing country. And is there something for, perhaps the FH Foundation could do? I mean, if, for instance, you know, they deposit samples to the FH repository, you know, the pharmaceutical companies that are making this drug, you know, they could have it available on a subsidized rate for eligible patients. Yeah, very good question. Um, do we think as physicians that uh, we get it reimbursed for our patients? Or is that a problem? Do we get it reimbursed in all indications? Do we? Yes? Of course what not. do you think? Of course not. Uh, no. do, do we get reimbursed? No, no, no. What? The the, the, the the it's a drug reimbursed, reimbursed for Will the patients, patients get, will the, will the, no, the, you know, it'll be a battle. But you know, this, this is something, and, and I'm sure people here might disagree with me when I say this, but uh, I'm now, now I'll invoke Hippocrates. So. Um, you know, I, I personally don't think it's the clinician's position to yeah. make the determination of financial, you know, of, of a, a pharmacoeconomic decision. I, I think we should stay out of that, and I think we should do what we think, uh, you know, based upon the literature or understanding of medicine mm -hmm. in our heart of hearts, what we think is best for the patient, and then make that prescription, uh, and then leave others to uh, to establish whether or not they'll pay. Yeah. That may be a, a coward's way, but that's that's my yeah. position. Mariko. You have a lot of uh, patients uh, uh, that really are far away from uh, the target LDL. Um, can you, do you expect that you can use PCSK9, PCSK9 inhibition in them, and will it be reimbursed in, in Japan? Oh uh, yes, and uh, in Japan, homozygous FH in homozygous FH, all the medical costs are reimbursed, and then. Uh, I think for severe heterozygous FH patients also should be reimbursed, and I'm now working on it. Yes. That's the same situation in the Netherlands. We will have discussion per patient, actually. So, yeah, so I'd like to address the payment issue because I think it's critical in two levels. I deal with a lot of metabolic diseases, so it's not just lipids, but it's also obesity and it's diabetes. And on several managed care discussions where we sit with payers and we sit with uh, pharmacists and so on, always come the question and the answer from the payers, we would rather pay a lot of money for a disease than a little bit of money for a common disease. So I have no doubt that the homozygous patient will yeah. get the drug. Yeah. I think that would be very clear. That it will have to show that it works in this particular patient. What about the rest? Well, this is business. In the United States today, 
the amount of insurance companies actually shrunk to about five or six, and even that is going to shrink further. So if they think that they will be able to save money, they will approve this drug. And I will tell you that until now, when I deal with expensive drug for diabetes, for obesity, insurance companies do not want to pay. We were actually contacted to try to give insurance some guidance should they use this drug. So if they think that they can save a stent, if they think that they can save an admission, if they think that they can save another open heart surgery, I think they will pay. And I also think that it will come to the business of how do you pay for drugs. Yes, it's officially $1,200 a month, and there's a 20% discount, and then they give them some more discount, and at the end of the year they give them a rebate. It doesn't come to that level of money at the end of the day. I personally think that if the lower the better will prevail, the insurance companies would want to pay for that. Good. Yeah, I just have a simple question actually for Frederick, maybe for somebody else also. It's a, of course, it's on this what it costs also. So, with you having so much experience for heterozygous FAs, at the current level of what it costs, what, how many heterozygous FAs, like in the US or in Europe, would you think would end up with PCSK9 inhibitors? And if it only costs the same as statins still on patent today, how many would use it then? I think it's a difficult question because in, you know, even in the Dutch data which was shown, not all those patients were on top dose statin plus Zetimab. They were on various doses of statin. So, and if you can get, you know, the problem is the statin intolerance question. So if you can get uh, heterozygous patients onto top dose statin with a Zetimab, many would get to reasonable targets. I mean, the big question is where you draw that cutoff. So are you happy with a LDL of 130 or do you want it to be 100? Um, so I think it's, 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 more, it's, it's much easier in the more, more se severe phenotype. But the big question is, you know, it's, it's also in the emotion. If you diagnose with some of these drugs, oncology drugs for cancer, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they've easily paid for that, you know, because of the emotion involved. This condition is just as devastating if you die in the prime of your life. So how do you put a cost to a life uh, that you would probably save in those patients with, with that you just can't, that are still at very, very high levels despite what's available to us? But then I think then maybe I can add, so if it would cost the same as it's cetamib or maybe rosuvastatine today, do you think actually patients would prefer to have PCSK9 inhibitors compared to a statin? So just have an injection once, once. a month or something rather than a pill every day? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, I'd probably say both. That's just a lab both. Okay. Hey, hey, Eric, we have a question from a, a patient advocate. Okay. And then we're going to move yes. to Curtis for a couple comments good and then idea. we're going to move yeah. on to Dr. Goldman. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Yes. So. Thank you. Um, I just started the, the injection, the PCSK9. I had my second one on Wednesday, and I know other people in the room that are starting. Um, my question is, how long um, do I wait to know? No. How long to wait to wait until the Test in another week. It's two weeks from your injection. Yeah, after two weeks. And, So, so um, Curtis Lane is going to make a few comments. He's given a lot of thought to, um, to the, the payer issue. And Curtis, maybe you can just introduce yourself. And, and then there are a couple slides. If uh, I think Curtis gave some slides that he'd like to we have those slides. You know, pull up. And this will transition to, to Dr. Goldman's uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, um, the closest thing I've ever been to being an MD is what, at one point in my career I was a managing director, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, that's as close as I get, but I've learned a lot. Um, I'm in the financial side of the healthcare business, and over the course of my career I've spent a lot of time with payers and with PBMs, um, going back for many years, going back to the, as far back as the 80s when the movement really started. So what I wanted to talk about today is first kind of give the group an overview of what's actually happening out there once you prescribe the medications, how patients can get it reimbursed, and what happens. So first, I want to start with what happens overall to understand the system itself 
in terms of the, where the players sit and then get into some specifics of real life examples and then talk about what I call the hand-to-hand -hand combat that takes place on the ground in order to get um, medicine or procedures or anything reimbursed because we're at a critical time here now, and I think it's very important for this community to coalesce with one voice to be able to combat this, not on the ground, but a little higher to make it easier to work on the ground. Um, but just to understand how the system works, you know, it starts with obviously a physician prescribing the medication, but then it starts the inner exchange between, as Dr. Morris said, uh, between the, the physician and the payer. And payers, just to understand who they are, because people you know, refer to them differently, they're either the insurance companies, which are always the ones that are uh, blamed, um, large employers who are taking the underwriting the risk of their employees, but they often and usually do use the insurance companies to manage their plans, the government, as you know, and then PBMs, physician pharmacy benefit management companies, they're not insurance companies per se, they're delegated to have the responsibility by the insurance companies or the payers to manage the pharmacy benefit on behalf of your plans. So. You know, this is a, it gets a little confusing because depending on the plan, the pharmacy benefit manager might be actually taking responsibility for what the formulary is, but in other cases, especially with the larger uh, groups of employees, it's the plan, it's, it's the employer telling the plan what they want or the plan deciding what they want for their enrollees. Uh, but that dialogue is a very important one that takes place. And as Dr. Morris, I thought she said it very accurately, the filling out of the paperwork right now in terms of this process is a very, very big deal in terms of how it gets done. Um, obviously, the patient, once it gets approved, and we'll talk about that, I'll give you an example about that in a second, um, it will be delivered through the manufacturer to specialty pharmacies. These are pharmacies that are either owned by the PBM, which gives them another opportunity to try to control utilization, or independent specialty pharmacies, and they're specialty pharmacies because the drug requires special handling, the refrigeration. But understanding what happens on the other side of this between the manufacturers and the payers is, you know, we've laid out here that the manufacturers, they are trying to convince the payers and the PBMs and all the various constituents within the insurance community about what the right use of their drugs are. And obviously their perspective on that is to make it as easy as possible to use their drugs. And they're negotiating price with the payers. But I think to many people, they view this as a black box. It is somewhat of a black box. And I think that for our purposes here, we need to try to cast some light on it to try to get into it to be able to work it. And I'll give an example of what I just went through, because I think it's pretty interesting, um, of getting one of my family members on this um, medication. So I, we had two choices about how to do it. I could call a friend of mine at Optum because earlier in my career I sold Optum's uh, PBM to United Healthcare and asked them to do it or live it on the ground in order to understand what people are going through. And we opted for the, the latter. And it was really instructive to see how horrible an experience it was. Um, it was just, it was beyond, my, I expected it to be bad, but I could not believe how bad it was. And in terms of watching it, um, you know, I got a summary here from of discussions that took place with respect to the approvals. So over the course of 21 days, there were 32 conversations and contacts over the approval of this drug for my family member. And at the end of that 30, those 32 conversations in 21 days, there was still not a resolution. And at one point it was approved, then it wasn't approved, then they needed more documentation, and then, oh, you don't need documentation, oral approval is okay. I mean, it went on and on. Um, and, you know, finally, because um, um, we got so frustrated with it, I made the phone call that I avoided making, <laughs> and, and we had the drug in two hours. But, um, you know, I don't think that's the right, you know, approach that we should all be counting on to be able to do it. Um, you know, even through that process, we're enrollees of a United Healthcare plan. Um, United actually changed their guidelines in the middle of our approval process. It happened right, I don't know if others have experienced the same thing, but as they were doing, as we were going through this, they actually changed the guidelines for what they were using throughout their commercial book of business. So, um, you know, as I said, I gave up. I think this is interesting to understand it, but more importantly, I think we need to turn to the next slide, which if I got it right, there it is. So this was, we're trying to summarize here, really to give a feel, a sense for what the payer policy requirements are right now. 
Um, you know, these policies are determined by the individual payers or they're delegated to a pharmacy benefit management company. A lot of dialogue about that, and as I said earlier, different people have the responsibility for making the final decisions. I remember when the CMO of United, a few years ago, I said to him, what are you going to do about covering this, this drug? He said, of course we're going to cover it for FH patients. And then I asked him, what's an FH patient? And he said, oh. Um, but that, you know, and this is the CMO, you know, this, and, and I think it's important in terms of the payers, we talk about them in terms of being financial. They actually, you know, their medical staffs are trying to do the right thing, but they are economic organisms. And the reality of behavioral economics, and Dana can talk about that, is, you know, to my use, the term behavioral economics means your behavior follows your economics. So you can't help have it influence you. And got to remember something about these drugs is we're talking about lifetime therapy. But the average enrollment of a given person in a managed care plan in this country is between three and four years. So, you know, just understanding when we talk about the Netherlands and the other closed systems, it's a much easier way to implement this type of a drug therapy because the system gets the benefit out of it because everybody's participating in the system in the same way. It's just not the case here. And I don't, uh, it's a different discussion. I don't want to go to a system like that. I think, you know, that would be much worse. But we have to find a way, um, believe it or not. Um, we're not going there, though. Um, um, is that, um, you know, that when we think about that, you just have to understand that from a payer's point of view, I think they all think this drug is good for the right patients, but when they think about it, you know, they're not going to get the direct benefit, so they're going to be very careful about it. And one of the things that's amazing about these drugs is the variability on, you know, the definition of it and the guidelines and the things that exist as we've tried to lay it out here in a summary are so, there's so many different variables that you, I've been listening to for a day and a half um, about all the variables that you're talking about. It's amazing the number of opportunities that it gives to the payers to deny the drug because of the uncertainty that comes out of the scientific community. And I gotta tell you, they are taking full advantage of it every minute. Um, and you're, you know, you're giving them the opportunity to do that. The science, so I think it's great that the scientific community is debating what the definition is. As we get through this, I would recommend that the scientific community involved with FH comes up with something that they can live with to advocate collectively with one voice so that the payers can't do what they're doing. And I'll go through what they're doing right now. And by the way, disclosing financial considerations, right, in terms of my conflicts, I've got them all over the place, but not with the pharmaceutical companies. Um, the, but the range of the definitions by the payers, I think it's, what's the definition of FH? It ranges from just the physician deciding, as Seth said, that they have it to the Dutch lipid score of six, or one of the plans we found has that their parents' LDL level has to be above 190 for it to be considered that they have FH. I didn't see that one, we have to find that one. The genetic test requirement, the least restrictive none, up to you need multiple mutations identified. LDL levels of greater than 70 on the one hand, all the way up to needing 260 to 300 for heterogeneous or 500 for homogeneous. The 100 and the 130 in between, I know when I went through it, that was 160 and 130 and went down to 130 and 100 while we were during the process. Prior treatment, you know, in terms of um, what they were taking, what, what they were taking beforehand, you can see up here, but you guys know this better than I do. Then the question is, do you need a, what type of specialist, if any specialist, to prescribe the drug? So some say none, and some require that it must only be a cardiologist. Now, I'm not a doctor, but a cardiologist, the right people to be prescribing this medication all the time, and exclusively. Maybe at some times, but not exclusively. Um, then in terms of the documentation required, I think this is the, a, a nice trap that's been set up. In terms of if some of them, is it oral? And I went through it. They said to, the, to um, the physician's office, oh, you don't have to do it in writing, you can do it orally. And I said to the physician's office, why don't you do it in writing anyway, because maybe they'll change their mind and you need to get it to them anyway. They said, no, the payer said it was okay. Well, two days later, they said, well, we don't have it in writing, so therefore we denied it. So it's going to happen. Um, and so finally, one of the things that we have to get to is the reauthorization. Um, that 
Well, actually, in the lab results, I think is interesting. At one point, I heard of one of the payers saying that they must have eight weeks worth every week of blood tests. I mean, Curtis, did, did anybody mention event, cardiovascular disease or events? Yeah, that's in there. I'm just trying to simplify oh, okay. it. There's only so much I could do no, no, here. No, <laughs> I was focusing on FH without it, but no, they did. It is, and then the standards are lower. That's where we're going. Well, you get the picture. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank, th thank you. Thanks, Curtis, and thanks to the panel. We could literally have discussion, I think, for easily for the next uh, couple hours on, the, on this uh, important general topic of the incorporation of PCS9s into clinical practice. But that topic really leads uh, beautifully to our, our final speaker for the day. We're really thrilled to have Dana Goldman, Dr. Dana Goldman, uh, here with us. Dr. Goldman is a, a professor at USC, professor of health policy and economics. He's the director of the USC Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. And um, he's really one of the um, best known uh, healthcare economists uh, in the US, uh, as evidenced by uh, a lot of the press uh, coverage that he gets, uh, as evidenced by the many awards that he's received, including election to the National Academy of Medicine. So uh, we're really thrilled that Dr. Goldman could join us today to talk about the healthcare economics as it relates to FH and as it relates to new therapies like PCSK9. So, um, Dr. Goldman, thank you for coming. Forward. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I guess I'm the last speaker after a two hour session without a break, so I've never had it more challenging than today. Uh, in addition, a lot of the previous speakers have said that I'm going to be talking about a few different things, obviously the economics. I'm not going to talk about anything they mentioned, though. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll talk about it uh, later. But the reason why is I want to talk about prices and why things I think are so messed up in the healthcare system. And the pricing of breakthrough treatments is often controversial. You've seen a lot of this. You'll be seeing more of it around PCSK9 if you haven't already. Uh, but we often see it in cancer and HIV. And really, this reflects uh, a conflict between short term and long term that we have in society. And in the short run, we know that when the price is high, it limits access. There was a question about that earlier. Uh, and so, as an economist, we would think that we want the price set near the cost of production, which for a lot of these drugs is very low. And so, basically, you should be giving it away if it's a really effective therapy. The problem with that is that, as in the long run, we want innovations to develop new treatments. Uh, and this is a good example of it because this essentially is a follow-on to a statin therapy. And we know that pharmaceutical R&D is especially risky. We need to provide financial incentives to reward risk. And so we come up with things like patents and market exclusivity and research subsidies that are designed essentially to raise the price to reward the innovator. And you can think of this as a conflict between patent rights in the long term and patient rights. Um, and you know, we tend to think this is a recent phenomenon, but actually this has been going on for decades. If you look back um, to the mid-90s when we developed a highly active antiretroviral therapy, um, prior to their introduction of heart therapy, uh, getting HIV was a death sentence. Some of you were here in Los Angeles, some of you may remember like I do, when Magic Johnson announced his retirement from the NBA because he had HIV, and a lot of us thought that was the last we'd see of him. But now, uh, I think he owns the baseball team. So, you know, the world has changed, and the world has changed because of the introduction of heart. But you can see patent enforcement equals death, but there were a lot of protests over the price of heart, which was about $15,000 a year, which is about the price we're talking about now. Um, and the problem with this, the fundamental problem here is that we think about prices wrong in healthcare. We talk about the prices of the inputs. So when you go to the supermarket and you say, how much is that breakfast cereal? You say, I'll either buy it or not based on how much satisfaction you're going to get from that. And the good, you know what you're willing to pay. And if the price is too high, you won't pay it. And if it's lower, you won't. But in healthcare, the good that we want is not the visit to the doctor or the drug. 
What we really want is health. And so we're not there to read the magazines, although as an archivist, I appreciate the 10-year-old uh, versions of Time magazine. We're there to get better. And so the question is, what's the price of health? And now think about HIV. Magic Johnson is a very wealthy guy. But before Hart was introduced, he could spend all his wealth and he would, have, he would buy no health. Okay? So as an economist, we say the price is infinite. Along comes heart, and it costs about $15,000 for a year. Well, the price has gone from infinity to $15,000. That's the greatest sale on earth. And if that's true, we should be spending a lot of money on it. But from the point of view of budgetary calculations, people say, oh, I didn't have to spend anything on these drugs, and now they're $15,000 a year. And so what I want to talk about is... How do we think about that in a conceptual way? And so th what you see here is the survival curve from antiretroviral therapy, and this is what it looked like in 1984. And all the, science, the goal of science is to move this out. That's why we're doing biomedical research. That is, more survival at any year. And you can see that by the mid-'90s, we'd done that. And by 2004, this is where we were. Now, this is a curve on a chart. Here's what it looks like for life expectancy. It meant 15 extra years for someone who is HIV positive. Okay, and economists, as an economist, you say, what are your qualifications? I can't do any of the science here. And by the way, the gentleman who said he doesn't do economics, I really appreciated that, because most of the debate right now is doctors complaining about prices. But, uh, and I would never treat a patient, and I don't want them to talk about price. But, <laughs> The point is that, as an economist, I'm very good at multiplication. So you take a million people who are infected with HIV, and you multiply that by 15 years of life, and then you multiply it by $150,000, which is about the value of a life year that we've taken uh, in this country, and what you get is a really large number. So what you get is something I'll show you in a second. But now coming back to the debate over heart, the, it turns out that the revenues that flowed to the manufacturers were about $63 billion. But that multiplication that I just said results in about $1.4 trillion in value to society. So if you just look at the price, you say, these manufacturers are making $63 billion a year off that drug. But if you look at the value to society, what you say is, 5% of the value creation is being returned to innovators, okay? And so the point is, when we think about the health benefits, we come up with a different calculus than we just look at price. Now, I recognize I'm the last speaker, so I'm going to go through some, I'm going to skip some slides, which you should appreciate. Um, the, the bottom line is, if you look at cancer, you actually can tell a similar story. And cancer, you know, heart, uh, HIV obviously is uh, not, it, we might say it's an outlier, but it turns out this is true in cancer too, which is an area where we sometimes think we're not making progress. So you wanted me to talk about uh, FH, uh, and I promised I would. So. You've seen this. Uh, these are the risk groups. I'm going to talk about the first two risk groups, AC, uh, CVD and FH. Uh, these are the groups for which PCSK9 is indicated. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the modeling we can do to think about this. And, you know, the, the, the point here, again, is one where the general, the, the view out there, and I think uh, Curtis has it exactly right, you know, there's a sense that statins are enough. We've made it, statins are an incredibly valuable medication. But if you look here, we looked at some data uh, for these two risk groups. Uh, there's about 21 million people with ACCV, ASCVD, and there's about 10 million of them who are taking drugs and not at goal, okay? Uh, and there's 2 million people, potentially, who are on statins uh, in FH, and I know you have better numbers than these. These are the best we could do with population representative data. Um, there are 2 million people who are being treated and not at goal there. So that's a 12 population of potentially 12 million that could take uh, 
these drugs. And so uh, I'm now going to go through the details of the model. And ex no, I'm not there. So the, the bottom line is by, uh, you know, especially if you project forward, what we're talking about is that these drugs could benefit 22 million Americans. Uh, and so here's another way to think about this. And again, uh, is to look at the number of cardiac events we could avoid over the next 20 years if we had universal access to this type of therapy. Uh, we're talking about avoiding maybe 1.2 million major adverse cardiac events for the FH population and maybe 0.1 million or 100,000 deaths being averted. Um, and so, um, I think the discussion should be, how do we get everyone on these things? Not how do we get one person on these things, you know? And so we could make 24 million calls to Curtis's friends. Um, uh, well, you should start now if you want to do that. But we modeled out a scenario where, uh, you know, we went to even statins, for example, their use only averaged 16% for the first 20 years. So let me, as an aside, um, the big problem in healthcare, a lot of times we think the big problem in healthcare is overuse. We're using too much. We may be using too many antidepressants in younger populations. We're using too much. The point of this is there, there are consequences for underuse. And it turns out underuse is worse than overuse. Because underuse often means that uh, someone's going to die, whereas overuse means you have some adverse side effects. Now, uh, and so the, we did some modeling. And I, 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 again, I said we're good at math. And uh, so uh, what I want to say is that if you look at the value of the flow of benefits from PCSK9, because of all these risks in the population, and you assume a conservative efficacy figure, so let's say a reduction in LDLC of about 59%. Um, there's pr potentially $2.5 trillion in value here. Uh, and if you believe uh, the promise that uh, some articles suggest, there could be $5 trillion in value to society. Now, assuming that these up uptake is limited, we still see that in the real world, we could be getting between 400 and 800 billion dollars in value if we uh, are, if these things diffuse in the population over the next 20 years. So what this means is, uh, well, I'm going to, uh, is that uh, there's potentially 211 billion dollars that's going to be spent on these drugs. And there's potentially 800 billion in value. Manufacturers may get 25% of the gain. Some of you may say that's a lot. I say it's not enough to encourage innovation. But uh, remember, these will go generic eventually. And actually, the HIV story is relevant because they started at $15,000, but now we can treat HIV in Africa for a dollar a day. And probably has done, you know, if you look at the legacy of. George Bush, the best thing he ever did was to provide medication in Africa, and he's saved millions of lives. Uh, those are probably lives Americans don't care that much about. But be that as it may, um, you know, there's a potential here. So, um, but there's $211 billion in revenue, and this scares payers. <laughs> you know, where are we going to come up with the money? And we can have that discussion. But uh, I'm going to conclude because I know I'm the last speaker. I don't know if you want me to do... Uh, questions or not. Uh, but, you know, statins generate a lot of value, but there's still 20 million people at risk. We estimate that there's potentially 400 to 800 billion dollars in value if we get things right. That doesn't include the productivity and quality of life effects. It also doesn't consider long-term side effects, and I know there was a uh, discussion about that, but they're certainly cost-effective. There's no doubt they're cost-effective in the groups for which they're indicated. The problem here, again, is pricing. So can we ask the payers to pay $200 billion towards this? Well, it turns out there are things we can do here. We can, ask, we can link 
payments to long-term gains. That is to say, if we're seeing fewer heart attacks in, in the United States as a result of these drugs, shouldn't we reward the manufacturers for that? And could we design contracts that would lower the price today in return for future gains? It's also the case that the problem with technology is not that it either works or it doesn't. The problem is there's some patients for whom we know it works really well, and then we start to diffuse it into marginal populations. So if you think um, about um, implantable defibrillators, for example, they work really well for someone who has a arrhythmia like Dick Cheney does. But, you know, we, should we all have them in our chest? No, we put them in the airport and that's fine. You know, but the point is... That, uh, what, but the problem is it's the same price for everyone. And with drugs, as I said, they're not that expensive to produce. And so maybe the answer here is to pay uh, according to the benefits. Uh, and so we would allow the price to vary with risk. So uh, I'll conclude there, but I'll just say if we get the, if we get the math right, there's going to be a lot of benefit for society. Thank you. Yeah, sure, I'm happy. So, that was fabulous. Uh, we have time for some questions, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, do you do these calculations, are you presuming that there would be a benefit of alternative mortality that will reduce cardiovascular events? And if you are assuming that, what is the, how much of a benefit are you assuming? Can you repeat the question? I, I will repeat the, the question asked, uh, the excruciating details of our calculation, but in particular, <laughs> What about the morbidity and the mortality? And I'll tell you, we have the mortality here, but not the morbidity. And the, that is what makes what I'm doing conservative in some cases. And, you know, I, I'm happy to share the details offline. I, I don't want to... If I were the first speaker, I'd do it. But as the last speaker, I'm going to be sympathetic. Thank you. That was, one, that, was, that was wonderful. How do you think we should react in this country I support with it being set half that in Europe and less than that in other countries? Yeah, so one of the burdens we face as Americans is that we get to pick, we pay the most for diseases. But, you know, malaria, for example, kills 500,000 people annually, and yet it took Bill Gates to develop a new anti-malarial out of the goodness of his heart. And there's a reason for that. It's because no one dies of malaria in the United States. So one of the, one of the consequences of this is we pay more, but we also get our diseases addressed. So Alzheimer's, for example, and obesity are active areas of research, and that's because uh, we are willing to pay a lot. And this debate over cancer I find very interesting because we're now making progress against cancer, like especially some of the immuno-oncologic agents. Um, and the reason is because we paid a lot for it. So the, my answer to you is if we're willing to say that we, we, we're a rich country and we want to continue to innovate, then I'll say we're going to have to bear that burden. Now, of course, you know, if you're over in Europe, you're saying, wow, the best thing I could do is make sure Hillary Clinton doesn't get elected, so they pay a lot in the United States, so I can pay less. So there is this problem that everyone wants to free ride. Uh, and so I would say that, um, you know, America should be doing its, its job to try to uh, prevent the other countries from free riding. Um, but that's a broader discussion. But the bottom line is we pay high prices, and if we wanted to, we could say, to, like, for example, and this may come up again, we, there was at one point we were going to re-import drugs from Canada, right? And so the point of that was Canada pays a lot less, and if we allowed re-importation, you know, we'd get a big discount. But the net effect of that policy would have been that Canadians don't get drugs, because no manufacturer, they would just stop selling their drugs in Canada. So, you know, we have to think about this strategically and, you know, recognize that we're paying for innovation. Um, you know, I have type 1 diabetes, and there's a chance my kids will have type 1 diabetes, and I want them to do as much as they can to innovate so that they won't have to bear the consequences of the disease the way I have. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. That discouraged everyone. <laughs> right.
Dana, could I ask you a question? So I, I, you made a very compelling case for why society should want to pay for these new highly effective therapies. But I didn't quite hear the case for why the payers shouldn't set the bar as high as possible and make it very difficult uh, to be able to get, uh, to get one. I mean, you made a few suggestions of how creative contracts might be constructed. But at the end of the day, isn't that part of the, part of the problem, is that the payers don't have the same incentive that society as a whole does to pay for these drugs? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, but my point is, that I think a, the, the thing about insurance, unlike drug manufacturing, is you know, it's really a commodity business. They're all selling the same thing. And how does an insurance, how does an Aetna differentiate themselves from a United? And, you know, if you believe that people are uh, adversely selecting, in fact, you don't want to be creative. So we, actually, we see this in the Affordable Care Act. Some, some health plans are charging $75 copay on generic HIV drugs probably the most effective drug there is in, in society today. Why would they charge a $75 copay? It's because they don't want anyone with HIV in their plan. So insurers are competing uh, along the wrong dimension. So I think it would be interesting if insurers started to compete and say, look, we're going to be generous with specialty drugs because we know this is exactly what insurance is designed to cover. But we're going to reward the manufacturers over the long term when evidence has emerged of its success. And I think actually they, an insurer might do well because they actually, people could tell the difference between a Aetna uh, and a United. And actually Kaiser has done a good job. Kaiser has a differentiated project. Kaiser keeps people in their plan for like 10 to 12 years. And Kaiser also invests in prevention. So I think, you know, there are opportunities to do that. Any other questions? Sam? How about FH case identification? And I'm thinking particularly uh, if you find a kid, you know, his cholesterol is very high, his parents aren't getting any medical care. So a parents also identify with FH who then, so you have two people who are going to get treated, but also two people who could have tremendous life extension, which in your model is what's creating the cost efficiency. So if you done models like that? Uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I think your point is exactly right. I mean, the point is that undiagnosed disease, this is my point about undertreatment. Generally, as a society, we want to diagnose and we want to identify. As an insurer, we don't want to do any of that. One problem with the discussion over health care is everyone says, well, the and hopes that, well, if we diagnose it early, we'll save money long term. It turns out that's almost never true. What happens is you spend money and people get a really good deal if you're, and this is one of those cases where you'll spend money and you'll get a really good deal. And I think, you know, obviously you have to bring pressure to bear. But yes, the point is the modeling that we did here uh, is able to do that calculus. Um, but I mean, again, we need to figure out ways to work with uh, insurers. So for instance, Medicare is going to save money as a result of the development of PCSK9 because there will be less cardiovascular events when people are 65 plus. Mm -hmm. Now Medicare is also saying, well, uh, we don't want those people to make it to 65. It's the same thing with <laughs> cigarettes. You know, why are cigarettes? Why are cigarettes still legal? It's because the federal government can't afford all those people on Social Security. You know, you'd never have cigarettes legal right now. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think getting the, the public Medicare to pay for this is actually an intriguing idea. All right. With, with that, Dana, thank, thank you. you. Okay, don't, don't leave yet. We're going to have a, a very brief wrap-up where uh, we're going to go through some of the major lessons learned from today and some takeaways, uh, but we won't be long. And then we have a reception uh, right, right outside uh, to mingle a little bit more. So uh, Josh is going to kind of uh, lead, lead the discussion here. You think uh, Dana's hard to stand at dinner, but it's really hard to stand between a meeting like this. So 
This will be very brief. You know, uh, I want to acknowledge, please stand up if you remember the uh, steering committee for this uh, summit because uh, we had a lot of calls and it took a lot of effort to put this program on. So if you're a summit uh, steering committee member, please stand up for a round of applause. And the, uh, and the FH Foundation staff, again, a round of applause for the FH Foundation staff. And the speakers, I mean, uh, the, this is our third one of, uh, of many. Uh, we'll have another one next year. And we thought we might know when and where it would be by now, but we will know very, very soon. It will be around this time. Uh, and and uh, keep your calendars open. And it will be in Texas. It will. Oh, OK. It will be in Texas. OK. okay. <laughs> so uh, OK, the, easy to get to. And uh, in the middle of the country. The funnel is going to go to Texas instead of uh, Kansas. So. Um, Anyway, this has been a tremendous success. You know, uh, this is our third year, and um, it just keeps getting better and better. I wanted to very briefly summarize things. After every summit, we try to come up with something that we're going to do for next year. The first year, we uh, published a call to action paper. The next year, we published a paper about misconceptions and misinterpretations of guidelines. We're going to do something out of this, and it's going to have to come from what we're going to talk about here. And um, so I briefly want to summarize what we did. So many of you didn't know this, but yesterday the advocates, 28 advocates were here, and they were strategizing about how they're gonna, the patients are going to play a role in moving things forward. And uh, they're, one of their cat, uh, cat, we need some pictures from this next time, but maybe cat, cat summarized this and said, you know, we're going to continue to strive to educate providers, individuals, and build a community. And there'll be some updates from them that you'll be getting vis-a-vis uh, via, via the web, et cetera. We also had a tweet-a-thon. Here's our chief tweeter, tweeter in chief, the cool, the cool Jamie Underberg. Uh, he's taught us all. I, I, I've learned now how to do tweets, and uh, and we got some we got some remarkable statistics from that. Even Catherine hasn't seen this. Top 12, 12 countries, top twelve that were tweeting. Uh, say that fast. Top twelve tweeted tweeters, and this was our reach. Twenty. Catherine, see this. Look wait, at this. Wait. 27 million, a reach of 27 million. And they were all, uh, they were all Pat Moriarty's patients, I think, probably. And then, you know, I think uh, I, I tried, we tried to take some, I, I was sitting over here, you know, taking pictures furiously, and I, I wasn't playing on my computer. I was trying to put these slides together. But I think that I'm going to go very briefly through the session. So the first session I categorize as heterogeneity equals opportunity. You know, we saw that there's heterogeneity in HOFH, we, that, that phenotypic heterogeneity might be from LPA, that we know that there's heterogeneity across the populations. We know a lot more about the genetics, that great talk by Nate. And I think that, that the opportunity is um, that we can find the low-hanging fruit, as Case said, that we can try to um, start screening for LPA and, um, and that we can uh, 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 promote the confluence of findings that suggest that the prevalence is, is more like 1 in 200 and not 1 in 500. I mean, that, that's really a paradigm-shifting uh, thing that we're, we're going to have to advocate for over the next a uh, few years, and uh, will be part of how we maybe maybe part of the the, the paper that arrives. The next uh, session, I th think we categorize as data will drive progress. This builds on what was said last night uh, by our keynote speaker. You have to have data if you want to make a change. And uh, you know, uh, 2,500 patients in the registry, uh, MedPed coming into Cascade. Uh, other sites, there's going to be, so, I can feel the, the, the love that there's going to be so many more sites that are com coming on. Pam Morris swears that Charleston is going to be a site, and uh, I know that there's going to be others. Screening for FH, I mean, I love this mantra that Sam Gidding had, FH should be uh, recognized as a disease where medical treatment of heterozygous begins at 8 to 10 and homozygous begins at diagnosis. That means you have to find it before you can treat it. We also know that the, the Cascade Registry, the data from that is pretty compelling, that we're, we're still got a long way to go. So action items, advocate for screening in children, advocate for research in non-white populations. And Dan had this impassioned plea for a biorepository, and I can also feel the love from the sponsors in the room are going to really get behind that idea uh, and collaborate. And then uh, the next session, it was uh, in, innovative informatics for identification. So also try to say that five times fast. 
And you know, uh, in Europe, in, in England, they have this term called boffins, and it's a very, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a term that used to be pejorative, but now is full of love. It means the people that are actually the nerds that are getting things done. You know, we're living in the nerd generation, and we're going to be taking advantage of those uh, folks and um, finding these FH patients using all of these new techniques that um, machine learning and scanning EMRs. And once we find them, we're going to have to, uh, to, to treat them. And so the action item is to really to try to facilitate this, to find those patients, um, to facilitate the interactions with eMERGE, and, um, and only then will we, we really make progress. And then really, of course, the game-changing uh, new therapies that are coming on board. And we're, it's sort of like we're riding into the sunset when we see this slide here from, from Derek, you know, the, the South African sunset with the, the, the beautiful colors there. It, it, it's a really, uh, it was a wonderful lecture and a, it's such a quick journey. And that's what we really need to try to do. So advocate, and, and, and Dana's talk about the, uh, the, the economics of it. I mean, I had no idea uh, that, that this was, uh, that was just eye-opening for me. I'm sure it was eye-opening for many of you. But advocate for appropriate coverage promote FH-specific economic analyses. And so, you know, this, uh, and we, we, what's his name again? Jim. Jim, Jim, Jim. Raise, a, raise a hand. So, I mean, if you look, look at all the stuff that he's been doing all day long. I mean, I, are, you, are, you, are you ambidextrous? Are you doing it with both hands? Because you must have cramps. But, you know, I think that this is, the, this is the thing that Catherine always says, you know, for FH, actually the time is now. And uh, it's a huge, uh, I'm going to mix a lot of metaphors here, but there's a lot of streams that are coming together. There's been research. We have, uh, you know, Dr. Kachadurian started this, started this whole journey, you know, f however many years ago, 60 years ago or something. Research, advocacy, education coming together and leading to new insights into prevalence. Cheaper genetic testing is, is here. You know, we can now do genomes for less than $1,000. New technology, new informatics approaches. You know, the cloud is here, the uh, ability to search EMRs. EMRs are widely implemented. We didn't have that 10 years ago. And new therapies. And so there's no time, uh, no time like the present. So I think that the future is, is bright, and we need to make it happen. Uh, uh, you know, FH is a, a, a poster child for personalized medicine, uh, and we, we need to work towards that, towards better outcomes and towards faster diagnosis. So uh, see you in 2016. And is there anything else that I missed? Well, you can, and and please, we want to thank, our, thank our co-chairs, Dan and Eric. <laughs> please rise. And our fearless leader. And our fearless leader. And our and and our fearless Catherine. Catherine, please rise, Catherine. And and Larry, where's Larry? Larry. And, we're, and this is the last announcement. This is going to be video replay. It's going to be available. They've been live streaming this, so you don't even know. But everybody uh, will be uh, available on the web starting Wednesday, September 30th. Okay. Wow. Right. Yeah. So uh, what did you, you want to say? Something? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And I, I think it's been a wonderful event where we've been able to underline right. um, different stakeholder perspectives. This is going to be a complex issue to solve categorically, which is to get, but the beginning is to get individuals with FH diagnosed. And, um, and I, I want to underline too, when we we're talked a lot about PCSK dot inhibitors because they do hold so much promise, but this is a very heterogeneous condition. And um, we, as an organization, think there's a place for all of the different therapies that are out there. We, we hope that they'll continue to be accessed to LDL apheresis, to lamidipide, to mipramersin, um, to Zetia, to all of these therapies. And we have a responsibility as a community to make that as easy as we can for payers, as, as Curtis and, and Dana pointed out. And that's a, that's a big task. Um, to at one on the one hand say this is a very heterogeneous condition um, and on the other hand to say all of these individuals with FH are at such um, risk in compar comparison to the regular population that they all deserve aggressive proactive 
treatment. And our hope as an organization, I think, is that this really could be a model for precision medicine because we know who is at risk. And I wanted, did I brought my little one, but she disappeared. I wanted you guys to meet my eight-year-old daughter because I really hope that she can be a poster child and that she'll actually never even have atherosclerosis. So is there anything else her chairs would like to say? You guys summarize it. Okay, let's go have some wine.